appeared far and wide in places where people have heard about his excellent reputation. It's a great shame that so many Buddhists who were keenly interested in Tamma never heard of him while he was still alive. Although they might have very much wanted to meet a man of such exceptional virtue, they never had a chance to do so. This was largely because he did not like to frequent crowded places like towns and cities. He found life in the mountains and forests far more satisfactory his entire life. Many monks who were dedicated to the practice of Tamma also experienced great difficulty in reaching him. The dirt roads were hardly passable in those days, and anyway there were no vehicles. They had to hike for days in order to reach the places where he liked to stay. Those who were unaccustomed to hiking just couldn't manage it. Their excuses for not going varied. Some monks were simply not courageous enough to accept the plain truth about Tamma that he taught. Some were afraid that food and other necessities would be in short supply and of poor quality. Some were afraid they could not eat just one meal a day as he did. Where Acharyaman was concerned, monks tended to create any number of obstacles for themselves, most of them appearing insurmountable. Although their aspirations were sincere, such concerns amounted to self-imposed barriers that prevented them from gaining the benefit of their good intentions. In the end, they realized the kind of monk he really was only long after he had passed away, and they heard the story of his life. He epitomized the sasana which has preserved Magga and Palla from Lord Buddha's initial attainment down through the countless number of arahants who have maintained Magga and Palla to this day. The essence of the sasana has been transmitted by means of Supatipanno, Ujo, Nyaya, Sami, Chipatipanno, Savaka, Sangho, as practiced by all those who have attained Magga, Palla, and Nibbana. They are like a vast stream of the great deathless ocean of Nibbana, shimmering forth from the pristine nature of those who have practiced to perfection what the Buddha taught. Acharyaman was one of the arahants of this present age. He passed away not so long ago, on November 10, 1949, about twenty years ago. The story of his passing away will be described later when we reach the final chapter of his life. In any case, physical death has existed since time immemorial, and will continue to exist as long as some form of conventional reality still remains. What arises must pass away. What remains unconditionally is the prodigious wonder of the Lord Buddha's infinite compassion, wisdom, and absolute freedom, all of which are enshrined in the sasana. Such intrinsic qualities being exactly the same, Atsariyaman's unqualified compassion, wisdom, and absolute freedom remain unchanged in the same way as those of the Lord Buddha. For us, it is essential that we faithfully practice the way laid down by the Buddha. The degree of success we have will depend on the amount of time and effort we put into the practice. This is something we should all take an interest in while we are still alive. Without making an effort to practice, no results can be achieved, and the opportunity will be irrevocably lost. One of the answers that Acharya Man gave to the people of Nakon Rajasima especially caught my attention. Here is a summary of what he said. Don't think and act as if you, your family and friends, and the society you live in will never have to face the cemetery. Otherwise, when death comes, as it does to everyone in the world, you will find yourself hopelessly unprepared, and so risk sinking into the kind of unfavorable state no one would wish for. Whatever you think, say, or do should be accompanied by some recollection of the cemetery, which symbolizes death, for cemeteries and gumma go hand in hand. Reflection on death will encourage reflection on gumma, which in turn will cause you to reflect back on yourself. Don't get cocky thinking you're so smart, when in truth you are always at the mercy of gumma. Such arrogance will merely lead you to your own misfortune. You should never take the attitude that you are smarter than the Buddha, that great all-knowing teacher who, unlike people with gilesas who feel very cocky, never relied on conjecture. In the end, such people become trapped in the bad gamma that their own arrogant assumptions have created for them. Such straight talk can be quite startling in its effect, inducing the listener to submit wholeheartedly to the truth about gamma. It cuts through all the self-importance that causes us to overlook our true place in this world. I have revisited the subject of Gamma here, for I feel that what I previously wrote on the subject is inadequate, since it failed to capture the full impact of what Acharyaman taught. This oversight has just come to my attention, which shows just how unreliable our memories are. In fact, they easily mislead us, blocking the truth from view. 
so please forgive me for going over the same material again from time to time. Atsariyaman had the knowledge and the ability to confer tamma excellence on his monk disciples. As a result, many of them developed into veritable bodhi trees in their own right. This type of bodhi tree is extremely difficult to plant and nurture to maturity, for it tends to be surrounded by hazards. Many disciples of his who became senior Atsariyas are still alive today. Some of them I have already mentioned by name. Atsarya Man's senior disciples include such well-known Atsariyas as Atsariya Singh and Atsariya Mahapin from Ubon Rajatani, Atsariya Tate from Tabo and Nongkai, Atsariya Fun from Sakonnakorn, Atsariya Kao of Wat Tam Glong Pen in Udon Thani, Atsariya Prom from Dongyen village of Nonghan district in Udon Thani, Atsariya Li of Watasokaram in Samut Prakan, Atsariya Chob and Atsariya Lui from Lue province, Atsariya Sim and Atsariya Te from Chiang Mai, and Atsariya Kongma from Sakon Makon. There are still many others whose names I cannot recall. Each of these Atsariyas possesses certain exceptional qualities setting him apart from the rest. Each is outstanding in his own distinct way, and all are worthy of the highest respect. Some being quite famous, they are well known to monks and lay people across the country. Some, by nature, prefer to live in quiet seclusion. There are senior disciples of Atsariya Man possessing exceptionally virtuous qualities who remain virtually unknown because they naturally prefer to live in anonymity. More than any other teacher in the northeast region of Thailand, Atsariya Man was able to firmly establish monks in Bodhi Tamma. Bodhi means wisdom. The Bodhi of the Lord Buddha is called enlightenment. But in the case of these Acharyas, I would prefer to simply call it Bodhi Tamma as befits their humble status and the forest tradition to which they belong. Establishing a monk in Bodhidhamma is very similar to raising a child. First, the monk is taught how to develop a firm basis in moral discipline. Then, he is taught how to use that moral excellence as a basis for his meditation practice, focusing inward to develop sufficient knowledge and understanding that will allow him to safely look after himself. The spiritual development of each and every monk represents an extremely difficult challenge, because implanting virtuous qualities deeply into the heart of someone who is oppressed by the kilesas is always a very demanding task. The teacher must be on his guard at all times, exercising complete mastery over every type of kilesa, so that his student remains earnestly motivated to undergo the training. Persistent practice under a good teacher allows the student a chance to bring his own character into harmony with tamma, and so steadily grow in confidence and determination. On our own, we all suffer from gilesas. Everyone coming to train under a teacher is equally full of gilesas, so it is difficult for them to find the strength necessary to drag one another to safety. I believe the most difficult task any human being can undertake is that of trying to transform an ordinary monk into a monk who is truly worthy of the highest respect. That task is further complicated when the teacher tries to encourage the student to shift from his original mundane position up to the transcendent levels of Sota, Panna, Sakadagami, Anagami, and Arahant. The degree of difficulty increases dramatically with each successive level of attainment. In all likelihood, insects will come along and chew at its roots, boring into them until the whole tree topples to the ground before the nascent Bodhi tree has a chance to sprout and branch out, developing into a useful specimen. This is what we usually see happen. Seldom do the roots grow deep enough to resist the ravages of wind, rain, and insects. When we plant an ordinary tree in the ground, we can expect it to soon bear fruit. When, however, we try to establish a monk in Tamma, he always appears on the verge of falling over. Even if no apparent dangers are on the horizon, he will go out looking for something to trouble him, thus causing himself a lot of harm, all of which makes developing a monk difficult indeed. If you don't believe me, just give it a try. Ordain as a monk and try following the monastic discipline laid down by the Buddha. What's the bet you'll be hungry for supper before the sun has even set? Forgetting all about your newly shaven head, you will be itching to travel about all the time, sightseeing, listening to sounds, smelling this, tasting that, and touching things that are nice and soft. Morning, noon, and evening, never will there be enough to satisfy your appetite. Soon you'll forget all about your status as a monk. It's unlikely that you will ever take an interest in cultivating that inner Bodhi tree, for your heart will never accept reason and persevere with a monk's training long enough to gain genuine peace of mind. 
Left unattended, the Bodhi tree of the heart will gradually wither and shrivel up. Harmful influences will then have the upper hand. What Bodhi tree could stand erect against such an onslaught? The Bodhi of a monk is sensitive to those influences, so his heart may easily be swayed by such discordant elements. If his Bodhi cannot withstand the pressure, it will topple hopelessly to the ground. Thus it is an extremely difficult task to establish Bodhi properly. Those who have never tried to establish Bodhi in their hearts don't know how potent those negative influences can be. They attempt to fertilize the nascent Bodhi tree with substances that only serve to stunt its growth, eventually ruining it altogether. Consequently, such Bodhi trees tend to have a dreary look about them, as if they were going to die at any moment from a profound shortage of noble virtue. I have experience in planting such Bodhi trees and looking after them, and due to a lack of sound judgment I have had my share of disappointments, so I am well aware of how difficult they are to establish and take care of. They always seem to be on the verge of withering up and dying. Even today I cannot say for sure whether or not this Bodhi tree of mine will grow and mature nicely, or simply deteriorate, since as a rule it threatens to take a turn for the worse. In fact, I haven't seen enough progress to be able to gauge the level of decline. Steady decline seems to be the norm. Preferring to look for stimulation that is invariably harmful, this type of Bodhi can easily destroy itself without any outside help. Anyone who makes the agonizing effort to oppose his heart's natural inclinations until it submits to the authority of Tamma is able to develop Bodhi to perfection. Such a person is truly worthy of veneration. Acharyaman is a classic example of a teacher who develops Bodhi so thoroughly that he becomes a reassuring source of comfort to all his disciples. Acharyaman carefully cultivated his Bodhi tree until the trunk was strong, the branches extensive, the foliage thick, and the fruits and flowers abundant. It was always a peaceful source of shade for those who sought to shelter there. Although he has already passed away, just reading the story of his life is enough to arouse faith in him and the tamma he practiced. It's almost as though he never passed away at all. Chapter 6 The Final Years After departing Chiang Mai, Atsariyaman stayed two rains retreats at Wat Non Niwet Monastery near Don Thani. Following the second retreat, a group of lay devotees from Sakon Nakon, headed by a long-time disciple, Kun Me Num Chuanon, came and invited him to return with them for the spiritual benefit of people there. When he readily agreed, all concerned were delighted, and arrangements were made to escort him there. Upon arriving in Sakon Nakon in late 1941, Atsariyaman first resided at Wat Sudtawat Monastery. Soon monks and laity were arriving daily to pay their respects and seek his advice. <laughs> While at Wat Sudtawat, somebody came with a camera and asked permission to take his photograph to keep as an object of worship. In all, Atsariyaman allowed his picture to be taken three times, on this occasion in Sakon Nakon, previously when he was staying in Nakon Rachasima, and later at Ban Fang Dang in Tat Panom district of Nakon Panom province on his return from Atsarya Sao's funeral. The photographic prints that his devotees collect as objects of worship today are reproductions of pictures taken on these three occasions. But for these, there would be no photographic images to remind us what he looked like. It was not easy to get permission to take Atsarya Man's picture. Those who tried were on pins and needles, fidgeting nervously as they waited, drenched in sweat, looking for a good opportunity to broach the subject with him. Well aware that he rarely gave permission for such activities, they were afraid that if they did not handle the situation properly, then he might simply dismiss them with a curt retort. Atsariyaman stayed at Watsutawat Monastery for a while before moving on to a small forest monastery near the village of Banamon, which, being very quiet and secluded both day and night, suited him perfectly. The monks and novices living with him were an impressive sight, they said very little, but packed quite a punch. That is to say, instead of chatting among themselves, they preferred to put effort into their practice, each monk sitting in his own hut or walking meditation out in the forest. At four o'clock in the afternoon, they all emerged from their living quarters to sweep the grounds together. With the whole area swept clean, they drew water from the well and carried it around to fill up the water barrels used for cleaning their feet and washing their alms bowls. These chores completed, Everyone bathed together at the well in an admirably quiet, composed manner. 
They performed each daily chore with a remarkable self-control, always applying mindfulness and wisdom to analyze the nature of the tasks at hand. No one absent-mindedly engaged in idle conversation. As soon as the day's duties were finished, they separated, each monk returning to his hut to sit or walk in meditation as he saw fit. When the monks returned to their huts, the monastery appeared deserted. A visitor happening to arrive then would not have seen a single monk simply standing around or sitting idly. Had the visitor ventured into the surrounding forest, he would have discovered some of the monks pacing back and forth on their meditation tracks, and others sitting peacefully in their small huts, all preferring to practice quietly in solitude. They came together for alms round and the morning meal, or when there was an evening meeting, and only occasionally for other required duties. Even on alms round, each monk walked to and from the village with cautious restraint, mindfully intent on his meditation practice. They were not negligent, walking along casually, gazing here and there, chatting with anyone who chanced to pass by. <laughs> his monks truly were an inspirational sight to see as they walked for alms with such dignified composure. Back in the monastery, the monks sat together investigating the food in their alms bowls as they prepared to eat. They reflected on the dangers inherent in attachment to food. Remaining mindful as they ate, they gave no indication that they were enjoying the food. With their attention focused on the contents of their alms bowls, they refrained from talking and did not allow their gaze to stray from the task of eating. They chewed their food carefully to avoid making loud, impolite noises that could disturb the others. The meal over, they helped each other put everything neatly away and swept the place clean. Each monk washed his alms bowl, dried it with a cloth, and carefully placed it in the sun for a few minutes. Only then did he put his alms bowl away in the appropriate place. These duties completed, each monk returned to the seclusion of his own living quarters, turning his full attention to training his heart and mind in the manner of practice best suited to him. Sometimes a monk exerted himself to the limit, at other times less so. In either case, he concentrated solely on his practice, unconcerned about how many hours passed or how much energy he expended. Basically, his objective was to make sure his mind remained focused on the meditation subject he had chosen to control it, until that focus of attention became a mental object he could rely on to direct his heart toward peace and calm. Such calm, in turn, helped him to concentrate his mental focus on the cause and effect relationships inherent within whichever phenomena his wisdom then chose to investigate, allowing him to gradually attain increasingly more subtle levels of tamma as he progressed toward the ultimate goal. While applying himself assiduously, he always tried to make sure that his mode of practice was correct for the level of tamma he was working on. It is extremely important that a monk have mindfulness at every stage of his practice. It is also essential that a monk use wisdom when his practice reaches those levels of tamma where wisdom is indispensable. Mindfulness, however, is always indispensable, at all times, in all activities. Wherever mindfulness is missing, effort also is missing. Lacking mindfulness, walking and sitting meditation are just empty postures void of anything that could be called right effort. For this very reason, Atsariya Man stressed mindfulness more than any other aspect of a monk's practice. In fact, mindfulness is the principal foundation supporting every aspect on every level of meditation practice. Practiced continuously, it eventually develops into the kind of supreme mindfulness that fosters the highest levels of wisdom. Mindfulness must be used intensively at the preliminary level of developing meditative calm and concentration. In all succeeding levels of practice, mindfulness and wisdom must be developed in tandem, working as a team. Atsari Amman taught his monks to be very resolute and courageous in their practice. Anyone who was not earnestly committed to the practice was unlikely to remain with him for long. About once a week he called a meeting and gave a talk. On other nights he expected the monks to expedite their efforts on their own. Those with doubts or questions about their practice could consult him without having to wait for the next meeting. An aura of tamma pervaded the atmosphere around him, giving his students the feeling that magga, pala, and nibbana were truly within their reach. His reassuring presence, his reassuring presence gave them the determination and courage necessary to pursue their practice to the limit, conducting themselves in a manner that suggested they had the highest attainments in their sights. When meditating, they made little distinction between day and night. Each monk strived in earnest, regardless of the hour. On moonless nights, candle lanterns illuminated meditation tracks around the whole area. On moonlit nights, monks walked meditation by the light of the moon, 
each practicing with a sense of urgency that allowed him very little time for sleep. Atsariyaman's proficiency in chanting the suttas was unrivaled. He chanted suttas alone for many hours every night without fail. He would chant long discourses like the Tamma Chakkapavatana Sutta and the Maha Samaya Sutta nearly every night. Occasionally, he translated the meaning of the suttas for our benefit, translations based on his own personal experience. He spoke directly to their essential meaning, often bypassing the strict rules of Bali grammar normally used to maintain uniformity in translations. The undeniable clarity of his translations allowed his audience to glimpse the fundamental message of the ancient texts he quoted. Amazingly, he translated Pali better than the accomplished scholars, though he had never studied Pali in any formal way. No sooner had he mentioned a Pali phrase than, without even a pause, he had translated it as well in a quick, fluent style that defied belief. For instance, when citing passages from the Tamma Chakka Pawatana Sutta, or the Mahasamaya Sutta during the course of his talks, he gave fast, simultaneous translations worthy of a 10th grade Pali scholar. I say the 10th grade because I have heard 9th grade Pali scholars translate, and they tend to be slow and plodding. They deliberate quite a long time over each passage, and even then they are not very sure of their translations. Not only was Atsariyaman quick, he also was boldly confident of the truth of his words. Having clearly experienced the truth of their essential meaning himself, he was certain of his translations. Bali verses arose spontaneously in his heart, which he then elaborated on in a way that differed somewhat from classical interpretations. For example, Vata Rukka Napabbato, which he translated as Gale force winds can uproot whole trees, yet they can't move a mountain of stone. This is an example of one Tamma verse that arose spontaneously in his heart, along with the translation, while he was giving a talk to the monks. What I just wrote about the ninth and tenth grades of Pali scholarship shouldn't be taken too seriously. It is merely a figure of speech used by monks in the forest tradition. No offense is intended. We forest monks tend to act a bit like monkeys that have grown accustomed to living in the wild. Even if they are caught and raised as pets, they still retain their old habits. They can never really adapt to human behavior. Please excuse me for presuming to compare Atsariya Mun's translations with those of Bali scholars. Some readers may feel that I have overstepped the mark here. In due time, Atsariya Mun left Banamon and moved to Bangkok, just over a mile away, where he spent the rainy season retreat. Since it was difficult to find a better location, the monastery was located only half a mile from the village. Still, the place was very quiet. Not more than eleven or twelve monks stayed with him at any one time in either of those places, due to the limited number of available huts. It was while he resided at Bangkok that I arrived. He was kind enough to accept me as a student, although I was about as useful as an old log. I lived there like a ladle in a pot of stew. I feel ashamed just thinking about it now, this useless log of a monk staying with an absolutely brilliant sage of such universal renown. All the same, I do feel easier about writing his story from this period onward. Up to this point in the story, I have felt somewhat hampered, and not a little frustrated, by the fact that most of my information comes second-hand from senior disciples who lived with him in the early years. In preparation for writing this biography, I spent many years going around to meet those Atsariyas, interviewing them and writing down their memories, or taping my conversations with them. All this material then needed to be carefully arranged in chronological order before it could be presented in a meaningful, readable format. A very demanding task. From now on, I shall be writing about what I myself witnessed in the final years of Atsariya Mun's life. Although this part of the story may not impress the reader as much as what has gone before, as the author, I feel relieved to be writing from personal experience. Atsariyaman spent the rains retreat at the Ban Kok Forest Monastery with a small group of monks, all of whom remained healthy and contented throughout the three months. Atsariyaman called a meeting about once a week, both during the retreat period and after it was over. Although his discourses usually lasted for two to four hours, his audience was so completely absorbed in meditation practice that thoughts of weariness and fatigue never crossed their minds. For his part, Atsariyaman was completely absorbed in delivering the Tamma, expounding the nature of cause and effect in a reasonable way that struck a chord with his listeners, all of whom were genuinely searching for truth. The Tamma he presented was delivered straight from a heart that had realized this truth with absolute clarity, leaving no room for doubt. Only one doubt remained. Could the monks actually do the practice the way he described it? 
He delivered his discourses in a manner reminiscent of times past, when the Lord Putta delivered a discourse to a gathering of monks. We can be sure that the Lord Putta's discourses were concerned solely with the great treasures of Dhamma. That is, he spoke only on subjects directly related to Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. Thus, monks listening to him were able to attain Magga, Pala, and Nibbana one after another, in steady succession, right up until the day of his final passing away. Because the Buddha's teaching emanated directly from an absolutely pure heart, the tamma he delivered was incomparably superb. This was Magga and Pala, it's pure and simple, and his listeners were able to emulate his teaching to perfection. The tamma that Atsariyaman delivered was spontaneous tamma of the present moment, refined and purified in his heart. He did not theorize or speculate when he spoke. His audience already had their own doubts and uncertainties about the practice, and further speculation would only have served to increase those doubts. Instead, as they listened, his tamma gradually dispelled their doubts. Those who heard his wonderful expositions were able to use them as a way to significantly reduce their kilesas. Beyond that, they could be used to conclusively eliminate all doubts. Atariyaman chanted suttas every night for several hours. On a night when no meeting was held, he left his meditation track at about eight o'clock and entered his hut to quietly chant suttas at length, before resuming seated meditation until it was time to retire. On meeting nights, his chanting began later, after the meeting was over. This meant that his normal schedule was delayed when there was a meeting, so that he retired later than usual, at midnight or 1 a.m. One evening, hearing him softly chanting in his hut, I had the mischievous urge to sneak up and listen. I wanted to find out what suttas he chanted at such length every night. As soon as I crept up close enough to hear him clearly, however, he stopped chanting and remained silent. This did not look good, so I quickly backed away and stood listening from a distance. No sooner had I backed away than the low cadence of his chanting started up again, now too faint to be heard clearly. So again I sneaked forward, and again he went silent. In the end, I never did find out what suttas he was chanting. I was afraid that if I stubbornly insisted on standing there eavesdropping, a bolt of lightning might strike and a sharp rebuke thunder out. Meeting him the next morning, I glanced away. I did not dare to look him in the face, but he looked directly at me with a sharp, menacing glare. I learned my lesson the hard way. Never again did I dare to sneak up and try to listen in on his chanting. I was afraid I would receive something severe for my trouble. From what I had observed of him, if I persisted, there was a real chance I'd get just what I was asking for. It was only later, after long association with him, that I clearly understood just how well he perceived everything going on around him. Thinking about it now, how could he possibly have been unaware that I was standing there like an idiot and listening so intently? It's obvious he was fully aware. But before making any comment, he wanted first to wait and check out this stubborn, silly monk. Any further such behavior was bound to invoke a severe response. What amazed me was... Each time I crept close to his hut, he stopped chanting straight away. He obviously knew exactly what was going on. Fellowship with Pigs One day, shortly after my arrival, during a time when I was extremely wary of Atsariyaman, I lay down in the middle of the day and dozed off. As I slept, Atsariyaman appeared in my dream to scold me. Why are you sleeping like a pig? This is no pig farm. I won't tolerate monks coming here to learn the art of being a pig. You'll turn this place into a pigsty. His voice bellowed, fierce and menacing, frightening me and causing me to wake with a start. Dazed and trembling, I stuck my head out the door expecting to see him. I was generally very frightened of him anyway, but I had forced myself to stay with him despite that. The reason was simple. It was the right thing to do. Besides, he had an effective antidote for pigs like me. So I was in a panic. I stuck my head out, looking around in all directions, but I didn't see him anywhere. Only then did I begin to breathe a bit easier. Later, when I had a chance, I told Atsariyaman what happened. He very cleverly explained my dream in a way that relieved my discomfort, a tolerant approach that I don't always agree with, since soothing words can easily promote carelessness and complacency. He explained my dream like this. You've just recently come to live with a teacher, and you are really determined to do well. Your dream simply mirrored your state of mind. That scolding you heard, reproaching you for acting like a pig, 
was the tamma warning you not to bring pig-like tendencies into the monkhood and the religion. Most people do only what they feel like doing, failing to take into account the value of their human birth and the consequences of their actions. This makes it difficult for them to fully realize their human potential. There's an old saying that someone is not all there. It refers to a basic lack of human potential arising from callous insensitivity to the fact that human beings possess intrinsic qualities that are superior to those of animals. This attitude promotes such degrading behavior that some people end up damaged almost beyond repair, an empty human shell lacking all intrinsic goodness. Even then, they are unaware of what has happened to them or why. If we possess sufficient mindfulness and wisdom, Tamma can guide us in investigating this matter for ourselves. Your dream was a good, timely warning. Learn from it. From now on, whenever you're feeling lazy, you can use it as a means of stirring up the mindfulness necessary to overcome your indolence. This type of dream is exceptionally potent. Not everyone has a dream like this. I appreciate such dreams, for they effectively stimulate mindfulness, keeping it constantly vigilant. This, in turn, accelerates progress in meditation, allowing the heart to attain calm with relative ease. If you take this lesson that Tamma has provided and put it consistently into practice, you can expect to quickly achieve meditative calm. Who knows? You may even penetrate the true nature of Tamma ahead of those who have been practicing meditation for many years. That dream of yours was very worthwhile. It wasn't a bad omen by any means. Don't be excessively frightened of your teacher. It will only cause you to feel uncomfortable all the time. Nothing of benefit can be gained from unreasonable fear of the teacher. He has a moral obligation to educate his students using every means available to him. It's not your teacher you should fear, but evil, for evil leads directly to suffering. I don't accept monks as my students just so I can castigate them for no good reason. The training a monk undertakes is a stringent one, following principles laid down by the Buddha. A teacher's guidance must follow the strict logic of these principles. If he deviates from this path, neither he nor the student benefits in any way. So put your mind at ease and work hard at your practice. Effort is key. Don't become discouraged and ease up. Tamma belongs to everyone who truly desires it. The Buddha did not limit the possession of Tamma to a particular individual. Everyone who practices in the right way enjoys the same right of ownership. Don't forget that auspicious dream. Reflect on it often, and all pig-like tendencies will fade into the background, as Magga, Pala, and Nibbana draw ever closer. Then it's only a matter of time before the domain beyond Dukkha appears. It's inevitable. I'm truly pleased about your dream. I have trained myself with a similar fiery intensity, and I've always had good results. I've found it imperative to use such methods throughout my years of practice, and now, occasionally, I must use similar methods to train my students. Atsarya Man used this interpretation of my dream to console a youngster who was new to the training. He was concerned this kid might lose heart and give up trying to make an effort, thus rejoining the fraternity of pigs. That's why he resorted to this method of teaching. His teaching methods always displayed an unparalleled ingenuity. I often went to speak with him during that early period when my mental state was fluctuating between periods of progress and periods of decline, a time of particular stress and uneasiness for me and he advised me in the same comforting manner. As soon as I paid my respect to him, he asked me how much it was doing. If it happened to be a time when my meditation was progressing nicely, I told him so. He then voiced his approval and encouraged me to keep up the good work so that I could quickly transcend dukkha. If my meditation was deteriorating, I replied that my mind was so bad it seemed all traces of happiness had gone. He then adopted a sympathetic attitude. That's too bad. Where's it gone? Well, don't be discouraged. Just put maximum effort into your practice, and it will reappear for sure. It has simply wandered off somewhere. If you accelerate your efforts, it will come back on its own. The chitta is like a dog. It inevitably follows its owner wherever he goes. It won't just run away. Intensify your practice, and the chitta is bound to return on its own. Don't waste time thinking about where it's gone to. Wherever it's gone, it can't possibly run away. If you want it to return quickly, concentrate your efforts. Any discouragement will only boost the chitta's ego. Thinking you really miss it so much, it will play hard to get. So stop thinking about the chitta you've lost. Instead, think butto, repeating it continuously over and over again. Once the word butto has been mentally established by repeating it continuously in rapid succession, 
the chitta will hurry back of its own accord. Even then, don't let go of buddho. Buddho is the chitta's food. As long as there is food, it will always come running back. So repeat buddho constantly until the chitta has eaten its fill. Then it will have to take a rest. You too will feel satisfied while the chitta rests calmly. When it's calm, it ceases to run madly about looking to cause you trouble. Keep this practice up until you cannot chase it away even if you want to. This is the perfect method to use with a mind whose ravenous appetite is never satiated. As long as it has enough food, it will not leave even if you try to drive it away. Follow my advice, and the state of your chitta will never again deteriorate. Buddha is the key. So long as its food is there, it won't stray. Do as I say, and you'll never again experience the disappointment of seeing your chitta get worse time and time again. This was yet another technique employed by Atsariyaman to teach those of us who were really stupid. But at least I believed him, in my own stupid way. Otherwise, I would probably still be chasing after a mind in perpetual decline without any chance of ever catching it. I've written about this matter for the sake of those readers who may glean some useful ideas from the way a clever person teaches a stupid one. It is not my intention to glorify my own stupidity or the lenient treatment that I received from Atsariyaman at the time. Following the rains retreat, Atsariyaman returned briefly to Ban Namun and then moved on to Ban Hui Gan, settling in the nearby forest for a while. From there, he moved to an abandoned monastery at the base of a mountain near the village of Ban Na Sinuan, remaining there for several months. While he was there, he came down with a fever which lasted for days, curing himself as usual with the therapeutic power of Tamma. In April 1942, he traveled to Ubon Ratatani to attend the funeral of his teacher, Atsariya Sao. Once the cremation ceremony was completed, he returned to Ban Namuan for the rains retreat. During that retreat, Atsariya Man employed a wide variety of methods to press his students to maximize their efforts, exhorting them to be diligent in their practice. He called a meeting once every four days throughout the entire rains period, helping many monks to develop in Tamma and attain inner strength. Many experienced unusual insights which they reported to Atsariya Man. I had the privilege of listening to those experiences, although I was not as accomplished in my practice as many of the others. Many memorable things occurred during that rains retreat, things that I have never forgotten. I will remember those outstanding experiences for the rest of my life. During that retreat period, Atsariya Man began to use tough, coercive measures with us, treating us more like old foot rags. Until then, he had used relatively gentle methods, turning a blind eye to our shortcomings. He probably decided that the time was right to get tough with us. If he continued to tolerate our lapses indefinitely, he would feel burdened all the time, and his students would never awake from their slumber long enough to open their eyes and see the earth, the sky, the moon, and the stars. As a result, all the monks were eager to do meditation practice and excited about the insights they gained from their efforts. Monks routinely described their inner experiences to Atsariya Man so that he could help them to further their understanding. At the same time, he would point out how they could perfect those aspects of their practice that still needed improvement. He did his best to answer every question that was put to him. Those question and answer sessions, when he gave advice to specific individuals, were engrossing expositions on the practical aspects of Tamma. His responses to the monks who approached him about their meditative experiences were never predictable being dictated by the specific nature of the experience or the question under discussion. He always answered in the manner best suited to the individual student, elucidating points of practice and recommending techniques appropriate for his specific level of practice. Those of us who had the privilege of listening in especially enjoyed hearing about the meditation experiences and questions posed by monks whose practice had reached an advanced stage. We were truly captivated then, wishing for those discussions never to end, we were keen to hear such exchanges very often, and so imbibe this tamma to our heart's content. Atsariyaman addressed many different topics during the course of a meeting. He told us about his past lives. He recounted the initial stages of his own practice, including insights into various phenomena arising in his meditation. He elaborated on the methods he used in his struggle to extricate himself from the quagmire of samsara to the point where he verged on transcending the world of conventional reality and how that final transcendence actually occurred. Talk of his supreme attainment made those of us 
who yearned for this transcendent tamma, eager to attain it ourselves. This prompted some of us to feel a bit dejected, wondering if we really had enough inherent potential to successfully reach that sphere of tamma that he had realized to perfection. Perhaps we would remain stuck in this quagmire forever, unable to escape from the deep pit of samsara. How is it he can attain freedom, yet we still cannot arouse ourselves from sleep? When will we be able to realize the same transcendent freedom he has? This sort of thinking had the advantage of awakening a persistent determination in us to tolerate the difficulties and press ahead with our efforts. This, in turn, facilitated every aspect of the practice. We were so inspired and energized by the tamma he so kindly elucidated for us that all sense of weariness and fatigue vanished. Our faith in him gave us the necessary strength to willingly shoulder the heaviest burdens. The Lord Putta taught us to associate with the wise. The truth of this is obvious to students living in the presence of a good teacher, listening day in and day out to his uplifting instructions. Their enthusiasm gains momentum as his teaching gradually permeates deep into the fabric of their being, and his virtuous qualities eventually infuse their characters. Although they cannot hope to match him in every respect, at least they exemplify their teacher's virtues. The opposite also holds true. The more we associate with fools, the worse off we are. These two teachings of the Buddha are equally valid. We can become good through association with good people, or we can suffer harm through association with bad people. If we observe someone who has spent a long time training under a good teacher, it is evident that he has gained some steadfast principles from that relationship. Conversely, it's obvious that those who get mixed up with fools will eventually display the same foolish characteristics, or perhaps worse ones. Here I am referring to the external fools we meet in society. But you should understand that there are still other internal fools buried deep within the personalities of each and every one of us, even well-mannered people like monks and nuns who wear the sacred Buddhist robes, openly proclaiming themselves to be disciples of the Lord Buddha. By inner fool, I mean the craven stupidity and timidness that makes us shrink from facing up to the mind's baser instincts, which are just waiting to express themselves in ignoble, degrading manners. Many people are unaware of the repugnant forces buried within their minds, but even people who are aware of them tend to believe that as long as those things remain hidden inside and do not express themselves in speech or actions, then their repugnance is not really an issue. In truth, all bad things, regardless of where they exist, are intrinsically repugnant by nature. It's not necessary for bad instincts to express themselves externally to be considered repugnant. They are already frightfully repugnant in and of themselves and must be dealt with as such. That wisest of sages, the Lord Putta, taught us to renounce all bad things and root them out, completely eradicating them from our hearts. The Lord Putta and his Arahant disciples were perfect examples of this. Both their hearts and their conduct were free from blemish. Wherever they lived, they always remained unperturbed and sublimely contented. In my opinion, based on personal observation, Atsariyaman was another monk free from blemish. I say this with complete confidence, accepting full responsibility, for I am certain that it is true. Any skepticism should be directed at me, not Atsariyaman. His escape from the snares of Mara is already well completed. After the rains retreat, Atsariyaman continued living at Ban Namon for many months. Just prior to the next retreat, he moved back to Bangkok, but not to the same forest monastery where he previously lived. He stayed in a new monastery, built and offered to him by Atsariya Gongma Chirapunyo. He found the location quite suitable, comfortably spending the rains retreat there in good health. As usual, he held regular meetings to instruct the monks. In summary, Atsariya Man stayed continuously in the area around Ban Hui Gan, Ban Na Sinuan, Bangkok and Ban Namon in the Tongkop district of Sakonnakon province for three successive years, including three rainy season retreats. As usual, he taught the non-physical beings who contacted him, though fewer devas came in Sakonnakon, and their visits were far less frequent than those of devas in Chiang Mai. It was probably because the region was less remote, and thus less secluded. They tended to come only on religious festival days, such as Maga Puja, Isaka Puja, and the observance days at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the rains retreat. Other than that, relatively few devas came to visit him. 
Only a small group of monks actually spent these rains retreats with him due to a limited number of available huts. He could not accept new arrivals unless there were vacancies. The situation was different outside of the retreat period. Then monks from many different places came to train under him. Following the retreat, a steady flow of monks came and went at his monastery, and he always very kindly made a special effort to instruct them in their practice. In the dry season following the third rains retreat, a group of lay people from the village of Banong Peo Nanai went to see Acharyaman and invited him to return with them to live near their village. He accepted their offer and was escorted to their village in the Nanai sub-district of Banna Nikom in Sagon Nikon province, where he spent the next rains retreat. He traveled the distance from Bangkok to Banong Peo, hiking through thick forest, camping out along the way each night. Making his way through rough, wooded terrain the entire way, he finally arrived several days later. Soon after his arrival, he came down with a severe case of malaria. The symptoms of this strain of malaria alternate between bouts of very high fever and shivering cold chills. It's a punishing affliction that lasts for months. Anyone falling victim to such severe malaria lives to dread it, because the fever never quite seems to go away. It may last for years, the symptoms returning again and again, after apparently having been cured. The fever can disappear for fifteen days, or maybe a month, and then, just when one thinks it's finally cured, it resurfaces. Sometimes several months may elapse before it returns. I previously described how malarial fever caused in-laws to lose patience with each other. If the son-in-law came down with it, his wife's parents soon became fed up with him. If one of his wife's parents had it, the son-in-law soon got fed up. The patient became a burden on the rest of the family because... Although he couldn't do any heavy work, he still ate a lot, slept constantly, and then complained bitterly to no end. Malaria is a most tiresome illness, which tries everyone's patience. Its effect was compounded by the fact that in those days there were no effective medicines for curing malaria as there are today. A person contracting it just had to wait for it to disappear on its own. If it refused to go away, it could easily become a chronic condition, dragging on for years. Young children who became infected usually had swollen, distended bellies and pale, anemic complexions. Natives of the low-lying plains, who had moved to settle in forested areas, tended to be the worst victims of this strain of malaria. Indigenous forest inhabitants were not immune, though their symptoms were seldom so severe as those of people who came from open, lowland areas. Malaria was also common among Jutunga monks, as they normally liked to wander extensively through forested mountain areas. Were this dreaded disease something valuable, something to boast about, then I myself could boast with the best of them, having suffered, having suffered its devastating effects many times. It scares me just thinking about it now. I was hit with a case of malaria my very first year at Ban Nong Peo, an ordeal that severely chastened me. Fever plagued me the entire rainy season, then lingered on intermittently into the dry season, refusing to completely go away. How could I fail to be chastened? Being fully sensitive to pleasure and pain like everybody else, monks naturally dread the thought of pain and discomfort. Once Atariyaman became settled at Ban Nong Peo, the number of monks coming to stay with him on a regular basis steadily increased. As many as twenty to thirty monks came each year to spend the rains retreat with him. In addition to the monks who lived in the monastery, many others stayed close by in the vicinity of other small villages. A few monks lived together in some locations, five or six in others, and occasionally nine or ten in some places. Each of these groups stayed in separate places, all within walking distance of Atsariyaman's monastery. As many as thirty to forty monks from the surrounding area used to assemble at his monastery in Uposita observance days. Combined with resident monks, the total assembly easily reached fifty or sixty. Outside the retreat period, it sometimes exceeded that number, as monks continuously arrived at Ban Nong Peo seeking Atsariyaman's guidance. During the day, they dispersed into the thick forest surrounding the monastery grounds to do their practice in solitude. The forest in this region was many tens of miles wide, while its length was almost unlimited, as it extended along a series of overlapping mountain ranges that seemed to stretch on forever. In those days, virtually the whole region, from the district of Panna Nikom south to the province of Galasin, was blanketed by forests. For this reason, 
Atsarya Man's monastery at Banong Peo proved to be an excellent central location for Tutanga monks of the Gammatana tradition who were obliged to attend regular recitations of the Patimokkha and receive Dhamma instructions from their teacher. Those wanting to come with questions about their meditation practice could easily do so. During the dry season, his disciples wandered off into the surrounding mountains, living and practicing in the many caves and under the overhanging rocks scattered throughout the rugged terrain. Numerous small settlements of thatched huts dotted the mountain ridges where five or six families eked out a living, growing crops. Many Tutanga monks relied on those communities for their daily alms food. But they could live conveniently anywhere in the region's thick forests, since small village communities of ten to thirty houses were scattered throughout. The village of Ban Nong Peo was situated in a rather broad valley, completely surrounded by mountains. The villagers made a living by farming the land they could clear. Beyond that, forested mountain ranges stretched in every direction, making it an ideal place for Tutanga monks who easily found the kinds of secluded sites they preferred. Consequently, large numbers of Tutanga monks lived throughout the region, in the rainy and the dry seasons alike. Many went to see Atsariyaman regularly, and then wandered off again to practice in the mountains, walking down from there to hear his instructions, then returning to continue their practice. Some traveled from other provincial districts, or even other regions, to train with him at Ban Nong Peo, especially in the dry season, when travel was more convenient. Lay people also made the arduous journey to pay their respects to him and hear his advice. They traveled by foot from locations all around the region, some quite far away. Everyone came by foot, except for the elderly and women who, unaccustomed to hiking, hired ox carts to take them to the monastery. The dirt track extending from the main district of Panna Nikom to Ban Nong Peo was about twelve miles long, following a path that cut straight up through the mountains. Following a more circuitous route around the base of the mountains, the distance was about fifteen miles. Those unaccustomed to hiking would never make it if they took the direct route, since there were no villages along the way where they could find food and shelter. The more circuitous route had only a few villages spread far apart, so it wasn't very convenient either. Monks traveling to see Atariyaman were on foot, there being no road to Ban Nong Peo that was suitable for motorized traffic. What public transport there was in those days went along the main provincial highways, and then only infrequently. Latecomers usually missed their ride and wasted a whole day waiting for the next one. Dutanga monks preferred traveling by foot. They found riding in vehicles inconvenient, since they were usually crowded with people. A Tutanga monk considered hiking from place to place simply another aspect of his meditation practice. Once he determined which mountain range or forest he wanted to head for, he focused on his practice and started his journey as though he were walking in meditation and the forest trails were his track. He did not fret about where the next village might be or whether he would reach it before dark. He resolved to walk until dusk, then look for a place to rest for the night. The next morning he walked on until he reached the nearest village. There he collected alms food from the local inhabitants as he passed through. He was satisfied to eat whatever they offered. The quality of the food was usually poor, but that didn't worry him. If it was sufficient to keep him going from one day to the next, he was content. Having eaten his meal, he continued on his journey peacefully until he reached his destination. There he searched until he found a site in the forest that best suited his personal requirements. He paid special attention to the availability of water a vital requisite when living in the wilds. Having set up camp in a suitable location, the Tutunga monk turned his attention to the task of intensifying his efforts internally, alternating walking and sitting meditation around the clock, day and night. Bolstered by mindfulness and aided by the contemplative faculties of wisdom, he concentrated on a tamma theme that suited his temperament, thus inducing his heart to drop into the peaceful calm of samadhi. Withdrawing from samadhi, he focused on developing wisdom by investigating whichever phenomena arose in his field of awareness. Subjects included impressions from the external environment that constantly impinged on his sense faculties, and aspects of his internal environment, such as the physical elements and the sense organs, which continually fluctuate as they remain constantly in motion. He meditated on viparinama tamma, that all things perpetually come and go, subject to the instability of constant change. He could not afford to be apathetic toward anything that might entangle his heart. He used wisdom to thoroughly analyze his body and mind to clearly understand their true nature, 
gradually letting go of any attachment to them. Wisdom was the tool he used to excavate the entire root system of the Kilesas, relentlessly destroying them, trunk, roots, and all. His mind was fixed on a single purpose, investigating all arising phenomena. Everything that made contact with the mind was scrutinized in terms of the Dilakkana to gain insight into its true nature, thus eliminating the Kilesas associated with it. Any Tutanga monk who felt uncertain about his mode of practice returned to Atsariyaman as quickly as possible to ask him for clarification. As soon as his doubts were cleared up, he left, returning to the seclusion of the mountains to press ahead with his spiritual development. Many Jutanga monks relied on Atsariyaman to give them guidance in meditation. There was not sufficient room in his monastery to accommodate them all. So, after receiving his instructions, they went to live in the surrounding hills and forests. Spreading out in different directions, either alone or in pairs, each monk looked for a secluded place to set up camp that was within walking distance of Atsariyaman's monastery. In that way, they could return to see him with minimum inconvenience. Depending on individual preferences, some monks lived three or four miles away, others between five to eight miles, while a few might have lived as far as twelve to fifteen miles from him. Monks traveling a distance of twelve miles or more to consult Acharya Mun remained overnight in his monastery before walking back to their respective locations. The trails that connected forest and mountain hamlets then were very different from the provincial roads seen everywhere today. They were mere dirt tracks that those communities had used for ages to keep in touch with one another, and all the local people were familiar with the routes. Since the villagers seldom made long treks to visit one another, since the villagers seldom made long treks to visit one another, the trails were often overgrown and obscured by undergrowth. Anyone unfamiliar with this network of trails had to be very careful not to take a wrong fork and get lost in the densely forested terrain. One might well end up in an area where there were no settlements at all. The distance between some communities could be twelve to fifteen miles of uninterrupted jungle. Such lengthy trails required special caution, for any traveler who lost his way would almost surely end up spending the night in the wilderness without any food. Besides that, he might never safely find his way out unless he chanced upon a hunter who pointed him in the right direction or conducted him back to the main trail to his destination. Harsh Training Methods Dutanga Gammatana monks were motivated by their great enthusiasm for Tamma. They regularly endured many hardships in their wandering lifestyle, in their living conditions, and in their mode of practice. It was difficult for them to find an excellent teacher like Acharya Man, a teacher capable of training them in the authentic way, thus bringing joy to their practice. Whenever they met him, they were as excited as small children greeting their parents. The devotion and affection they felt combined to give them a feeling of complete confidence in him. Their lives and well-being were placed solely in his hands. Dutanga monks naturally tended to have immense faith in their teacher, revering him so much they would willingly give up their lives for him without regrets. Even when living apart from him, they continued to feel an extraordinary sense of obligation to their teacher. No matter how much hardship they endured, or how difficult their training was, they were contented to persevere so long as their teacher was supportive. They could manage to put up with the deprivations they suffered daily, going without as often as not, because they were convinced in their hearts that Tumma was more important than anything else. There were times when they had to sleep in the pouring rain through the night, shivering like little birds. Still, their determination to endure adversity for the sake of Tumma never wavered. It was always very interesting to hear Tutanga monks discuss their experiences of wandering through remote forest areas. The way they practiced, the way they endured, it was pitiable how, due to extreme deprivations, they lived in the forest like wild animals, often sleeping on the ground without shelter. They used a variety of techniques to intensify their meditation, experimenting until they found the ones that best suited their character. They tried going without sleep, reducing the amount of food they ate, fasting entirely for as many days as they could reasonably manage, walking in meditation all night from dusk until dawn, sitting in samadhi for many hours at a stretch, sitting in samadhi all night from dusk to dawn, sitting in samadhi on a trail used by tigers when entering their lair, 
sitting in samadhi at night on forest trails frequented by tigers, sitting in samadhi in a cemetery on the day a corpse was being cremated, sitting in samadhi at the edge of a precipice, venturing deep into the mountains at night looking for a particularly scary place to sit in samadhi, sitting in samadhi late at night at the foot of a tree in a tiger-infested area, relying on the threat of danger to help the citta attain calm. These methods were all practiced with the same aim in mind, to torment the citta and so forcibly tame its unruly nature. When a monk discovered that any one or more of these techniques matched his individual temperament, when a monk discovered that any one or more of these techniques matched his individual temperament, he used it to good effect, focusing his mind and strengthening his resolve, thus achieving his objective and learning many valuable lessons in the process. For this reason, Dutanga monks actually preferred such harrowing practices. Atsaryaman himself had used them and so liked to encourage his monks to do likewise, insisting that this was the way clever people train themselves. These techniques have never been abandoned. They are still being practiced by Tutanga monks today. The training we undertake to develop our spiritual worth requires a fair amount of coercion to be successful. The hardships we experience are insignificant when compared with the good results we gain. Virtue, contentment, discipline, and firm tamma principles to supervise and maintain our lives, all qualities that people highly value. Only useless junk and cadavers require no maintenance. The personal worth we hope to realize will only arise through conscientious self-improvement, so we should work to maintain this purpose in our lives. By this means, we will be good, happy, prosperous people now and in the future. Dudanga monks therefore deserve a lot of respect for refusing to allow adversity and hardship to hinder their practice, thus clearing the way for tamma to develop in their hearts. So long as people are interested in practicing tamma properly, the Buddha's sasana will last indefinitely in the world. The sasana rewards those truly desiring tamma who practice accordingly, giving excellent results at every step along the path. This principle was embodied in the Lord Buddha, who was earnest in his pursuit of truth, a truth that he fully realized and then taught to the world. Those who truly believe in Buddhism are those who earnestly pursue truth. They never practice in a half-hearted, inept manner, thus impeding the sasana's progress and devaluing it to the extent that non-Buddhists find cause to be contemptuous. The genuine sasana are the very noble truths that deserve to be proclaimed and accepted throughout the universe without concern about their validity, since they are true natural principles emanating directly from the Buddha's absolute purity. Unless, of course, one is uninterested in truth or unable to understand it. In that case, the sasana may simply be held hostage within the countless diverse opinions of people whose hearts are totally obscured by a mass of deep-rooted kilesas, a veil of defilements that the sasana has long since thoroughly penetrated. Please excuse me for this lengthy digression. It shows I lack the firm principles needed to restrain my wayward tendencies. I would like to continue discussing those harsh training methods that Tutanga monks tended to use until they became second nature. Diligently practiced, each of these methods produces clear-cut results. They help diminish the unruly, arrogant nature of the mind, a condition exacerbated by excessive physical vitality. Reducing the intake of food, fasting, going without sleep, or other harsh methods, such as walking or sitting in meditation continuously for long periods of time, all of these practices provide the heart with the strength required to advance easily on the path of tamma. Other practices are designed for those who are scared of tigers or ghosts, which, when practiced unflinchingly, force the heart to turn inwards where its true sanctuary lies, remaining there until calm and courage arise. Fears can be alleviated or even banished by such means. The citta then comes to realize its own strength and ability, so that when it is driven into a corner at a truly crucial juncture, for example, when the body is racked by excruciating pain, it has the means to emerge victorious and survive. Normally, mindfulness and wisdom are fully aroused only when the citta is placed in a critical situation. Otherwise, they never have a chance to realize their full potential. An excellent way to develop the capacity of mindfulness and wisdom to act boldly in full knowledge of their true potential is to use our basic ingenuity, experimenting with various forceful techniques until we find those that best suit us. Our hearts then remain unperturbed, 
regardless of what happens. Each of these methods brings its own distinct results. Those who have long suffered from fear of ghosts can rid themselves of this debilitating fear by forcing themselves to spend the night in a cemetery. Those who are terrified of wild animals, like tigers, can overcome this fear by forcing themselves to spend the night alone in terrifying wilderness. Those who have persistent craving for food can alleviate it or even overcome it by drastically reducing the amount they eat or by going on fast. We all appreciate good food. We tend to believe that eating a lot of good, tasty food will make us happy. The trouble is, greed never accepts that it's had enough. It always hankers for more. No matter how much discontent it causes us, we fail to consider that the dissatisfaction stems from our tendency to overindulge. So, those of us practicing tamma for the sake of understanding ourselves and our attachments must investigate such desires and exercise some forceful restraints on their excesses. In the case of Dutanga monks, this sometimes takes the form of self-imposed austerities. When a monk notices that a certain type of food kindles an unseemly craving in his heart, he punishes the craving by refusing to eat that food. Instead, he eats things that he feels no desire for. If he feels that he'd like to eat a lot, he eats only a little instead. Or he may eat only plain rice, even though there are plenty of other foods to choose from. Those foods which invigorate the body may hamper his chitta by overwhelming its mental faculties, thus making meditation more difficult. His practice then fails to progress as it should, despite the fact that he is striving with the same intensity as ever. Once he realizes the cause of the problem, he strives to eliminate it by adamantly refusing to follow the greed in his heart. This is the attitude of a monk truly committed to training himself under the guidance of a good teacher. He resists any temptation to follow his usual self-indulgent tendencies. Just as a Dutanga monk trains himself to be moderate and restrained in what he eats, so too, when he goes to sleep, he determines to awaken at a predetermined time. He doesn't just let sleep take its course, waking him up randomly whenever it so desires. He trains himself to carefully consider the appropriateness of his actions. He resists doing anything that may violate the ethical principles of Tamma and therefore be inappropriate, even though it may not strictly be in the violation of the disciplinary rules. He strives to inculcate Tamma within his heart so that it steadily flourishes, never deteriorating. An extremely difficult task. So difficult, in fact, that no other endeavor can compare with it. When, however, we inculcate the ways of the world in our hearts, defilements easily arise and flourish, then wait there ready to cause harm whenever we're off guard. We can never manage to bring them under control. In an instant they furtively infiltrate our hearts and multiply until we cannot keep track of them all. We can be sure that they will cause us nothing but trouble. They arise and flourish so quickly that, within the blink of an eye, they are everywhere, and we are helpless to catch them. Sexual craving is one such defilement, very easy to arise, but so difficult to purge. Sexual craving creates a destructive, offensive state of mind that tends to express itself with unrivaled audacity. Because everyone in the world is so fond of it, it becomes emboldened, causing destruction everywhere while ignoring the moral consequences. It does show some fear of people with tamma in their hearts, but more than anything else, but more than anything else, it is terrified of the Lord Putta and the Arahants. Since these noble ones have completely demolished its normal playground, sexual craving does not dare enter their hearts to prowl around. But it still creates plenty of trouble for the rest of us who remain under its power. Dutanga monks are aware that these oppressive kilesas are obstructing their spiritual progress. That's the reason they torture themselves with such arduous training practices. For Gilesas are not in the least disconcerted by the fact that monks have ordained into the holy life and wear the yellow robes, the distinctive badge of victory for those who defeat the forces of Mara. They invariably try to convince monks to give up the yellow robes and the spiritual quest they symbolize, refusing to admit defeat regardless of a monk's age or seniority. For this reason, Tutanga monks feel compelled to use coercive methods in their struggle to eradicate the kilesas from their hearts. They endure and press ahead in spite of the difficulties, battling pain and discomfort but never reversing course. Otherwise, the kilesas will make fun of them as they disgrace themselves and the yellow robes they wear. Even more damaging is the discredit they do to the monkhood, 
an order of spiritual warriors who never accept defeat, and the sasana, which is the principal basis for all mankind. Better they sacrifice their lives to redeem themselves in the yellow robes than allow themselves to perish in disgrace. In that way, they redeem the monkhood and the religion as well. Lutanga monks use such exhortations to embolden themselves to strive for victory, thus honoring the tamma that some day will undoubtedly lead them to that sublime domain beyond Dukkha. Only the tamma of the Lord Buddha is capable of showing the way to that sublime transcendence. It is without a doubt the one straight path leading to the land beyond suffering. There is not a more esoteric way that can be taken to avoid the difficulty of putting maximum effort into the practice. Alternative paths are all littered with stumbling block that constantly thwart the wayfarer's hopes of success. They inevitably cause pain and frustration, leading to despair and a lack of confidence that the chosen way will ever lead to a state of total freedom. Before emerging as a revered teacher of such renown, Atsariyaman practiced with the attitude that cemeteries were irrelevant to him. That is, he was prepared to discard his body wherever he happened to be when he breathed his last breath. He felt no qualms about dying for the sake of Tamma. Later, when instructing his students, he taught them in a forceful, dynamic fashion that stressed the sharp, incisive tactics he had honed to perfection in his own practice. His teaching was mentally stimulating, helping his students constantly develop new skills to see through the cunning tricks of the kilesas and thus uproot and destroy them once and for all. Only then would they be safely out of danger, living contentedly without dukkha. They would no longer meander through the round of samsara, where one birth changes into another continuously. But the dukkha that is carried around in the heart remains unchanged, regardless of how many times one is reborn. Since each new life is merely a new instrument for one's own destruction, no one should be satisfied with birth in any realm of existence. It is equivalent to a prisoner changing cells within the same prison. As long as he remains imprisoned, there is no fundamental improvement. The wise well understand the dangers of the cycle of repeated birth and death. It's as though with each new birth the heart has moved into yet another house that is on fire. No matter where it's reborn, it can never escape the threat of danger. This is but a small taste of how Atsariyaman routinely taught his Tutanga disciples. Perhaps some of my readers will discover an affinity for his style of teaching. On Uposita observance days, when as many as forty to fifty additional monks attended from various locations, Atsariyaman gave discourses on Tamma that generally differed from those he gave exclusively to the monks who regularly lived with him. Acharyaman gave discourses on Tamma that generally differed from those he gave exclusively to the monks who regularly lived with him. Although his Uposita discourses were often forceful and profound, they could not match the ones given regularly to the monks living in his monastery. Those talks were truly dynamic and penetrating. Each time he spoke, the impact of his tamma was so powerful it seemed to dispel the kilesas from the hearts of his listeners, as if the whole world had momentarily vanished from their awareness. What remained was an awareness of the heart united in perfect harmony with tamma, an experience so amazing and gratifying it defies description. For days thereafter, the dynamic power of his tamma seemed to subdue their kilesas, as though he had issued them all a defiant challenge. Inevitably, their kilesas gradually re-emerged after several days, until they were finally back in full force. By then, another meeting had been scheduled, where Atsariyaman subdued them once more, giving the monks a few more days of relief. All Tutanga monks earnestly striving to reach the tamma that transcends Dukkha feel an exceptionally strong bond with their teacher. Eradicating the kilesas requires that individual effort be inextricably combined with the help and advice of a good teacher. When confronted with an intractable problem, a monk practicing on his own will hurry back to consult his teacher, who clarifies the nature of the problem, allowing the student to understand its underlying causes, and so overcome his doubts. Sometimes, while a monk is struggling with a problem which is too complex for him to resolve on his own, his teacher unexpectedly explains the solution of that very problem to him immediately eliminating that obstacle so his student can proceed unhindered. Practicing monks are able to determine the precise levels of tamma that their fellows, and even their teacher, have attained by listening to their discussions about meditation practice. 
This knowledge helps to foster an atmosphere of mutual trust within the circle of practice. When a monk explains the nature of his experiences and the stages he has passed through, from that description it is possible to immediately determine the level of tamma he has realized. When a student tells the teacher about his experiences in meditation, or when he asks advice about a specific problem, he can assess his teacher's level of attainment at that time by gauging his responses. If the teacher has passed beyond that point himself, he is already familiar with those experiences, and he is able to use them as a starting point to advise his student on how to proceed. Or, in the case of a specific problem, he is able to pinpoint the nature of the problem in such a precise way that the student accepts his advice without reservation. Perhaps a student deludes himself into thinking he has reached the highest level of tamma, having completely transcended the different stages. But the teacher, through his own experience, knows this to be untrue. The teacher must then explain to his student why he is wrong, pointing out exactly where his thinking went astray. Once he is willing to accept the validity of his teacher's reasoning, he can safely avoid such dangers. Once Tutanga monks have discussed the various aspects of meditation practice among themselves and reached the point where they know and accept the truth of their respective levels of attainment, there is then no need for further confirmation. The principles of truth that have been discussed constitute their own proof. Practicing monks use this knowledge to determine one another's level of tamma. From the teacher on down to the junior monks, they all rely on evidence gathered in this way. As for intuitive knowledge of these matters, it requires an inner faculty to which I can lay no claim. I shall leave this matter to those with the appropriate expertise. It is a special case requiring individual skill. The regular conversations on meditation that Atsaryaman held with his disciples enabled them to develop close personal relationships with him. Due to the profound respect this tutelage inspired, they willingly entrusted their lives to his care. This deep faith induced them to unreservedly accept as true whatever he told them, for he always spoke about principles of truth, never presenting mere opinions or guesswork based on information from other sources. I myself have always been someone with strong views, being reluctant to submit to anyone's judgment, so I like to argue with him. In this respect, I admit to being one of Acharyaman's more annoying and contentious disciples. Sometimes I was so caught up in disputing an issue with him that I forgot I was a student seeking his guidance, not a teacher instructing him. I still pride myself on my audacity to speak up, having no sense of misgiving. Although he then slapped me down and chopped me to pieces, the important thing was I was able to learn for myself whether the truth lay in my opinions or in the wisdom of my teacher. When I argued with him, it sounded like a shouting match. The more I pressed my case, the more I realized that he had all the truth on his side. I had only my inane fallacies piled up all around me. I always fought a losing battle. When the dust settled, I thought long and hard about what he said, respectfully accepting its truth with all my heart. At the same time, I made a mental note of my misconceptions. On occasions when I refused to yield to his reasoning, because I still couldn't understand what he was getting at, I would wait for another opportunity to debate with him. But I always came away bruised and battered by the power of his reasoning, my opinions tied in knots. Still, I could not resist smiling to myself, delighted by the mighty power of his dhamma. Although Atsariyaman realized full well that I was wildly opinionated, he did not scold me or try to force me to change my attitude. Instead, he could not help but smile when looking at me. He may have been thinking how insufferable I was, or he may have felt sorry for this idiot who liked fighting with such die-hard assurance. I must admit, I was never a very fine person. Even today, I still shamelessly argue with senior Atsariyas, but it's paid off for me in the sense that I've learned many unusual lessons this way, which form a valuable part of my education to this day. These monks never seem to mind my intrusions. In fact, they are often amused by them. It's not so often that a stubborn old monk drops by to stir things up. Ordinarily, no one dares come and argue with one of these Atariyas. So when the monks in his monastery hear what's going on, they become rather puzzled, and more than a little alarmed. After leaving Chiang Mai, where he passed beyond the thick jungle of repeated birth and death, he invariably had a profound reason in mind when he decided to live in any one place for a long time, 
although he kept these reasons to himself. Nako and Rachasima was a case in point. Many monks and lay people there had long developed a true devotion to Tamma, so many of them came to study with him as accomplished meditators. Later, some followed him to Udon Tani and Sogon Nakon, where they continued to study with him until he died. The monks and laity from Nakon Rachasima who kept in contact with him were all well established in meditation practice. Some of those monks have since become famous acharyas who possess a firm basis of tamma in their hearts and are still teaching monks and laity today. Many lay devotees have continued to see steady progress in meditation. Today, they show the way of generosity and spiritual development to other devotees in the area in a truly commendable fashion. He next settled at Udon Tani, where he spent the rains retreat. Chao Kun Tamachedi, the abbot of Wat Bodhisompon Monastery, was an influential monk with a large following of monks and lay supporters. He praised Acharya Man's preeminence, encouraging them all to make his acquaintance, offer donations, and above all, hear his teaching. Since his ordination, Chao Kun Tamachedi had been a devoted disciple, and Acharya Man reciprocated by showing unusual kindness and affection toward him, thus his willingness to stay several years in Udon Tani. Later, after moving to Sokon Nakon and living at Ban Namon, Atsarya Man met an elderly white-robed nun who ran a small convent in the village. She was a major reason why he remained there as long as he did. Her meditation was exceptionally good. She had developed a firm basis in Tamma, so Atsarya Man gave her regular instructions on practice. He said it was rare to find someone so accomplished. Atsarya Man's lengthy residence at Ban Nong Pei was prompted by both the significance of the location and the people living in the village. The place was centrally situated in a very broad valley, completely surrounded by mountains, making it an ideal environment for the Tutanga life. Living in the village was an elderly white-robed laywoman who was approaching eighty. Much like the elderly nun at Ban Namon, she was an accomplished meditator who always received special attention from Atsarya Man. She consulted him often, walking with difficulty from her home to the monastery. Shuffling slowly along, supported by a cane, she had to stop for rest three or four times before she finally arrived at the monastery, exhausted and out of breath. We all truly felt sorry for her. Seeing her struggle so painfully, Atsarya Man would feign disapproval. Why come all the way out here? Don't you realize how exhausted you are? Even children know when they're tired. Here you are, eighty, ninety years old, yet you still don't know when you're worn out. Why do you take all the trouble to come here? Her reply was always characteristically straightforward and fearless. He then inquired about her meditation and explained various aspects of Tamma relating to it. Not only had this woman developed a solid foundation for her meditation, she also possessed Parachitta the psychic ability to know the fundamental moral bias of a person's heart. On top of that, she had a knack for perceiving unusual external phenomena. Addressing Atariya Man, she recounted these extraordinary perceptions with a daring self-assurance that amused him, causing him to laugh about her indomitable spirit. "'Your chitta has long since gone beyond,' she boldly declared. "'I've been aware of your chitta for a long time. It's absolutely without parallel. Since your chitta is already so supreme, why do you continue to meditate?' Atsarya Man laughed. I will resolutely continue meditating until the day I die. A disciple of the Buddha never allows his resolve to weaken. To this, she said, If you still had more to accomplish, I could understand that. But your heart is already filled by an exceedingly luminous radiance. How can you go further than that with meditation? I look at your chitta and see its radiance encompassing the whole world. Your awareness extends everywhere. Nothing can possibly obstruct its scope. But my own chitta sadly lacks such supreme qualities, which is why I must come to ask your help. Please tell me, how should I practice to attain the same preeminence you have? Hearing her discussions with Atsarya Man, one sensed that her meditation was truly exceptional. Upon encountering a problem, she inevitably started dragging herself slowly down the path to the monastery, with her cane keeping her company. Atsarya Man was especially kind to her. He made a point of advising her every time she came. On such occasions, 
the monks would sneak up to listen quietly at one side of the meeting hall where their discussions were held, eager to hear her questions and his answers. Because her questions arose directly from her own experiences in meditation, these exchanges fascinated the monks. Some of her doubts concerned internal matters, focusing on intrinsic noble truths. Other questions related to external affairs and focused on the Deva and Pramo realms. If Atsariyaman accepted her understanding of these matters as being correct, he encouraged her to continue her investigations. But if he did not agree with the course she was pursuing, he advised her to forego that approach, explaining how she should adjust her practice to set it right. Her claims to knowing their minds intrigued the monks, who, though eager to hear her insights, were also rather apprehensive about what they might reveal. But she always described an impressive vision, radiant auras of increasing brilliance, from the young novices on up to Acharyaman, resembling the night sky array of stars and planets. Some were bright, some less so. It was a majestic sight, for not even the junior monks or young novices had somber, gloomy states of mind. Each being admirable, every monk was worthy of respect in his own way, as he strove to improve and refine himself spiritually. Sometimes she recounted her visits to the Brahmaloka, describing how she saw large numbers of monks, but no lay people. This puzzled her, so she asked Acharyaman to explain, which he did. The Brahmaloka is mostly inhabited by people who have already attained the level of anagami, that's why. When a monk who has attained an agami dies, he is reborn in the Brahmaloka. Very few lay people develop themselves to that level, so they rarely gain access to the Brahma realms. Thus you saw only monks there, but no lay people. Another thing, if you're so curious, why didn't you ask one of the monks you saw? Neglecting to ask them while you were there, you now want to come and ask me. She laughed. I forgot to ask them. I didn't think about it until I'd come back down, so I decided to ask you. If I remember, next time I go up, I'll ask those monks. Atsariyaman's explanations usually had a dual purpose, to expound the truth of the matter, and then to clear up her doubts. Later he discouraged her from sending out her awareness to perceive external phenomena, for it used up the valuable time she needed to spend investigating internal phenomena and the basic principles underlying them investigations leading directly to the realization of Magga and Pala. Obediently, she practiced as he advised. He often praised this woman's meditation practice, telling his monks of her high achievements in Tamma, a level of success that many of them could not emulate. Her practice, no doubt, was a factor in his decision to live so long at Ban Nong Peo, the longest residence of his monastic life. Also, it was a convenient central location, serving all the practicing monks living and wandering in the surrounding area. Well within walking distance of his monastery were many secluded places suitable for practice. Monks had a choice of staying in wooded lowlands, high mountains, or caves, all being environments conducive to the ascetic way of life. Atsariyaman lived at Ban Nong Peo Monastery for five years. Because of his advanced age, he was seventy-five years old with failing health when he began staying there. He remained within the confines of the monastery all year, unable to wander extensively as he had in the past. He was content to provide sanctuary to all his disciples earnestly seeking Tamma. While he was living there, the day was seldom contacted him, tending to visit only on certain special occasions. So he concentrated his efforts on assisting the monks and laity more than he had at other places. The Therapeutic Qualities of Tamma Ban Nong Peo Monastery was situated in a dense forest, rife with malaria. As the rainy season approached, Atsariyaman advised monks, who came simply to visit him, to hurry and leave before wet weather arrived. In the dry season, they could stay without risk. Monks who fell victim to malaria just had to put up with the debilitating symptoms. They had no access to anti-malarial medicines, such medicines being scarce everywhere back then. So, they had to rely on the therapeutic qualities of Tamma instead. This meant investigating painful feelings as they arose with an intense, incisive degree of mindfulness and wisdom. Otherwise, they had no effective means of alleviating the pain. If successful, they reduced the fever, thus affecting a cure much quicker than could normally be expected. 
A courageous monk who succeeds through the power of mindfulness and wisdom to overcome the painful feelings caused by illness creates thereby a solid base of support that will serve him well in times of good health as well as in times of sickness. Ultimately, at the time when death is imminent, he will not feel weak and disheartened and thus not be overwhelmed. Having succeeded in establishing total mastery of the truth about Dukkha, he boldly faces the natural process we call death. Mindfulness and wisdom have taught him to recognize Dukkha's intrinsic nature, so he never again worries about pain. He always maintains the firm basis of truth he achieved through his investigations. Later, when a critical situation does arise, the mindfulness and wisdom that he has trained to proficiency will come to his rescue. He can utilize their investigative skills to override the pain, allowing him to immediately reach safety. Thus trained, mindfulness and wisdom will not abandon their duty leaving him simply to wallow in misery as he did before he came to realize the true nature of Dukkha. On the contrary, they will immediately engage the enemy. His external manifestations of illness will resemble those of any other sick person. That is, he will appear just as weak and exhausted as anyone else. But internally, mindfulness and wisdom will manifest within his heart like soldiers preparing to do battle. Then no amount of pain will affect his state of mind. His only consideration will be the inner search for the true causal basis of the physical body, the painful feelings, the chitna, and the mental phenomena arising in conjunction with it. For this is precisely where the full intensity of dukkha will converge at that moment. Since his ability to confront the pain and endure its effects is no longer a concern, his confidence is unshakable. His primary concern is whether mindfulness and wisdom will successfully realize the entire truth of these phenomena in time. Once a monk has investigated a truth of tamma, like the truth of dukkha, until its true nature is fully understood, the next time he wishes to repeat that accomplishment, he does not allow the difficulties of the investigation to block his way and needlessly weaken his resolve. He simply considers what he previously did to enable him to see the truth so clearly, then reproduces that same effect in the present moment. In that way, a clear realization of the truth always lies within the powers of his mindfulness, his wisdom, his conviction, and his persistent effort. The truth is, pain, body, and chitta all exist separately, each one being true within its own sphere. They in no way conflict or interfere with one another. By the power of this realization, Samudaya, the cause of Dukkha, is conquered, and all apprehension about the pain, the condition of the illness, or the prospect of dying is vanquished with it. Such fears are really emotional concerns that demoralize the spirit and lead to a debilitating sense of frustration. Once this decisive breakthrough is achieved, the illness is likely to subside as a result. But even if the symptoms don't entirely abate, they will not intensify to the point where the chitta is overwhelmed by an onslaught of painful feelings, thus producing a twofold illness, one of an ailing body, the other of an ailing mind. In times of severe illness, Dutanga monks are sure to examine the resultant pain. It's considered an essential means of sharpening up mindfulness and wisdom, thus honing their skills until they are quick enough to keep pace with all mental activity, thoughts that are inevitably bound up with physical and mental pain. Any monk showing signs of anxiety or uneasiness when ill is considered a failure within the circle of practicing monks. Mentally, his samadhi and wisdom are insufficient to sustain him in a time of crisis. Lacking mindfulness, his practice is unbecoming and unreliable. This doesn't fit with a monk's obligation to stockpile mindfulness and wisdom as the weapons of choice for protecting himself in his battles with pain of all kinds. Those who have developed the qualities needed to remain mindfully self-controlled, never showing signs of agitation, are considered truly praiseworthy examples of the warrior spirit typical of practicing monks. In critical situations, they stand their ground and fight. The benefits of this to their meditation are self-evident. Those good results are also noticed by their fellow monks, all of whom greatly admire a fighting mentality. The others have faith that, no matter how overwhelming the pain is, a Tutanga monk will never be defeated, even in death. That is, his mindfulness and wisdom will never accept defeat, for they are the investigative tools he uses to search for a safe, trouble-free way to go beyond when it finally becomes impossible to keep body and soul together. Anyone practicing Tamma who arrives at the truth proclaimed by the Lord Buddha is absolutely certain of its universal validity. 
Confronted with the enemy, he will never accept defeat and withdraw his forces. He is obligated to fight to the death. If it so happens that his body cannot withstand the pressure, he will let it die, but he will never relinquish his chitta or the mindfulness and wisdom which maintain and protect it. He is committed to fighting on to victory. Failure is never an option. He displays the attributes of a warrior who expects to be victorious and thus reach a sanctuary that is truly safe and secure. Practicing with unwavering faith in the principles of truth, he is certain to personify the maxim Tammo Hawe Rakati Dhamma Taring. Dhamma protects those who practice it faithfully. If, however, he practices in a hesitant, half-hearted fashion, the outcome will only contradict the truth, never validate it. It cannot be otherwise, because Tamma, the Svaakata Tamma, requires that results be directly correlated with their causes. Despite all the rewards the world seems to offer, a Tutanga monk prefers to concentrate on the immediate inner rewards offered by the sasana. For example, the peaceful calm of samadhi and the intuitive wisdom needed to extract the kilesas piercing his heart both reward him with a steadily increasing sense of contentment that is clearly evident moment by moment. These immediate, tangible results are the ones a Tutanga monk strives to realize. In doing so, he cuts through burdensome problems and unresolved doubts. If he truly has the capability to transcend the world in this lifetime, be it today, tomorrow, next month, or next year, this feat will be accomplished by means of his unflagging diligence at each and every moment. Acharyaman employed inspirational teaching methods to reinforce this fighting spirit, regardless of whether his students were sick or not. He insisted his monks always be warriors fighting to rescue themselves from danger. But it was in times of illness that he placed special emphasis on being uncompromising. He worried they might become dispirited in the face of this challenge. A sick monk showing signs of weakness or anxiety, lacking the mindful self-control expected of him, was bound to be severely rebuked. Acharyaman might actually forbid the monks in his monastery to care for a sick monk, believing that weakness, anxiety, and a whining mentality were not the right way to deal with illness. Sick people react in that way all the time and never see it as a problem. But a monk, whose status demands that he put up with difficult situations and investigate them carefully, should never react like that. It creates a bad example. For if a monk brings this kind of defeatist attitude into the circle of practice, it may spread like a contagious disease, easily infecting others. Think of the mess that might cause. Monks moaning and groaning, tossing and turning like dying animals. You are practicing monks, so don't adopt animal-like behavior. If you begin thinking and acting like animals, the religion will soon develop animal characteristics, spreading confusion everywhere. Definitely not the way of the Buddha. We have all been sick at one time or another, so we are well aware of what someone else feels like when sick. It isn't necessary for you to make a public display of your discomfort. If mental anguish and vociferous complaints were effective cures, then conventional medicines would not be needed. Whoever fell ill could just whine about his plight in a loud voice to make the illness go away. Easy as that. There would be no need to spend a lot of time and trouble treating the patient. Can whining really cure your present illness? If it can't, why disgust everyone else with your useless whining? This is a sample of the lecture Acharya Man might give a monk whose inability to face hardship was an annoyance to the whole monastic community. On the other hand, when he visited a sick monk who maintained a strong, mindful calmness, showing no signs of agitation about his condition, Atsariya Man invariably demonstrated his approval. He commended the monk for his fortitude and gave him some very inspiring words of encouragement. Even after his recovery, Atsariya Man continued to praise that monk's mental toughness, holding him up as an excellent example for the others. That's how a true warrior in the battle with pain gets the job done. Don't complain about the enemy's overwhelming numbers. Just dig in and fight them all to the limit of your strength and ability without flinching. Never withdraw your forces. Never accept defeat. Never let the enemy stomp on you while you're down. We within the circle of practice must be warriors. It is no use complaining how extremely painful an illness is. Just focus on the pain as it arises and try to understand its true nature. Regardless of how much or how little pain we experience, all pain is a manifestation of the truth of Dukkha.
Any monk who was weak and submissive when faced with a painful affliction heard a different tune from Altaria Mun. If you want the truth, but refuse to investigate it because you are afraid of pain, how will you ever discover where the truth lies? The Lord Buddha succeeded in realizing the truth by thoroughly investigating everything, not by whining about everything like this useless monk now disgracing himself. Where did the Buddha ever state that reaching a true understanding requires moaning and groaning? I didn't study many books, so perhaps I missed it. Where in the suttas does it refer to moaning and groaning? If any of you who are well versed in the scriptures come across a passage where it states the Buddha extolled the merits of moaning and groaning, please point it out to me. Then I won't have to teach monks to trouble themselves about investigating pain and putting up with difficulties. You can all just moan and groan until the truth arises to fill the whole universe. We can then witness the appearance of wise, sagacious individuals who have succeeded in reaching Magga and Palla by the power of their loud moans and groans. They will be in a position to question the legitimacy and the current relevance of the Tamma that Lord Buddha proclaimed over 2,500 years ago. The Tamma of these latter-day sages will be a new, modern Tamma whose attainment requires no troublesome investigations. All that's required to attain Magga and Pala is a chorus of moaning and groaning, a method suited to an age when people prefer to seek righteous results from unrighteous causes, a pernicious attitude consuming the whole world today. Before long, there won't be enough room on the planet to hold all these modern-day sages. I myself have an old-fashioned mentality. I trust what the Lord put to taught, and dare not take any shortcuts. I am afraid that, as soon as I put a foot forward, I would fall flat on my face and die there in disgrace. That would be immensely heartbreaking for me. Any monk who showed weakness when in pain could expect such uncompromising treatment. The same kind of punishing rebuke was meted out to a monk who succumbed to weakness or discouragement while undertaking any harsh training practice, since there were obstacles preventing him from making use of the various investigative techniques at his disposal. Atsariyaman constantly urged his monks to display the fighting spirit necessary to overcome these impediments, so they very often heard this dynamic teaching. For them, seekers of the true Tamma, his words were a kind of therapy which roused their courage, invigorated their practice, and kept their spirits high. Thus buoyed, they were ready to advance triumphantly, step by step, up the path to that sphere of blissful contentment that Tamma promises to reveal. Inspiring commitment, his stimulating instruction dispelled tendencies toward weakness and laziness that prepare the way for the misery of samsara. While Atsariyaman lived there, two monks died in the monastery at Banongpeu, and another died close by at Bananai. The first to die was a middle-aged monk who ordained specifically to practice meditation. Living in Chiang Mai as Atsariyaman's disciple, he eventually followed his teacher to Udon Thani and then Sakon Nakon, sometimes staying with him, sometimes practicing alone, until he finally passed away at Banongpeu. He was very skilled in samadhi meditation, and... Prompted by Atsariyaman's constant tutoring, his wisdom practice had already developed a sense of urgency. He was a very devout, resolute character who gave wonderfully lyrical talks on Tamma, in spite of being wholly illiterate. His talks, quick-witted and clever, were invariably illustrated with skillful similes, allowing his listeners to easily grasp his meaning. Unfortunately, he had tuberculosis. Long a chronic illness... It eventually reached a critical stage while he was living in the monastery. There, early one morning, at about seven o'clock, he passed away in a calm, peaceful manner, befitting one who had been a genuine practicing monk for so long. Witnessing his final moments, and then the moment when his breathing stopped, I developed a deep respect for this monk and his proficiency in meditation. At death, it is we who control our destiny so we must take sole responsibility for our future. For no one else, no matter how close or dear, can intervene to affect the outcome. Before that moment arrives, we must develop a means of focusing all our strength and skill on facing this critical juncture wisely, so as to extricate ourselves from danger and safely move on. 
Our final moments will present us with a significant challenge. All of us, whether we are well prepared or not, will eventually be confronted with this situation. Those of us who have devised clever means for helping ourselves will fare well, but those of us who remain ignorant and confused will founder helplessly, unable to salvage our fate. The Lord Buddha declared, Ko nuha sakim anando. It can be translated essentially as, when the world is engulfed in lust, anger, and delusion, a blazing bonfire that rages day and night, how can you keep smiling and laughing all the time? Why don't you immediately search for a refuge you can depend on? Stop this negligence now. Don't carry on with it until the day you die, or else you will experience the painful consequences into the future indefinitely. The Buddha was cautioning people not to be unreasonably heedless in their lives. But when people hear the Buddha's words today, they feel so embarrassed, so ashamed of their wanton infatuation with sensual pleasures, that they want to hide their faces. Despite their shame, they are still lured by their desires, loving this, hating that, for this kind of intransigence has always been an integral part of worldly attitudes, and they don't know how to stop themselves. So... Sadly, their only response to the Buddha's warnings is shame. The death of the monk at Banong Peo should prove a valuable lesson to all of you who are headed toward the same fate. Please consider the manner of his death carefully. Just as he was about to pass away, Atsariyaman and the other monks, who were on their way for alms, stopped by to witness that sad event. Afterwards, Atsariyaman stood in silent contemplation for a moment. Then he spoke to everyone in a solemn tone of voice. There is no need to worry about him. He has already been reborn in Apasara, the sixth Brahma realm. He's all right for now. But it's a shame in one way, for had he lived longer and developed his insight with a little more intensity, he could well have been reborn in one of the five Sutawasa Brahma realms, there he would have progressed directly to the ultimate goal, destined never again to enter the cycle of rebirth. And what about the rest of you? What kind of rebirth are you preparing for yourselves? Will it be one in the animal world, the ghost world, or in the realms of hell? Or will it be as a human, a deva, or a brahma? Or will it be nibbana? Which will it be? If you want to know for sure, Look closely at the compass bearing of your heart to see the direction in which you are headed. Examine yourselves now to find out whether your present course is a good one or a bad one. Once you are dead, it will be too late to make adjustments. Everyone knows that death is final. Nothing more can be done after that. The second death was that of a monk from Ubon Rajatani who came down with malaria and died a month later. Shortly before it happened, his death was foreseen in the meditation of another monk who was living there at the time. The monk went to speak with Acharyaman the next evening. After discussing various aspects of meditation practice for a while, their conversation turned to the sick monk, and the monk informed Acharyaman about the vision that appeared in his meditation. Something odd occurred in my meditation last night. I was investigating in my normal way when I reached a state of calm and suddenly saw an image of you standing before a pile of firewood saying, Cremate that monk right here. This is the best place to do it. I don't fully understand the meaning of it. Will that sick monk die of malaria? His condition certainly doesn't appear to be that serious. Acharyaman responded immediately. I have been investigating this matter for a long time now. He is bound to die. It cannot be avoided. Still, he won't have died in vain. I have seen his mental state. It's exceptional. So he's sure to fare very well. But I strictly forbid you to mention anything about this to him. If he finds out that he's certain to die, he will feel very disappointed. Then his health will deteriorate even further, and his mental state could waver to the extent that he misses the excellent rebirth he can expect now. Disappointment is a very harmful emotion in this respect. Several days later... That monk's condition suddenly took a turn for the worse. He died calmly at about 3 a.m. This prompted me to consider how Atsariyaman must have investigated the circumstances that lay behind every incident that appeared to him during meditation. 
pursuing them all until he clearly understood their significance. Then he simply let go, allowing them to follow their natural course. One morning, a disciple of Atsariyaman, who was running a very high fever due to malarial infection, decided to forgo alms round and fast for the day. He used his investigative skills to battle the intense pain from early morning until three in the afternoon, when the fever began to abate. Feeling completely exhausted in the middle of the day, he drew his attention to and concentrated solely on those points where the pain was most intense, but without making an effort to probe and analyze the pain with wisdom. At midday, Atsariyaman momentarily sent out the flow of his chitta to check how the monk was coping with the pain. Later in the afternoon, while visiting Atsariyaman, he was surprised to hear Atsariyaman immediately question his mode of practice. Why were you investigating like that? How can you expect to understand the truth about the body, the pain, and the chitta if you merely concentrate your mind on a single point? Instead, use your intuitive wisdom to analyze all three of them. In that way, you discover the true nature of each. Yours is the kind of concentration one expects from a yogi. It has all the single-minded intensity of a dogfight. It is not the right practice for a monk wanting to discover the truth about pain. Don't do it again. It's the wrong way to go about realizing the many truths to be found within the body, the pain, and the chitta. During the middle of the day, I examined your practice to see how you were coping with the pain caused by your fever. I noticed you were just focusing your attention exclusively on the pain. You are not using mindfulness and wisdom to ease the problem by looking at all three aspects of it, body, pain, and chitta. This is the only effective way to quell pain and neutralize the symptoms so that the fever subsides as well. Tigers make the best teachers. When Atsariyaman believed that a specific kind of advice would help one of his students, he spoke to him directly about it. He could be very blunt in his advice to certain monks. You'd be better off going to meditate in that cave than you are living here in the monastery. Characters like yours prefer tough, coercive measures. Better still, find a tiger to be your teacher. Fear of it will subdue your chitta, forcing it to enter calm. Realizing tamma in this way, you can gain some contentment. Living here in the monastery is not right for you. Stubborn people need hard things to soften them up and make them more pliable. Since tigers are such good tormentors, anyone fearing them should take one as a teacher. It's much better than having a teacher you don't fear. If you are afraid of ghosts, you should take ghosts as teachers to enforce mental discipline. Take as a teacher whatever your heart most fears. This is how a clever person forces himself to submit to the training. Before ordaining, the monk he was addressing had been a real tough guy with a bold, no-nonsense sort of character. If he said he was going to do something, he did it. He was a rather stubborn person, but stubborn in the way of a monk. As soon as he heard Acharyaman's resolute advice, he immediately decided to follow it, reasoning something like this to himself. Surely a monk of Acharyaman's caliber would never send me to be killed by a tiger. I must go and live in the cave he mentioned. If that means death, I'll just have to accept it. If I want to see for myself the truth of what he said, then I must have no qualms about dying. I've heard that he always has very sound reasons for what he says, and he's careful to thoroughly examine every situation before speaking. Anyone who can understand his teaching and put it into practice is bound to get good results. I must take what he just said very seriously. It comes from an insight into my character and a genuine concern for my well-being. It is as though he plucked out my heart and examined it, and has found out all about me. How can I doubt his advice? If I fail to act on it now, how can I call myself a monk? I might as well be a layperson. I'm going to live in that cave, whatever happens. If I die there, so be it. If I don't, then all I ask is a chance to realize some amazing tumma while I'm there. It's obvious that he was talking about me when he referred to being stubborn and recalcitrant. It's a true measure of his genius. He knows me better than I know myself. I know I'm that type of person, 100%. For my own good, I can't afford to disregard his advice about tigers. I must do what he said and subject myself to this agonizing practice. This monk truly was a stubborn character, reluctant to accept advice from anyone, just as Atsariyaman indicated. After considering Atsariyaman's remarks and reaching a definite decision, he went to take his leave. As he approached, Atsariyaman immediately asked him where he was going. Where are you off to? You look all dressed up and ready to march earnestly into battle. 
I'm going off to die in that cave you told me about. What? What did I say to you? Go die in that cave or go meditate there? Well, you told me to meditate there, not die there. But I know from the other monks that there's a tiger living in the cave above the one I'll be staying in. They say that the tiger's cave is just close by. It comes and goes there all the time. When it goes out to hunt for food, it'll pass right in front of my cave. So I have my doubts about remaining alive there. I was simply voicing my apprehension. Many other monks have already stayed in that cave on many different occasions, and none of them were devoured by tigers. So, why should a tiger suddenly decide to come gobble you up? What's the difference between your flesh and the flesh of those other monks that makes it so much more likely to whet a tiger's appetite? Where did you get this savory flesh tigers like so much that they are waiting to pounce on and devour only you and no one else? Atari Amun then explained about the deceptive nature of the mind that deludes people in ways that are far too numerous to easily keep up with. If you don't examine and test it out with a critical, discerning attitude, you will be tormented by the mind's myriad tricks and never learn to tame its unruly nature. You have yet to leave, but already you trust the whisperings of the Kilesas more than the advice of your teacher. How will you ever manage? Although people the world over have yet to die, they are all terrified of death. But birth, the enticement luring them into death, is feared by no one. Everyone craves birth. I cannot figure out why people are so infatuated with birth. Just one birth in a physical body means immense suffering and anxiety. Suppose human beings could send up shoots like a clump of bamboo. Their eagerness for birth would increase rampantly, each person desiring to branch out into hundreds or thousands of additional people without giving thought to how the combined fear of so many people dying at once might affect them. The whole world would become tumultuous with the fear of death, and there would be no safe place to live. You are a practicing monk, a trained spiritual warrior, yet your fear of death surpasses that of the untrained laity. Why do you let the Kilesas harass you in this way? You have the mindfulness and wisdom needed to defend yourself, so why don't you use them? Go on the offensive. Chase out the devious Gilesas lurking there in your heart. Then you will realize how stupid you've been, blindly serving their interests, unaware of the power they have over you. A warrior's victory depends on his willingness to brave death on the battlefield. If you're not willing to die, then you shouldn't enter the battle zone. Only by braving death will you be able to defeat your enemies. If you are truly determined to transcend Dukkha by realizing its true nature, you must view your fear of death as one form of Dukkha, a product of the Kilesas stored in your heart. You can only resolve this matter by making a stand on a battlefield conducive to victory, like the one I just indicated. Persevere, and you will come to realize fear's harmful effects. It stirs the emotions and demoralizes the spirit, always giving rise to suffering. It is better to take a defiant stand now. Don't simply keep clinging to that fear, hugging it tightly to your chest and burning your heart until you cry out in agony. Fail to act decisively now, and your suffering will continue indefinitely. Will you believe in the supreme sanctity of your teacher and the Tamma, or are you going to trust that fear the Kilesas have released into your heart, which is depriving you of the very mindfulness and wisdom you need to defeat it? Looking around, you seem to see only tigers all coming to tear out your flesh and make a meal of you. Why is that? Please reflect deeply on the matter. I assure you that I have used the same combative training method to good effect in my own practice. Such was his delight in the tamma he heard that the monk said he felt his chitta glowing bright with courage as he listened to Atarya Man's strong rebuke. When Atarya Man finished speaking, the monk took his leave and immediately prepared to go to the cave. He arrived at the cave, still buoyed by a sense of courage and rapturous delight. He put down the belongings he carried with him and began to survey the surrounding area. Then, by some mischance, the thought arose in his mind that the cave was home to a tiger. With this thought in mind, and his eyes scanning the ground in front of the cave, he spied a tiger's paw print in the dirt. Never considering that it was probably made long before, the sight of it sent shock waves of fear through him, nearly scaring him out of his wits. In that instant, he completely forgot his teacher and the sense of courage that glowed so brightly while he sat listening to him in the monastery. Fear overwhelmed his heart, and he was helpless to prevent it. He walked over and erased all traces of the paw print with his foot. 
but the fear persisted. Still, he did feel a little better not having to look at it any more. From the moment he glanced down to discover the tiger's paw print, he was terrified, a paralyzing fear lasting all night. Even during the day, his fear remained, but it became especially intense once night fell, as he imagined the whole area around his cave to be teeming with huge tigers. To make matters even worse, he had a sudden recurrence of malaria, with fever and chills. He felt as though he had fallen into a living hell, devoid of any physical or mental comfort whatsoever. To his great credit, he was mentally tough enough to resist the temptation to give up his painful attempts at finding a means to overcome his fear. The worsening fever, combined with his agonizing fear of tigers, did unsettle his composure, however, nearly driving him crazy. Once in a long while, he thought of Atsari Amun's kindness and the advice he had given, which temporarily helped to douse the fires of misery burning in his heart. As symptoms of the malaria became more and more intense, he reflected back on his earlier intention to sacrifice his life in that cave. Previously, I made a decision to sacrifice my life here. When Atsari Amun asked me where I was going, I immediately announced that I was going off to die in this cave. And as I hiked up here, I felt as though I was walking on air, such as my determination to brave death. So, why is it that upon reaching the cave and actually entering the jaws of death, I have now changed my mind and decided I don't want to die? Now I'm so afraid of dying I can hardly hold my own. I'm exactly the same person I was then. I didn't exchange my heart for the heart of some coward. So why do I seem to be a new person with a cowardly attitude? In the monastery, I was prepared to die. Now that I'm actually here, I've changed my mind. Which is it going to be? Make up your mind right now. Don't wait any longer. How about this? I'll go sit in meditation at the overhanging edge of a steep precipice. If my mindfulness falters, then let me fall to my death at the bottom of the ravine where the vultures and the flies can take care of my corpse. There would be no need to trouble the villagers about it. No one should have to dirty their hands handling the corpse of a useless monk. My futility might prove contagious. Then again, I could sit in meditation right in the middle of the path leading to the tiger's cave. I'll make it easy for that tiger when it goes out hunting for food. It can just sink its teeth into my useless neck and have me for a snack tonight. Which will it be? Make up your mind quickly. Do it now! His resolve bolstered, he walked to the front of the cave and stood for a moment, awaiting inspiration. Weighing his two options, he finally decided to go with the first one, to meditate seated precariously on the brink of the steep precipice near his cave. Any slip in mindfulness and vultures and flies would be there to take care of his remains. That decided, he walked over and sat down, facing a deep gorge, with his back to the path the tiger took to and from its cave. He began repeating Butto, intensely aware that, if careless, he could die in an instant. Seated there, meditating on Butto, he kept a vigilant watch on his mind to see which fear predominated, that of falling down the precipice or that of being attacked by a tiger. As soon as it became apparent that fear of the precipice was the greatest, he gathered his mindfulness and focused intensively on one of his two meditation themes, either the repetition of Butto or the recollection of death, depending on which one arose in his mind at any one moment. Meditating thus, poised on the brink of death, his chitta soon gathered itself into one point of focus, and then suddenly dropped down to the very base of Appanasamati, rapidly converging into a state of total calm. In an instant, he was oblivious to all the fiery turmoil that had engulfed his mind for so long. All that remained was the essential knowing quality of the chitta, existing alone, by itself, in all its amazing splendor. Fear of death had utterly vanished. The hour was 10 p.m. when the monk's chitta converged dramatically into Appana Samadhi, an experience so profound that he did not withdraw from that state until 10 o'clock the next morning. Opening his eyes, he saw the sun halfway up the sky. Since it was already too late for morning alms round, he didn't bother to go to the village. He simply went without food that day. Withdrawing from Samadhi, he was aware of a complete absence of fear. In its place was an amazing sense of courage he had never before experienced. His fever was gone as well, completely cured that night, and he never again suffered a recurrence of malaria. 
he was convinced that the therapeutic powers of Tamma had cured both his malaria and his fear of tigers. From that day on, his body was never again plagued by malaria, his mind never again ravaged by fear. No longer terrified of tigers, he could go anywhere, live anywhere, unperturbed. Occasionally, he wished a tiger would show up to test his mental fortitude. He imagined himself calmly walking right up to it without the least apprehension. Reflecting on the whole experience, he felt immensely grateful to Atsariya Mun for so kindly teaching him about the corrupting power of fear. Now that he understood how his mind worked, he persistently used this coercive style of practice. Preparing to meditate, he preferred looking for the most frightening place he could find. For the remainder of his stay there, he continued this training, making a special effort to seek out frightening locations for conducting his meditation. Noticing the tigers regularly used a certain path, he made a point of sitting right in the middle of it. While meditating in the cave, he resolved not to lower his mosquito net, because sitting inside a lowered mosquito net gave more protection from the threat of tigers. Minus that element of fear, his chitta was reluctant to drop into the desired state of calm. Where he sat depended each time on where he felt his chitta was most likely to rapidly converge to the very base of samadhi. Late one night, as he sat out in the open, his chitta refused to drop into calm despite his best efforts. He sat there frustrated for a long time until he finally thought about the huge tiger that came and went frequently in the area. I wonder where that tiger is today. It would be nice if it came by here to help my chitta drop into calm. If it passed by, I wouldn't have to struggle with my meditation like this. The chitta would just instinctively drop into calm. Not long after thinking of his friend, perhaps after half an hour, he heard the footsteps of that huge animal walking toward its cave, as though right on cue. The time was approaching 2 a.m. Hearing the tiger draw nearer, he roused himself with a timely warning. Here it comes, right now. Are you really so casual? Aren't you afraid it will sink its teeth into your neck and make a meal of you? If you don't want to be tiger food, then you better hurry up and look for a safe place to hide. As he thought this, he conjured in his mind an image of the tiger pouncing on him, its gaping jaws closing in around his neck. The moment he fixed his attention on this mental image, his chitta converged, dropping rapidly until it reached the very base of Appanasamati. Instantly, all external phenomena completely vanished from his awareness. Himself, the tiger, everything. What remained was serenity and tranquility, the union of chitta and tamma, as they melded into one essence of indescribable wonder. His chitta rested in that sublime state for a total of eight hours, from two o'clock that night until ten o'clock the next morning. Upon withdrawing, he saw the sun was already high, so he again cancelled his alms round and went without food. He then walked over to inspect the place where he heard the tiger approaching to see if there were any signs that a tiger really had passed by. Or had his ears merely been playing tricks on him? Looking at the ground, he saw the tracks of a huge tiger, about twelve feet behind the spot where he had been sitting. The tiger's tracks continued in a straight line all the way up to its cave never veering off to the direction where its friend was sitting in meditation. The whole incident was strange and quite amazing. The experience in Appanasamati of the chitta fully converging into its true base is an experience that varies according to the natural inclination of each individual. Some people are inclined by temperament to experience a very rapid convergence, feeling as though they are falling down a well. The internal sense faculties cease to function at that time, meaning they are totally unaware of all external sense impressions. This monk's chitta was one such case. When it fully converged in samadhi, all awareness of external phenomena ceased as a consequence. As the monk explained it, the moment his chitta fully converged, everything that was involved with it in any way vanished instantly. Only when he withdrew from that state did his normal awareness of things return. But he found it difficult to attain this state unless he was under duress by some external threat. A real threat of danger forced his chitta to converge very rapidly. In a split second, it reached its true base. He said this was the reason he liked to seek out frightening places. I find this the most convenient way to develop my meditation, practicing in places that arouse fear. I actually prefer wild mountains that have caves frequented by tigers, 
and tend to shy away from those that don't. As you can see, tiger-infested areas are perfectly suited to a rough character like me. That's what makes me so fond of them. I had other strange experiences while living in that cave. Besides realizing my goal to attain deep meditative calm, I also developed several unusual kinds of psychic awareness. For example, terrestrial devas came some nights to visit and converse with me. Even stranger still, when someone in the local village died, I always knew about it immediately. Although I'm not sure where this knowledge came from, it simply arose spontaneously in my heart, and it was invariably correct. Never did I find reason to doubt it. My cave was located about five miles from the village, yet those people still insisted on coming to request my help in performing the funeral rites, which is very troublesome for me. As soon as someone died in the village, I was aware of it, knowing straight away that the next day I'd have to make another long trek to the village cemetery. And sure enough, the villagers came once again to bother me. Nothing I said could dissuade them. They told me that monks were scarce in that area, so they had no other choice but to disturb me. They believed that the deceased would benefit if a monk performed the funeral. I sympathized and felt sorry for them, so I had to go. During periods of fasting, which I found conducive to intensive meditation, I didn't want anything to interfere with my practice. But something usually did come up. While living in that cave, I always relied on my friend the tiger to give my meditation practice a timely boost. Every other night it ventured down in search of food, as all hungry animals do, but it never showed any interest in me, even though it walked right past me on its way out. There was only one way down, so it had to go that way. This monk had the rather unusual habit of leaving his cave late at night to go sit in meditation on stone outcrops high up in the mountains. He appeared wholly unfazed by the danger from wild animals. By temperament, he preferred to wander alone through the wilds. I have included his story here because it teaches some valuable lessons. He practiced with unwavering purpose until he managed to expose the truth of his unruly mind, thus disciplining it and bringing it under his control. Things once viewed as threats, like tigers, became friends instead, assisting his practice. He managed to make use of a wild tiger, a most unpredictable creature, to inspire him in his meditation practice, thus achieving remarkable results. Once Acharya Man had settled in the monastery at Ban Nong Pao, he was contented to encourage the community of Tutanga monks practicing under his tutelage. As many as twenty to thirty of them joined him there during retreat periods. Despite the increasing numbers, however, conflicts that might have caused him concern seldom arose. Each monk was determined to focus diligently on his own practice. A harmonious sense of fraternity existed among the monks who all lived together in unity of purpose. Peacefully walking together to the village for alms each morning, they were an impressive sight. A long bench had been constructed in the village, where the monks sat to chant a blessing after receiving offerings of food. Later, back in the monastery, they ate together in silence, seated in rows according to seniority. Once they finished eating, each monk washed his own bowl, dried it thoroughly, replaced its cloth covering, and put it neatly away. When their morning duties were completed, they separated, each monk walking into the extensive forest surrounding the monastery to find a secluded meditation track where he concentrated on his meditation, walking or sitting as he preferred. Remaining in the forest until the afternoon chores began at 4 p.m., they then returned from their meditation sites to help each other sweep the monastery grounds clean. Once they finished sweeping, they worked together to carry water from the well to fill the various water barrels, water for drinking, water for washing feet, or water for washing their alms bowls. A quick bath at the well was followed by a resumption of meditation. On nights when no meeting had been called, they continued to practice as usual until it was time to retire. Normally, Atsariyaman called a general meeting once every seven days, though any monk desiring personal advice could see him on any day. Monks wanting to ask questions about their practice were advised to approach Atsariyaman at a time during the day when he was free, usually just after the morning meal, in the early afternoon, at five in the afternoon, or at eight o'clock at night. Hearing Acharya Man discuss Tamma and answer questions in the quiet hours of the evening was a very pleasant experience. 
Then, many unusual questions were asked by disciples who came from various locations in the surrounding area to seek his advice. Some of these questions dealt with internal matters that arose in the course of a monk's meditation. Others dealt with external phenomena, such as devas. The monks who arrived to discuss their practice with him had varying skills and abilities in meditation. Some had unusual meditative experiences to relate. We listened eagerly, so mesmerized by his replies that none of us wanted the sessions to end. Each time we learned valuable lessons that led to practical methods for improving our meditation and thus gave us great satisfaction. On timely occasions, al Man recounted edifying stories about his past. He told us about his early years in lay life, how he ordained, first as a novice, then as a monk. Some of these stories were so funny they made us laugh. Some made us pity him for what he had gone through, and some, the ones about his attainments, were just incredibly amazing. Living continuously with a good teacher for a long time had many distinct advantages. Following his example, his disciples gradually altered their basic attitudes and ways of behavior, adjusting their outer conduct and augmenting their inner skills little by little to match his, until eventually their characters naturally harmonized with his as much as possible. The secure environment he offered to his disciples meant that their practice was unlikely to go astray. Constant exposure to his inspirational teaching gradually allowed the essence of Tamma to penetrate deep into their hearts. His intimidating presence promoted the kind of vigilant self-control that reinforces mindfulness and wisdom. Fear prevented his disciples from becoming complacent by forcing them to be extremely circumspect in their behavior and their thoughts. Even then, despite their best intentions, he could still catch them napping and then expose their shortcomings for everyone else to hear. It was extremely embarrassing to have one's personal failings exposed like this, but a monk had to accept the consequences of failing to be properly circumspect. We all experienced an indescribable sense of joy living and practicing with Atsariya Man, but if we held unreasonable opinions, our delight could easily turn to frustration, for those wrong views became a constant hindrance. I cannot speak for others, but I have always had a rather rough disposition, so I relied on Acharyaman to pound me into shape. In that way, I managed to find some breathing room when the gilesas began to suffocate me. Hearing him recount the various stages of his own practice, my spirit was so energized I felt I could float up and walk on the clouds. While listening to him, my whole being felt light as a wisp of cotton. But later, when I tried to duplicate this buoyancy on my own in meditation, I felt as though I was laboring under the weight of a mountain. I met nothing but heavy resistance. I became so frustrated with myself I wanted to bury my head in the ground to hide my shame, a fitting humiliation for such a vulgar character who was loath to accept advice. I have mentioned my own coarse, callous nature here to let the reader know just how low the heart can sink when loaded down with destructive influences and how hard it can be to pull it back up again and discipline it in the proper way. If we do not make a supreme effort now, eventually this tendency will plunge us into the depths of disaster, regardless of who we are or where we live. Effort must be used to discipline the heart. Any person who succeeds in subduing the unruly nature that has burdened his heart from time immemorial and who is thus living in total freedom, that person deserves the highest respect. The Lord Putta and his Arahant disciples are shining examples of this achievement. Likewise, I am absolutely convinced that Acharya Man was one of the Lord Putta's present-day Arahant disciples. He was courageous and masterful in the way he lived his life, and was never in danger of succumbing to the power of the Gilesas. Even in old age, when he could be expected to rest and take it easy, no longer needing to exert himself in meditation practice, he still did as much walking meditation as he always had, so much so that the younger monks could hardly keep up with him. Fulfilling his teaching obligations with great compassion, he never lost hope in his students. His exhortations reflected his resolute character, and he invariably preferred the rhetoric of a warrior. He delivered his talks forcefully, aiming to arouse in his disciples the strength and courage needed to completely transcend Dukkha. He rarely compromised or made allowances for their shortcomings. He did not want to lull to sleep those very monks who already had a deplorable tendency to show weakness in their practice. Atsariyaman had utmost respect for all aspects of the Buddha-sasana, 
from the theory and practice of Tamma to its inner realization, and this in an age when genuine disciples of the Putta are hard to find. He placed special emphasis on the thirteen Tutanga observances, which Buddhists everywhere had long since lost interest in. No one thought to restore them to the prominent position they deserve. The fact that they have now become such a significant part of a Jutanga monk's practice is a direct consequence of the earnest effort that Atsarya Sao and Atsarya Man made to revive their use in Thailand's northeast region. Both Atsarya Sao and Atsarya Man observed all thirteen of these ascetic practices at one time or another in their lives, although only the ones I've mentioned earlier were practiced on a daily basis. Other Jutanga observances, like staying in a cemetery or living out in the open at the foot of a tree, were practiced so often that these two Atsaryas became thoroughly familiar with them. Tutanga monks in the northeast today are descendants following directly in their footsteps. Atsarya Sao and Atsarya Man were keenly aware of the practical value the Tutanga observances had for practicing monks. They clearly understood that each of these thirteen practices was an extremely effective means of closing off the outlets through which gilesas of Tutanga monks tend to flow. Without the restraining influence of ascetic practices to stem the flow from those outlets, Lutanga monks are ascetic in name only, their kilesas being free to roam at will, causing considerable annoyance to everyone. With the help of the Dutangas, monks can rest assured that their conduct will not be offensive to others. Each Dutanga practice promotes a virtuous quality. While its observance reminds a Dutanga monk not to be careless by thinking in ways that contradict the very virtue he is trying to develop. On guard, he immediately becomes conscious of any lapses in judgment, which in turn fosters mindfulness to catch such oversights in the future. Considered in its entirety, the Dutanga asceticism is broad in scope, each separate practice having a very distinct purpose. Provided a monk understands the true purpose of each Dutanga he undertakes and then observes them properly, they are easily capable of totally eliminating his kilesas. They are powerful enough to deal a decisive blow to every type of kilesa. No kilesa is beyond their reach. As long as we dread the hardships involved in observing ascetic practices, then the kilesas have little fear of us. The hardships that the kilesas cause us, when there are no ascetic practices to suppress them, are somehow forgotten, opening the way for us to accuse these practices of being too difficult, or even obsolete. When our own thoughts become our enemies, the kilesas are secretly held in high regard, but in our rush to admire them we fail to realize this. The harmful effects of this supportive admiration are plain, and plainly infinite in scope. The monk who truly practices any one or more of the Tutangas inevitably presents a pleasing, dignified appearance. His basic needs are easily taken care of. What he eats and where he sleeps are never a problem for him. He is always contented with the simple belongings he possesses. Unencumbered by emotional attachments and material possessions, he feels mentally and physically buoyant. Even lay people can benefit from undertaking some of the Tutanga practices, just as the monks do, since both monks and lay people are burdened with the same kinds of kilesas. The Tutanga practices are, after all, designed to counteract the kilesas, so people from all walks of life should try their best to make use of them for this purpose. The Dutangas comprise qualities of Tamma so supremely profound that it is difficult to fully comprehend their true magnitude. I myself do not have as comprehensive a knowledge and understanding of the Dutanga practices as I should, but in my own unsophisticated way I have tried my best to do justice to them. I hope you will forgive my shortcomings in this regard. In truth, the Dutangas are so profoundly subtle it would be virtually impossible to fully elaborate on all their outstanding qualities. They have the capacity to take someone who is truly devoted to their practice from the basic levels of tamma all the way to the highest arya levels. In fact, no tamma attainment is beyond the scope of the Dutangas. As a teacher, Atsarya Man always led his disciples in observing these ascetic practices right until the last days of his life. Only when his strength was completely exhausted did he let go of them, along with his physical body. Clearly, the Dutangas are essential practices for those intending to purify their hearts of all vestiges of the Kilesas. This truth is undeniable. I shall refrain from giving a detailed explanation here of each ascetic observance with its distinctive merits and importance. 
Anyone interested in looking into them can uncover these attributes for themselves. You may discover a degree of subtlety that proves to be more beneficial to you than simply reading someone else's explanation. I have been looking into these practices since my early days as a Dutunga monk, and I continue to gain good results from them to this day. I have always considered them an essential part of my overall practice. Anyone intent on seeing an end to the kilesas, from the most vulgar ones to the most refined, should never overlook the Dutunga observances, thinking them incapable of doing the job. His Final Illness Atsariyaman had already lived for five years at Bannong Peo Monastery when, in March of 1949, precisely on the fourteenth day of the fourth lunar month, his body began exhibiting signs indicating the approaching end of his life. By then, he was seventy-nine years old. On that day, there appeared the first symptoms of an illness that was to worsen until it finally brought to a close his long life a day that sent tremors through Atsariyaman's body elements and shock waves through the community of his close disciples. Initially there was a light fever accompanied by a slight cough, but as the days passed, the symptoms steadily worsened, never showing the slightest improvement. Obviously abnormal, the constant decline in his health worried us all. But Atsariyaman himself clearly knew that this was to be his final illness an illness no type of medical treatment could cure. He informed his disciples of this from the very beginning, and from then on never showed any interest in medicines. On the contrary, he seemed annoyed when someone brought him medicines to take. This he expressed in no uncertain terms. This is the illness of an old man who has reached the end of the line. No matter what kind of medicine I take, it will never be cured. All that's left is the breath in my body, biding its time, awaiting the day it finally ceases. I'm like a dead tree that's still standing. No matter how much you fertilize and water that tree, it is impossible to make it sprout and flower again. This old dead tree now stands anticipating the day it will topple over and go crashing to the ground, felled by this very same illness. I thoroughly investigated my condition long before the symptoms appeared. That is why I have been warning you all. Don't be complacent. Hurry up. Intensify your efforts now while I am still alive. In that way, I can help you to resolve any problems you may have in the meantime. Missing this opportunity now may cause you to waste a lot of time in the future. I will not be here much longer. Soon I shall depart this world, in keeping with the law of impermanence that follows constantly on the heels of all conditioned things without exception. Three years ago, I warned you, that I would not last more than three years. What more can I say? What I've told you I know to be inevitable. The work that the round of samsara performs inside the minds and bodies of human beings and animals alike continues unerringly along its natural course. In just a few months' time, it will complete its final task within this body of mine. How can it possibly alter its appointed task? With each passing day, his symptoms gradually worsened. Showing no interest in medicines of any kind, he was clearly annoyed when people came and urged him to try this remedy or that cure. But so many people arrived offering cures that he had a hard time resisting them all. Each one touted the effectiveness of the medicine he was offering, insisting that if he took it he was sure to get better, for he had already cured many others. They all pleaded with him to try their medicines out of compassion for them. They wanted him to get better so he could continue to be of service to his many followers for a long time to come. He often warned them that medicines were useless for his illness, that only firewood for cremating the corpse was appropriate. But the more he protested, the more they beseeched him. So occasionally he yielded to their appeals and took a small dose of medicine. He was concerned that people would feel disappointed if they believed he had given up on his condition. As news of his illness spread across the region, People began arriving from all directions to visit him at Ban Nong Peo. Traveling from locations far and near in all kinds of weather, a steady flow of monks and laity poured in like the waters from a monsoon rain. Ban Nong Peo was situated in a valley surrounded by thick forest, some twelve to fifteen miles from the main highway between Udon Tani and Sogunnakorn. Though people had to travel by foot to see him, they appeared undaunted by the distance and the difficulties it posed. 
Only the elderly, unable to make the journey on foot, hired ox carts to take them there. By nature, Acharyaman always preferred to live alone quietly. Even the monks living with him were discouraged from bothering him unless absolutely necessary. Consequently, receiving large numbers of well-wishers disagreed with his natural inclination to remain aloof from such tiresome affairs. When sick, he had always been reluctant to allow even his close disciples to take care of him. He had always been reluctant to allow even his close disciples to take care of him, though he did make certain exceptions. When he did allow it, the monks attending to his personal needs had to be very circumspect in his presence. Only monks deemed trustworthy were selected for these duties. As his health deteriorated, a discerning senior monk was appointed to oversee all arrangements for his health care. Since by nature Atsariyaman was very thorough and meticulous, this monk had to decide what action was appropriate in each instance, and then see that the other monks carefully followed this regimen. For this reason, monks attending on him were carefully chosen to ensure their behavior did not conflict with his subtle temperament. The lay people and the monks, arriving from various locations around the region with hopes of seeing him to pay their respects, were first asked to wait until an appropriate time could be arranged. When the monk handling these matters felt the time was right, he entered Acharyaman's hut to inform him about the visitors. Once permission was granted, the visitors were taken to see him. After Acharyaman had spoken to them for a while, they respectfully took their leave and departed. The monks at Bannong Peo Monastery had always arranged visits in this manner for those who came to see him. Visitors were invariably asked to wait until permission was granted, and then they were escorted to his hut in groups at the time which he had agreed to receive them. The exceptions to this rule were senior disciples, who enjoyed a special, close relationship with him, being Acharyas in their own right. Once Acharyaman was informed of their arrival and had given his consent, the Acharyas went straight in to converse with him in private. As the months passed, his condition continued to deteriorate. Although the symptoms never became very severe, he always felt unwell. His illness resembled an armed insurgency gradually escalating into a full-scale war, consuming everything in its path and leaving its victim decimated. His disciples were deeply affected. He occupied a special place at the center of their hearts, so his failing health left them all distraught. Feeling sad, even dejected, they were not so cheerful as before. Every conversation began with the topic of Acharyaman's illness and moved on to something else, only to return to his health again as the conversation ended. Despite failing health, Acharyaman did not neglect his teaching obligations. His compassionate concern for his disciples never diminished, though he was no longer able to expound the tamma in such detail as before. Having finished his talk, he briefly answered questions and then promptly adjourned the meeting to return to his hut for a rest. Incredibly, though, while sitting there expounding tamma to the assembled monks, he showed no signs of illness. He spoke with characteristic resoluteness in a sharp, lively fashion, his voice booming loudly, as if he never had been sick. When he wanted to emphasize a point, the tempo of his voice quickened dramatically to drive the point home. He held nothing back as he spoke. His whole demeanor belied his true condition. Only after he finished speaking did we all realize how exhausted he was. So we quickly adjourned to allow him a chance to rest. One evening, shortly before his illness began, on the occasion of Magapuja, the full moon day of February 1949, Atsaryaman began expounding Tamma to the assembled monks at 8 p.m. and did not finish until midnight, speaking for a total of four hours. The power of the Tamma he delivered that night truly amazed the whole assembly of Dutanga monks who were gathered for that occasion. To those listening, the entire universe appeared to have vanished without a trace, replaced in their awareness by the flow of his all-encompassing tamma radiating forth in every direction. He began by paying tribute to the 1,250 arahants who had come together spontaneously on this full moon day in the time of the Buddha. On this day, 1,250 arahants assembled spontaneously at the Lord Buddha's residence without prior arrangement. They were all individuals of the utmost purity, completely free of gilesas. The Lord Buddha himself delivered the Bhati Mokha exhortation that day, 
making the occasion of his sutti uposatha, that is, an uposatha observed among monks who are all absolutely pure. Compare that assembly with the one gathered here today. You listen to the Bhakti Mokha being recited among monks who are all absolutely tainted. Not one of you is completely free of kilesas. It is dismaying to think that, having ordained as a monk, each of you is a son of the same Buddha as those Arahant disciples. Yet, in your case, it is just an empty claim lacking any real substance, like a person having the name Goodman, who, on the contrary, is so weighed down under his own evil doings he can hardly move. In the Buddha's day, monks practiced the Tamma truly, and so became true monks with a true understanding that concealed nothing false. Today, the fame and celebrity of some monks is so great that they rival the sun and the moon, yet their actions sink to the depths of Aviti. Where will they ever find virtue, truth, and purity? They merely accumulate a mass of kilesas and create the evil gamma that goes with them. Since monks today are not engaged in uprooting the kilesas from their hearts, how can we uposita possibly arise? Once ordained, they are satisfied with their exalted status as Buddhist monks, taking for granted that this makes them models of virtue. But they have no idea what the true virtues of a Buddhist monk really are. If they understood the meaning of the Bhartimokha exhortation that the Lord Buddha delivered, they would know the true nature of virtue. He condensed the essential meaning of virtue into this concise statement. Refrain from all evil, develop goodness and wisdom in abundance, and purify the mind until it is bright and clear. This is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Refraining from evil, what does it mean? Some people refrain from acting in evil ways, but still speak in evil ways. Others may not act or speak in evil ways, but still like to think in evil ways. They continue to amass evil within themselves from dawn to dusk. Waking up the next morning, they resume, amassing more evil. So it continues, day in and day out, and they are not interested in reflecting upon their actions. Convinced they are already virtuous people, they wait around expecting a state of purity to arise from virtue that exists in name only. So they never find a state of purity. Instead, they find only defilement and disquiet. This is bound to happen, for anyone intent on looking for trouble is sure to find it. What else would they find? There is no shortage of such things in the conventional world we live in. This was Acharya Mun's way of explaining the underlying natural principles of virtue to practicing monks in the hope that they would gain a profound insight into the truth. He then went on to explain the way of practice that begins with samadhi and wisdom and ends with the ultimate attainment, absolute freedom. Discussing all areas of practice fully and openly, his exposition that day held nothing back. But, since much of what he said has already been covered in previous talks, I shall not elaborate any further here. The assembly of monks sat perfectly still the entire time he spoke, no one making the slightest sound to interrupt the cadence of his voice as he delivered this eloquent discourse. As he finished speaking, he made a similar remark to the one he previously made at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery in Chiang Mai. He said, in effect, that this talk would be the final encore of his old age. Never would he give another such talk. His words that night were prophetic, because from that day on, he never gave another profound and lengthy exposition of Tamma. One month later, his illness began, and his health steadily declined until he finally passed away. Despite the physical difficulties he suffered as a result of that degenerative disease, he insisted on making the effort to walk to the village for alms round, and continued eating only one meal a day from his alms bowl, as he always had. He did not simply abandon these practices. Eventually, when he felt that he could no longer walk the entire distance, he made an effort to walk at least halfway through the village before returning to the monastery. Seeing that so much walking caused him difficulty, lay supporters and senior monks conferred, and decided to invite him to walk only as far as the monastery gate, where offerings of food would be placed in his bowl. Had they requested him to abstain altogether from going on alms round, he would surely have demurred. So long as he was still physically able, he felt obliged to continue. 
So everyone had to respect his wishes. They wanted to avoid doing anything that might conflict with his resolute temperament. He continued walking to the front gate for alms until he became too weak to make it there and back. At that point, he began walking only as far as the refectory to collect alms. Only when he could no longer walk at all did he stop going for alms. Even then, he continued to eat just one meal a day, which he took in his alms bowl. The rest of us had to respect his wishes each time. We were all amazed at the endurance of this noble sage who, refusing to forsake his fighting spirit, conceded nothing to the Gileses. As for the rest of us, we would probably be so dispirited at the very first sign of sickness that someone would have to carry us to the refectory to eat. It is truly disgraceful, the Gileses always laughing at us as we lie hopelessly on their chopping block, waiting for them to shred us to pieces like so much raw meat. What a pathetic sight! Here we are, full-fledged human beings, willingly putting ourselves at the mercy of the Kileses. All of us who carry this shame on our conscience should stop and reflect on Acharya Man's mode of practice. We can then adopt it to safeguard us in our struggle with these defilements. In that way, we will always remain faithful to our Buddhist principles, instead of just being the Kileses' whipping boys. Eventually, Acharya Man's condition became so serious that the rest of us felt obliged to undertake certain precautions. We quietly arranged for groups of three or four monks to keep a vigil every night sitting beneath his hut. We arranged this ourselves without informing him, though he may have been intuitively aware of it. We were concerned he might forbid us to do it, reasoning that it was a burden on the monks and thus an unnecessary nuisance. Every night, small groups of monks took turns, sitting silently beneath his hut in continuous shifts that lasted until dawn. Each group stayed for several hours until it was replaced by the next. This routine was already well established by the beginning of the rainy season retreat that year. When it became obvious that his illness had become very debilitating, we conferred among ourselves and decided to request his permission for two monks to be allowed to sit in meditation on his veranda. With his consent, two monks were always seated on his veranda from then on, and two more were seated down below. Besides the regular shifts of monks who kept watch on him, others were quietly overseeing the whole arrangement throughout the night. The end of the rains retreat saw an increasing number of senior disciples begin arriving from their own retreat locations to pay him their respects and help look after his needs. By that time his condition was critical, and becoming more and more unstable by the day. Eventually, he called all his disciples together one day to remind them of the proper way to handle his impending death. My illness has now reached its final stage. It is time to think about what will happen when I die. Preparations must be made in time. As I've told you many times, I am going to die. This much is certain. My death is destined to be a major event affecting not only the general public, but animals as well. I want you to know that I do not wish to die here at Ban Nong Peo. If I die here, it will be necessary to slaughter large numbers of farm animals in order to feed all the people coming to my funeral. I am only one dying person, but the death of this one person will in turn cause the deaths of a great many animals. Crowds of people will travel here to attend my funeral, but there is no market in this village where foodstuffs can be purchased. Since ordaining as a monk, I have never for a moment considered doing harm to any animal, to say nothing of killing them. Compassion has always been the foundation of my conscious existence. I am continuously extending the spirit of loving-kindness and dedicating the fruits of my merit to all living beings without exception. I do not want to see any animal lose the life it cherishes so dearly. I could never countenance having my own death become a source of enmity between myself and the world's animals. I want you to take me to Zakon Nakorn, so I can die there. That town has a large marketplace, so my death should not affect the lives of so many animals. I have yet to die, but monks and lay people are already arriving here in a steady stream, their numbers increasing each day, clear evidence of the scale of the problem. Now think of how many people will come when I finally do die. Many people will mourn my death, but that is not my concern. I am ready for death, whenever and wherever it happens. I have no regrets about parting with my body. Having already investigated it thoroughly, I know that it is merely a combination of elements that have joined together temporarily, only to break apart again and revert back to their original elemental nature. What is there to be attached to? 
What I'm concerned about is safeguarding the local farm animals so they won't have to perish as well. I don't want to see animal carcasses laid out for sale all up and down the roadsides here. That would be extremely regrettable. Fortunately, it's not too late to remedy the situation. I am asking that you arrange for my departure as soon as possible, for the sake of all those animals that would otherwise die as a result of my death. It is my express wish that their lives be protected. Does anyone have anything to say? If so, speak up now. Not a single person in the group spoke up. An atmosphere of quiet despair pervaded the assembly. As the Buddha said, Yampitsang nalapatitampi dukkang. Not getting what one wants is truly a form of dukkha. Everyone realized that whether he went to Sakonnakon or remained here at Banongpeo, in either case the situation was hopeless. He was going to die. So the meeting remained silent. There was just no way to resolve this dilemma. In the end, everyone willingly agreed to his request. Prior to the meeting, the residents of Ban Nong Peo village had made it known that they would feel honored to have him die there. We will manage all the funeral arrangements ourselves. We may be quite poor here, but our hearts are rich in faith and respect for Acharya Man. We will do everything we possibly can to arrange the funeral here. We won't let anyone look down on us saying that the villagers of Ban Nong Peo couldn't cremate the body of even one Acharya. Instead, it had to be done elsewhere. We don't want that kind of reputation. Whatever happens, all of us here are ready to offer ourselves to Acharya Man, body and soul. He will remain our cherished refuge until the day he dies. We can't allow anyone to take him away. We will resist to the last breath any attempt to do so. So, when hearing Acharya Man's explanation for being taken away, their disappointment was palpable, but they felt they couldn't object. Although they venerated him so much, their sadness and disappointment at hearing his reasons nearly broke their hearts, they were forced to accept his decision. They truly deserve a lot of sympathy. Their willingness to sacrifice everything in their devotion to Atsari Amman is a gesture I will always treasure. I'm sure that all of my readers feel the same way. Many of Atsari Amman's most senior disciples attended the meeting, aware as he spoke that he must be moved as soon as possible. After he had announced his decision and stated his reasons, and there being no dissenting voices, the monks and laity who were present all agreed to construct a stretcher suitable to carry him on the long journey from Ban Nong Peo to Sakon Nakorn. The next day, a large crowd of lay supporters and monks brought the stretcher to his hut, awaiting his departure. An immense sorrow overcame everyone that day. They realized they were about to lose somebody whom they so deeply cherished and revered. It was a sorrow so great that local people and monks alike could barely contain their emotions. After the morning meal was over, and everyone awaited in readiness for the journey to start, emotions began to run high in the crowd surrounding his hut as the local people, gathered to see him off, gave vent to their despair one last time. Many monks and novices swelled the crowd. They too felt the strain. The deep sadness depressing their hearts slowly welled up, and tears flowed quietly, dampening their cheeks. At that moment, Acharya Man appeared, carried by a group of his senior disciples, a moment of further heightened emotion. As the monks carried him down the steps and placed him on the stretcher, the mixture of affection, respect, and despair that everyone had kept bottled up inside freely poured out. Men, women, monks, and novices were no longer able to hold back their flood of tears. Onlookers wept openly, expressing an unrestrained and deep sense of sorrow. I myself could not avoid getting caught up in the despondent mood pervading that sad occasion, despite the fact that I was accompanying Atsari Amman when he left. The air filled with sounds of weeping and crying. People called out, begging Atsari Amman, Please get better. Don't pass away from this world, leaving us forever in unbearable sadness. They were almost inconsolable at that point. In his great compassion, he sympathized with how poor their community was. This they knew, yet they couldn't help but feel terribly miserable watching the cherished treasure over whom they had faithfully kept watch for so many years slip away from them forever. He was departing now, and there was nothing they could do to prevent it. As Atsari Aman was carried past, the sounds of their heartfelt laments surged along the path, 
a tidal wave of grief inundating the hearts of those who lined the route. As he passed by, everything appeared grey and bleak, as though their lives had suddenly been snuffed out. Even the grasses and trees, though insensible to the unfolding scene before them, appeared to wither up and die in response. As Acharya Man left the peaceful shade of the forest sanctuary where he and his disciples had lived so contentedly, a place where so many ordinary people had come to find shelter over the years, the monastery suddenly felt deserted, even though many monks still remained. Suddenly it no longer had that enormous tree with the thick, broad foliage that had always given so much peace and comfort to all who came to shelter there. The heart-rending, anguished cries of those wanting to offer their undying devotion to the sasana was an immensely sad, forlorn sound indeed. They were witnessing the departure of the one man who embodied the high ideals of their unshakable religious faith. Long after the procession had passed through the village and the sounds of inconsolable grief had faded into the distance, hundreds of monks and lay people continued to walk behind his stretcher, their long, drawn faces mirroring the somber, cheerless spirit of the occasion. Walking along in complete silence, like mourners in a funeral procession of a close friend or relative, they did their best to come to terms with the heartbreak. No one spoke a word, but in their hearts they pondered long and deeply on their shattered hopes, the overwhelming feeling being that all was now lost. It seemed then as if we were taking his corpse away to dispose of it, even though he was still very much alive. The realization that all hope was now gone, that he would never return again, had fully sunk in. The more we thought about it, the sadder we became. Yet we couldn't stop thinking about it. We all walked along in a kind of melancholy daze, contemplating thoughts of despair. I must confess to being shamefully inadequate in this regard. The whole journey I thought only of how I was about to lose my one true refuge in life. No longer would there be someone to rely on when questions arose in my practice, as they so often did. The distance from Ban Nong Peo to the district seat of Panna Nikom was approximately fifteen miles, but the long hours of walking passed almost unnoticed. Walking behind him, knowing he was dying, I thought only of how much I was going to miss my teacher. I desperately wanted him to continue living at the time. His final days corresponded to a crucial stage in my own meditation practice, a time when I had many unresolved problems to work out. No matter how much I pondered this predicament, I always arrived at the same conclusion. My dependence on him would have to be terminated soon. This made the future look bleak. His condition remained calm and stable throughout the long journey. He did not display any obvious signs of ill health. In fact, he appeared to be lying fast asleep, though of course he wasn't sleeping at all. Around midday, the procession reached a cool, shady grove of trees. We asked Acharya Man's permission to take a short rest for the sake of the large group of people accompanying him. He immediately asked, Where are we now? The moment I heard his voice, I was caught off guard by a surge of affection and emotional attachment. Why was I so deeply moved by this wonderful, welcome sound? It seemed, suddenly, as though Acharya Man was his old self again. Is this beloved paragon of the three worlds truly going to abandon me, a poor orphan whose heart is about to break? Will his pure heart, whose kind existence has always helped to breathe life into my spirit, really withdraw from my life and disappear forever? Such were my immediate feelings the moment Acharya Man spoke up. Some people may consider this a somewhat crazy reaction, but I have no misgivings. I willingly admit this kind of craziness. For Acharya Man's sake, I was so crazy I would gladly have volunteered to die in his place without the least concern for my own life. Had it been his wish, I would have happily laid down my life. No second thoughts. I was prepared at a moment's notice to sacrifice my life for his. But alas, it was impossible for him to accept any sacrifice I might be willing to offer. The truth is that everyone in the world must inevitably travel the same route. Whatever is born must die. There are no exceptions. The journey to Sakon Nakon was planned in two stages. The first day, we walked as far as Ban Pu Monastery in Panna Nikom district, where we were to rest for a few days, allowing Acharya Man a chance to recuperate before moving on to Sakon Nakon. Leaving Ban Nong Peo at nine o'clock that morning, 
the procession eventually reached Banpu Monastery shortly before dark. The journey had taken all day because we followed the more circuitous route, skirting the edge of the mountains to make it easier for him and the many elderly men and women determined to follow him all the way. Upon arriving, we invited him to rest in a low pavilion where his needs could easily be attended. It was also a convenient place for monks and lay people to pay him their respects. Atariaman's sojourn at Banpu Monastery dragged on for many days, his condition steadily worsening the entire time. Meanwhile, each new day brought visiting crowds of monks and lay people from the surrounding area. Some even came at night. All were eager for a chance to meet him and pay their respects. Though well aware of his illustrious reputation, most of them had never made his acquaintance. They had heard the news that he was certainly a modern-day Arahant, who would soon pass away into Nibbana. It was rumored that those who met him would be blessed with good fortune, while those that didn't would have lived their lives in vain. So they were all anxious to benefit by coming to pay him homage. They did not want to feel they had wasted their birth as human beings. The very first morning after arriving at Banpu, Atsariyaman demanded to know when he would be taken to Sakon Nakorn. He told his disciples that it was not his intention to die at Banpu. They must take him on to Sakon Nakorn without further delay. His senior disciples replied that they planned to wait for a short while for him to recuperate. Then they would proceed to Sakon Nakorn as he requested. So Atsariyaman let them have a drop for a while. The next day he again asked the same question. His senior disciples repeated their reasons and he remained silent only to bring it up again later. Time and again he demanded to know when they would take him to Zakun Korn. He said that, by waiting too long, he would fail to make it in time. In the end, they asked him to extend his stay at Banpu Monastery for a full ten days. By the time four or five days had passed, he was pressing them constantly to take him to Zakun Korn. Each time, his senior disciples either kept silent or repeated their previous justifications for staying. Repeatedly he pressed them, scolding them for waiting so long. Are you going to have me die here? I've told you from the very beginning, I am going to die in Sakon Nakon. My time is almost up. Get me there in a hurry. Don't wait so long. During the final three days, his demands to be taken to Sakon Nakon became increasingly vociferous. During his last night there, he flatly refused to lie down and sleep. Instead, he urgently called the monks to his bedside and told them unequivocally that he could not remain alive much longer. He insisted on being taken that very night to be sure of arriving in time. He then had us prop him up, sitting cross-legged in Samati, and facing in the direction of Sakon Nakon. As soon as he withdrew from Samati, he told us to prepare to leave. He was waiting no longer. We rushed off to call his senior disciples. They informed him that he would definitely be taken to Zakon Nakon the next morning. Following this assurance, his sense of urgency lessened somewhat, but he still refused to go to sleep, speaking openly about how he felt. My time is almost up. I cannot hang on much longer. It would be better to leave tonight. In that way, I will be sure to arrive in time for that critical moment which is now fast approaching. I have no wish to shoulder the burden of this flaming mass of body elements any longer. I want to discard the body once and for all, so that I needn't be concerned with this great pile of pain and suffering ever again. I am literally on the verge of death right now. Don't you monks realize that I could die at any minute? My body is completely useless now. There is no justifiable reason to keep me in this state of physical torment. All of you understand my reasons for going to Sakon Nakon. That's why we came here in the first place. So why do you still insist on delaying my departure? Is this Sakon Nakon? Why don't you take me there immediately? I want to go, right now. What are you waiting for? What use is a corpse? It's not useful for anything. Not even for making fish sauce. I have already told you, my body has reached its limit. It simply cannot last any longer. Isn't anyone here interested in listening to me and doing what I say? I have explicitly stated what I want you to do. Still, no one seems to listen. If you insist on adopting such an attitude, how will you ever discover the truth? If here in my presence, while I'm alive, you are so stubborn, refusing to believe what I say, how will you ever manage to be good, reasonable people once I'm dead? I know what I told you to be absolutely true. I have explained the whole situation to you in a carefully considered, reasonable manner, yet you stubbornly refuse to comply. I am beginning to lose hope that any of you will develop the principles of sound judgment needed to uphold the sasana. 
Atsariyaman was very adamant the last night at Banpu. He absolutely refused to sleep that whole night. I suspect he was afraid that, in his condition, he might never wake up again. At the time, none of us there with him could figure out his reason for staying awake all night. Only later did the real reason occur to me. At seven o'clock the next morning, several trucks from the provincial highway department arrived to escort Acharyaman to Zakornakorn. Mrs. Num Chuanon, as head of the escort, invited him to ride in one of the vehicles. He readily agreed and asked only whether there were enough vehicles to carry all of the many monks who were scheduled to accompany him. He was informed that three trucks had come. If these were not sufficient to transport all the monks who wanted to go, a return trip would be made to pick up the rest. Understanding the arrangement, Atsariyaman remained silent. After the monks had eaten their meal, a doctor injected him with a sedative so that he would not be disturbed by the bumpy ride. In those days, the roads were quite rough, full of potholes and in generally poor condition. Having received the injection, he was placed on a stretcher and carried out to one of the trucks parked at the edge of the field, there being no road into the monastery. Soon after, he began to fall asleep. The convoy of vehicles then began the trip to Sakonnakorn, arriving there at exactly noon. Upon arrival, he was carried down from the truck and placed, still sleeping, in a hut at Wat Sudtowat Monastery. He remained asleep the entire day, not waking until about midnight. Within an hour of his waking, those critical symptoms, of which he had repeatedly forewarned his seemingly deaf and blind disciples, became more and more apparent, as if to say to us all, Now do you see? This is why I kept insisting that you hurry to bring me to Sukhon the Korn. I want to quickly rid myself of this messy heap of suffering. The symptoms are fully obvious now. If you still don't understand, then take a look. If you still don't believe what I was telling you, then watch carefully and consider with all your heart what you see appearing before you at this moment. Was I telling you the truth or not? Stop being so deaf, blind, and thoughtless from now on. Otherwise, you will never find the wisdom needed to save yourselves. What you are witnessing right now should inspire you to think deeply, so don't be complacent. Bhara Hawe Pantsakanta. The five kantas are indeed a heavy burden. In the very early hours of the morning, he began to take leave of this heavy burden, this heap of intense suffering that no truly wise person wants to encounter again in the future. The monastery was absolutely quiet that night. No one milled about to disturb this stillness. Shortly, some important Atsariyas, like Chao Kun Tammachedi from Wat Bodhi Sompon Monastery Nudon Tani, arrived at his hut, having come in great haste as soon as they heard the news. As they entered, they hurriedly sat down in a calm, composed manner, though their hearts were actually troubled by the obvious deterioration in his condition. It was a poignant reminder that he could pass away at any moment. Monks arriving to monitor his condition sat silently in three rows facing him. Important senior disciples, led by Chao Kun Tam Machedi, sat in the front, the more junior monks and novices filling the remaining rows. All sat in complete silence, their eyes fixed on Acharyaman. Their lower eyelids were moistened by tears they couldn't hold back. Such was the intensity of their despair. They knew all hope was lost, for nothing at all could be done to change the inevitable. They felt as if their own lives were losing all meaning. At the beginning, Acharyaman was lying on his right side in the lion's posture. Fearing this might exhaust him, some monks gently removed the pillow supporting him so that he came to rest lying on his back. As soon as he became aware of this, he tried to shift back to his right side, but he no longer had the strength to move. As he struggled to turn on his side, some senior Atsariyas attempted to reposition the pillow so that it again supported his back. But noticing how very weak he was, they decided to stop, fearing that it might just make matters worse. Consequently, when Acharyaman finally passed away, he was lying neither on his back nor on his right side, but slightly propped up somewhere in between. It was simply impossible to adjust his posture further under the circumstances. His disciples, mostly monks and novices with a few lay people, sat in total despair as life slowly ebbed from his body. So apprehensive were they about his imminent death, they had almost forgotten to breathe. As the minutes passed, 
His breathing gradually became softer and more refined. No one took their eyes off him, for it was obvious the end was fast approaching. His breathing continued to grow weaker and weaker until it was barely discernible. A few seconds later it appeared to cease, but it ended so delicately that no one present could determine just when he passed away. His physical appearance revealed nothing abnormal, so different from the death of the ordinary person. Despite the fact that all his disciples observed his final moments with unblinking attention, not one of them was able to say with any conviction, that was precisely the moment when Atsariyaman finally took leave of this dismal world. Seeing no apparent signs of life, Chao Kun Tamachedi rather tentatively said, I think he's passed away. At the same time, he glanced down at his watch. It was exactly 2.23 a.m., so that was taken as the time of death. When death had been confirmed, the impact of his passing was reflected in the grief-stricken, tearful faces of all the monks who sat crowded around the lifeless body. There followed an anguished few moments of low coughs and soft, incoherent mutterings before the whole room sank into a mood of silent despair which is beyond the power of words to describe. Our hearts were plunged into unbearable feelings of emptiness. Our bodies sitting there appeared to be mere empty shells. Several long moments of stilled silence ensued, when the whole world appeared to cease momentarily, while Atsariyaman abandoned his conventional existence and entered into the domain of ultimate happiness, where no vestige of conventional reality could disturb him ever again. I myself very nearly died of a broken heart along with him, as I sat by his side steeped in pensive sorrow. I could not manage to shake off the gloomy, somber mood that clouded my heart as he departed the world. I could do nothing to alleviate the extreme pain of the loss I felt. Living dead fittingly describes my sense of hopelessness at that moment. After a period of silence, his senior disciples had the monks neatly rearrange his bedding. They laid out his body there for the time being, with the understanding that next morning they would consult together about making further arrangements. This accomplished, the monks began filing out of his room. Though a few remained on the veranda outside the room, most of them went down below. Even though the whole area surrounding the hut was illuminated by brightly lit lanterns, his disciples stumbled around blindly in dejection, unsure where they were going. Appearing somnolent, almost drugged, they wandered aimlessly back and forth, Several monks actually fainted at the time, as though they too were about to expire because life no longer held any meaning for them. The entire monastic community found itself in a chaotic state of confusion late that night. All were inconsolable over the terrible sense of loss they suffered. Monks milled around absent-mindedly, having no clear idea where they were going or why. Such was the power of utter despondency arising from the departure of that shining beacon which so illuminated their lives and brightened their hearts. Suddenly, all sense of comfort and security had evaporated, exposing them to the uncertainty of living on without a reliable refuge. This cold, dark constriction in their hearts left them feeling that nothing substantial remained in the entire universe, nothing they could hold to for support. Failing to consider that beings throughout the universe have always managed to find a source of refuge, at that moment they appeared to face a bleak and uncertain future, as if dire misfortune were engulfing them all. Atsariyaman had been the one true refuge. To him they could always confidently entrust themselves, heart and soul, without reservation. I mean no disregard to the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, but at that moment they seemed somehow very distant, making it difficult to re-establish them as a viable refuge. They did not appear to project the same affirmative presence that Acharya Man did. He was always close at hand and ready to help resolve our doubts and provide us with inspiration. Approaching him with pressing problems that we were unable to solve on our own, these same burning issues invariably dissolved away the moment he offered a solution. This salient recollection, so deeply engraved on my heart, profoundly affected me when he passed away. 
I could think of no other person capable of helping me solve my problems. Who else could I find with such compassion for me? Who else's advice could I trust? I was afraid of being left alone, depressed and hopelessly stuck with my own store of ignorance. Gone were the easy solutions I had found while living with him. The more I thought about this dilemma, the more discouraged I became about finding a safe, painless way out on my own. In my ignorance, I saw no way forward at that moment. Only misery and despair stared me in the face. Sitting there in front of his dead body, as though I myself were dead, I could think of no way to save myself and relieve my misery. I sat brooding, a living, breathing ghost, completely oblivious to time or bodily fatigue. This was the first time in my life as a monk that I felt so gloomy, frightened, and confused. And there was no one to help me, no means of extricating myself from this distress. Each time I glanced down at Atsari Amun's still, lifeless body, tears welled up in my eyes and flowed down my cheeks. I was helpless to stop them. My chest heaved and sobbed as an uncontrollable emotion arose and lodged in my throat, nearly suffocating me. Eventually I regained enough presence of mind to reflect inwardly, admonishing myself. Do I really intend to die of a broken heart right now? He died free of concerns and attachments, which are matters of the Chileses. If I were to die now, I would die as a result of my concerns and attachments. That would be harmful to me. Neither my despondency nor my death is of any use to me or to Atsariyaman. When he was alive, he never taught us to miss him to the point of death. This kind of longing is the way of worldly people everywhere. Even though my reason for missing him is associated with Tamma, it is still contaminated by worldly concerns, and thus hardly worthy of a Buddhist monk. Such thoughts are especially inappropriate for someone like me, who has set his sights firmly on achieving the highest level of Tamma. The Lord Buddha stated that whoever practices the Tamma properly is, in fact, worshipping the Buddha, that whoever realizes the Tamma realizes the Buddha as well. It is clear that my longing is not in perfect accord with Tamma. To be in perfect accord with Tamma, I must practice precisely what Atsariyaman taught me. This is the correct way for me to show how much I miss him. Should I die while engaged in those harsh training methods that he recommended, I shall feel confident that my death is in harmony with the principles of Tamma. This is the only sensible way to behave. I must not obstruct my own progress by longing for him in an unreasonable, worldly manner. I'll only harm myself. In this way I regained mindfulness, allowing reason a chance to intervene and forestall the maelstrom raging in my heart at the time. And so I avoided being buried alive in my own futility. The Funeral By mid-morning, reports about Tariyaman's death had spread throughout the adjacent communities. Senior monks and government officials of all levels had heard the news. All hurried to the monastery, anxious to pay their last respects to his body. While gathered there, they conferred with Atariyaman's senior disciples to reach a consensus on the most suitable way to arrange the funeral. They were determined that it be conducted in a manner reflecting his exalted status as a distinguished Atariya, greatly revered nationwide. At the same time, they arranged to have news of his death broadcast over the radio and printed in the newspapers, so that his faithful followers would have access to the news wherever they might be. No sooner had reports of his death begun to circulate than groups of monks and lay devotees began pouring into the monastery from all directions to pay their last respects. From the time his death was announced until the day his body was cremated, a steady flow of visitors came daily to pay their respects. People living close by came and returned home the same day, but those living some distance away had to stay in the monastery overnight, transportation being less convenient then than it is today. During Atsariyaman's earlier stay at Banpu Monastery, the people who came to see him had offered so many gifts of various kinds it was hard to keep track of them all. The amount of gift offerings he received from the faithful was extraordinary, a trend which continued until the day of his death. Like rainwater in the monsoon season, donations flowed into the monastery in a continuous stream. In his lifetime, he had always been the recipient of much largesse, regardless of whether he was staying near a population center or deep in the mountains. Even when staying in the remotest locations, 
There were invariably generous people willing to make the effort to trek through thick forests so they could offer him something special. By nature, Atsariyaman was always generous and self-sacrificing. He gave away everything he was offered to assist others. He never thought of keeping things for himself, and he never regretted his beneficence. He gave away everything he received, irrespective of what it was or how much it may have cost. In terms of actual poverty, perhaps no monk was poorer than Atsariyaman. The combined amount of all the donations he received during his life was prodigious, but the amount he gave away in charity was equally as great, if not greater. Whatever he was given, he very soon passed on to someone in need. Even on occasions when he had nothing to give away, he thought of other ways to be of help, though he did this unobtrusively. His beneficence often provided nearby monasteries with much-needed assistance. As the result of a life of self-sacrifice, even after his death, people from all over the region continuously arrived with offerings to place before his body as it lay in state at Wat Sudtawat Monastery. Prominent senior monks, in consultation with local government officials, decided that it would be best to keep Atsariyaman's body for several months before proceeding with the cremation. Agreement was reached that the cremation should take place during the period of the waxing moon in January of 1950. With this in mind, they arranged a special casket to hold the body. At four o'clock that afternoon, a large crowd of laity, monks, and novices came to attend the funeral bathing rites for his body. When this ceremony was completed, his body, still draped in his monk's robes, was wrapped in many layers of white cloth and placed respectfully in the special casket. The casket's entire front panel was made of glass, allowing those coming from afar who had never before seen him to view his body. No one was to be disappointed. The community of monks, headed by Chao Kun Tamachedi, decided to arrange nightly sessions of sutta chanting to honor him, accompanied by discourses on tamma, which were always well attended. All the various functions connected with Atsariyaman's funeral were organized with the generous cooperation of the local populace. From government officials and business leaders down to the general public, all contributions were made in a spirit of geniality. Sincere in their faith, they took these responsibilities very seriously, never losing heart. From the day Atsariyaman passed away until the time of his cremation, the people of Sakon Nakon put forth a concerted effort to make life as convenient as possible for the monks and novices gathered there for the occasion. They worked tirelessly, with enthusiasm, to ensure that this huge funeral ceremony was an unqualified success and spared no effort or expense in the process. In the months leading up to the cremation, hundreds of monks arrived in Sakon Nakon wishing to pay their final respects. Most then returned home but over a hundred remained, residing in the monastery to help coordinate all the necessary arrangements. Despite the large influx of monks, local residents never felt discouraged. The faithful were prepared to support them each day with plenty of alms food. The lines of monks receiving food every morning seemed to stretch on forever, but people remained unstinting in their generosity from the first day to the last. On not a single day was alms food in short supply. Even with the increasing demand, ample food offerings were always graciously provided to support the monks. I witnessed the enormous sacrifices these people made during that period, so I feel obliged to record for posterity their charitable goodness and amicable cooperation. It made such a deep impression on me, I shall never forget it. I never imagined I would see so much patience, endurance, and self-sacrifice shown by one group of people. Having experienced this incredible outpouring of generosity firsthand, I want to express my admiration to the people of Sukun Nakon. They possessed a magnanimous faith that never waned. Their grand hospitality has left me with a warm feeling of gratitude, an impression that will forever remain in my heart. One had to sympathize with the monks and novices, staying at the monastery, who helped supervise suitable arrangements for all the people attending the funeral, and with the many lay supporters who toiled so hard, helping with the labor. Well in advance of the cremation date, monks and novices were already arriving in large numbers, while the cremation ceremony was expected to attract a crowd of well over 10,000 people. Several pavilions were constructed to house people, and as many kitchen areas as possible were set up around the grounds to accommodate the large crowd that was expected to attend this important occasion. Begun shortly after Atsariyaman passed away, these preparations were completed just in time for his cremation. As the day of the funeral ceremony drew near, monks and lay devotees flooded in from all directions, their numbers swelling until those charged with receiving them were hardly able to cope. The closer it came to cremation day, the greater the multitude of people pouring into the monastery. In the end, 
No more space could be found to accommodate the hordes of people who kept arriving. By funeral day, all the huts were full, and the whole extensive tract of forest within the monastery grounds was crowded with monks and novices who had traveled from all over the region. Most of them camped out in the woods, their white umbrella tents visible everywhere. A total of eight hundred monks and novices were camped outside of Wat Sutawat alone. Several hundred more found shelter in nearby monasteries. In all, well over a thousand monks and novices were present at Atsariyaman's cremation. As for the lay devotees, it was simply impossible to count how many were camped inside the monastery grounds. Over and above that, many more people stayed outside the monastery, sleeping under trees or out in the open fields. Many more slept in town, filling up all the limited hotel space. With the entire multitude finally assembled at the funeral pyre on cremation day, it was impossible to give an accurate reckoning of their total strength. At best, one could estimate that tens of thousands were in attendance that day. And yet, strangely, amazingly, there was very little of the kind of noise usually associated with such a crowded ceremony. Only the sound of the public address system was heard, broadcasting the religious functions being performed in connection with the cremation. Performed strictly in accordance with Gumbatana tradition, there were no sideshows to entertain the crowd. The, co the quantities of food, cloth, and other items that were offered by devotees from all over the region to help the monastery with the funeral amounted to a small mountain of goods. Hundreds of sacks of rice were offered, while the cars of faithful donors continuously brought food of all sorts to help feed everyone. The quantity of merit-making cloth offered in honor of Acharya Man would probably have filled a weaving factory. I've never seen a weaving factory, and I have no idea how big they are, but I am confident that this mountain of cloth brought by faithful followers from all over the country would have exceeded the capacity of any such factory. I wish to apologize to the reader if this seems an exaggeration. I was somewhat carried away by a sense of pride I felt concerning the offerings of so many generous people. I never imagined that we Thai people could be so generous. But witnessing this wonderful display of munificence personally, I have continued to be amazed by it ever since. Self-sacrifice and bounteous generosity are hallmarks of the Thai people. From a global perspective, Thailand is but a small country, yet our compassionate tendency to engage in spontaneous acts of charitable giving is second to none. It is a tradition that is entirely appropriate for a country like ours, with a Buddhist heritage that teaches us to have compassion for one another. On the whole, we Thais have always been a nation of warm, big-hearted people who tend to shun narrow-minded, stingy attitudes. Nowhere was this more apparent than at Acharyaman's funeral, where faithful donors offered an abundance of items for general consumption. The bounty was truly extraordinary. The sizes of the enormous pots of rice and stew prepared each day were almost frightening. These pots were so big and heavy that several people were required to carry them to the pavilions where the monks gathered to eat. Due to the unusually large number of monks, many different eating places were set up to accommodate them. Most of them ate in large groups, 30 to 40 monks here, 50 to 60 monks there, at locations set aside for that purpose within the grounds. Smaller groups of 9 to 10 monks ate together in the monks' living quarters. The vast majority of them were Kamatana monks who ate directly from their alms bowls. So large quantities of dishes and eating utensils were unnecessary, making it much easier to serve so many. Sets of dishes were provided only for the relatively few prominent administrative monks and those accompanying them. Once the pots of rice and stew had been offered, monks served themselves in order of seniority, placing rice, stew, and assorted sweets together in their alms bowls. This was normal practice. They invariably mixed their food in that way. The religious faith of the general public and the protective power of Acharyaman's spiritual greatness combined to ensure that food was always plentiful. For the duration of the funeral, there were no instances of drinking or drunken behavior, no quarreling or fighting, and no cases of theft were reported. When found, lost articles were handed over to someone in authority who announced them over the loudspeakers. If the item in question was something valuable, the announcer did not describe it. He said merely that a valuable item had been found and urged the owner to come and claim it. Having correctly identified it, the item was returned to him. If the lost article was something common, the announcer simply described what had been found so the owner could then reclaim it. If it was money, he announced only that some money had been found, but the amount and its container, such as a wallet, were not mentioned. The owner was required to supply this information as proof of ownership. The funeral ceremonies preceding the cremation of Acharyaman's body lasted a total of four days and three nights. 
the entire event was remarkable in many respects. To begin with, despite the enormous crowds, there was very little noise. No fights or wild, drunken behavior anywhere in the area. No pickpockets and no thefts reported. Lost valuables were promptly handed over to the authorities. All monks and novices were calm, quiet, and very well behaved. In any gathering of such size, it is unusual to meet with even one of these favorable conditions. Having them all combined in a single event was truly remarkable indeed. Beginning at eight o'clock each night, the monks assembled to chant suttas in honor of Atsariyaman. The laity then offered gifts of cloth to the monks, one of whom gave a discourse on tamma. Again the next morning after the meal, members of the laity began presenting traditional offerings of merit-making cloth to the monks, offerings which continued with no fixed schedule throughout most of the day. During the four-day period, there were so many faithful devotees traveling such great distances hoping to dedicate offerings of cloth that it would have been impractical to restrict those offerings to scheduled times. The issue was resolved by permitting lay people who wanted to dedicate offerings of cloth to a monk or a group of monks to make their dedications as quickly and easily as possible. Those arriving with cloth to offer were advised to contact the announcer and specifying to him how many monks they required. Using the public address system was by far the most convenient method, since it was almost impossible to find a specific monk in such a large crowd in any other way. So if certain devotees wanted to invite a specific monk to come and receive an offering, his name was announced on the public address system. The announcer had a complete list of the names of all the monks in attendance. All visiting monks and novices were required to register their names at the announcer's booth as soon as they arrived, and an announcement to this effect was broadcast on a regular basis. This policy allowed the organizers to make an accurate estimation of the number of monks and novices attending the funeral ceremonies. It also enabled the announcer to call out their names correctly when required. Monks walked to the nearby villages or into town for alms every morning. The only exception was the day of the cremation itself. On that day, the laity made a special request that the monks collect food in the immediate vicinity of the monastery. The faithful lined up in groups at various places inside and outside the monastery, placing offerings into their bowls as the monks filed past. The ceremony began on the tenth lunar day of the third lunar month, and ended at midnight on the thirteenth lunar day with the cremation of Acharyaman's body. The special casket containing Acharyaman's body was placed on an ornate funeral pyre, specially constructed for the cremation. Built on the site where the Oposita Hall presently stands, it was a four-sided wooden structure decorated with intricately carved motifs that skilled craftsmen had created for the auspicious occasion. It looked very impressive, worthy of such a distinguished Acharya. His remains were later collected on the morning of the 14th lunar day. Unfortunately, I cannot recall the day of the month according to the international calendar. To the best of my recollection, his body was placed there on the 11th lunar day. As they prepared to move his body from the pavilion where he lay in state, the monks and the laity held a short service to ask his forgiveness for any past transgressions they might have committed. The casket containing his body was then carried solemnly to the funeral pyre, prompting a dramatic outburst of emotion among his followers as they expressed their grief once more. Watching his body pass by for the last time, the crowd looked on with long, sad faces, tearful expressions occasionally erupting in cries of anguish. It was a chaotic scene his casket moving slowly through throngs of impassioned supporters, all mourning the loss of an exceptionally noble person who possessed such a boundless ocean of loving-kindness. Many in the crowd wept openly as his body passed by. It was all they had left of him, the last vestige of conventional reality still associated with his presence in the world. He had entered the sublime, pure land of Nibbana. Never again would he return to physical, bodily existence, the domain of tearful lamentations. His devotees wept one last time, with affection and respect for a man whose tamma teaching had soothed their hearts and tempered their ignorance. Through his grace, they had gained the presence of mind needed to reflect on the merits of virtue and the failings of evil. Reminded of his great virtue, they longed to keep his body a while longer as an object of veneration, though they knew this was now impossible. So they asked only that they be allowed this final chance to offer their tears and heartfelt emotions as tokens of their deep appreciation. Although they may have been unfortunate in many ways, they did have the wonderful good fortune to witness for themselves the final farewell of a supreme sage, sublimely free of all gilesas, an extremely auspicious event that is rarely ever witnessed. Having transcended Sangsara's abundant misery, he had already reached the ultimate happiness of Nibbana. Even so, 
They continued to hope that his compassion would be with them in this hour of sorrow, a sorrow that made them weep with longing for that noble being of unbounded virtue who was so dear to their hearts. They wondered when they would ever find a way to escape Mara's net and reach the safety of Nibbana as well. But their time was not yet ripe. All they could do was extol his extraordinary virtue and honor his magnificent achievement with their tears. Such was the overwhelming sentiment of the Buddhist faithful as they mourned the loss of the monk they so revered. Only when his body had finally been placed on the funeral pyre did they begin to calm down and grow quiet. At midnight, the funeral pyre was lit. In anticipation, such a mass of people had crowded in around the cremation site that no one could move. Packed tightly together, they pushed and pressed against one another, trying to get a better look. All had patiently waited late into the night to have one last glimpse of his body, a memory to be long cherished by everyone. Just as the funeral pyre was lit, something unimaginably strange and wonderful occurred. As the first flames began to shoot up, a small cloud appeared in the sky and began to rain ever so gently on the burning pyre. It was the night of the full moon. Bright moonlight was shining over the surrounding area, but the cremation site was suddenly bathed in a fine, misty rain. Softly sprinkling for about fifteen minutes, the cloud then gradually faded into the clear night sky. You may wonder why I think it's so strange. Normally, at that time of year, the sky is completely clear. Only the stars and the moon are visible. And so it was that night, until the funeral pyre was lit, when a small cloud floated over, sprinkling a gentle shower on the whole proceeding. I clearly witnessed this amazing event. Such an extraordinary spectacle, I've never forgotten it. Anyone who was there that night will be able to confirm it. Instead of the usual pile of firewood or charcoal, Acharya Mun's funeral pyre was made with fragrant sandalwood that ardent devotees had specially ordered from across the Mekong River in Laos. Having acquired a sufficient amount, they mixed it with incense, using this as a pyre to cremate the body. The results were just as satisfactory as those obtained by using plain firewood or charcoal. From the moment the pyre was lit until the cremation of his body had been completed and his remains had been safely collected, the whole affair was supervised by officials from the monastic and lay community. At nine o'clock the following morning, the bone remains were carefully collected from the ash. Bone relics were distributed to monks representing the various provinces, in attendance with the understanding that these relics would be placed in suitable public shrines in their respective locales. Fragments of bone were also handed out to members of the general public, but due to the size of the crowd, there were not nearly enough to go around. As far as I can recall, representatives from over twenty provinces took bone relics back with them that day. When the collection and distribution of the bone relics were finally completed, something indescribably moving happened that made a profound impression on me. As soon as the officials in charge of collecting the bones had finished their work and left, a scene of total confusion ensued as men and women of all ages rushed in to collect bits and pieces of ash and charcoal to keep as objects of worship. Everybody scrambled to get a bit of this or a piece of that, combing the ground around the funeral pyre for any small memento they could find. In the end, the whole area was spotless, as if it had been scrubbed clean. Walking away, each person seemed to be floating on air, smiling, overjoyed beyond words. All clasped some small keepsake in their fists, guarding their treasure jealously, as though afraid someone might try to snatch it away at any moment. Like so many other events occurring during the course of Atsari Mun's funeral, it was an extremely moving sight. Later, as their last act of homage before going home, most people returned one more time to the site of the cremation, the final resting place of Atsari Mun's body. Prostrating themselves three times, they sat quietly on the ground for a few moments in an attitude of deep reflection, expressing their sense of loss with tears and quiet sobs in a way that was heartrending to witness. As I watched those people who felt such profound gratitude for a monk of surpassing virtue, I shared with them the same painful sense of loss. When their moment of quiet reflection was over, they rose and sadly walked away, their faces stained with tears. Other faithful devotees then took their places, solemnly paying their final respects, aware that they had lost the person they so dearly revered. And so it continued for many hours that day. It was an incredibly touching scene to watch. The key factor here is the heart. The heart is the most important thing in the world. People's hearts were the primary force behind all the events I have just described. Tens of thousands of monks and lay people attended the funeral, 
Their motivations for going came directly from the heart. Their hearts were instinctively drawn to Acharyaman, for his heart was pure tamma, an attainment so sought after that it induced good, moral people from all over the country to come to worship him. Although their hearts may not have amassed as much virtue as they would have liked, it was still enough to create in them a tendency toward future rebirth as human beings. This is unlike the hearts of shameless people who seem to be vying for rebirth in hell or the animal world, types of birth that result in endless suffering. Rebirth in the lower realms of existence effectively debases the heart even further. Eventually, nothing of value is left to hold on to, and all hope is lost. All matters, without exception, converge at the heart. The heart is the driving force, churning out the affairs of this world and determining the direction they take. If the heart is inclined towards goodness, everything a person does will bring contentment, both now and in the future. All paths branching off from the main avenue of goodness will invariably provide comfort and security to the virtuous wayfarer. Each rebirth will be a happy, prosperous one, where hopes and desires are constantly being fulfilled. One day, that accumulated virtue is bound to lead to the most cherished goal of all. Witness Acharya Man, whose heart was a wellspring of goodness, from the beginning stages to the very highest one. Acharya Man has been widely glorified for his attainment of Parinibbana. The word Parinibbana is used solely in connection with someone absolutely free of all kilesas. When the average person stops breathing, bringing his physical existence to an end, this condition is known as death. But when the Lord Buddha or an Arahant dies, this is Parinibbana. It is generally presumed that Atariyaman's death was also Parinibbana, a conclusion I have no reason to dispute. I gladly yield to the verdict of all those fine people who have given him this prestigious epitaph. For many years I lived with him, listening closely to his every word, and I found nothing contradictory in his way of life or his tamma teaching. In truth, his teaching so profoundly impressed me that I was convinced it was a matatamma, emanating from a heart of genuine purity. A heart of such pureness is by no means inherent within human beings. To experience it, one must take the heart of an ordinary human being, then cleanse it until it becomes the pure heart of an arahant. There is no other way. This purified heart then becomes aryacitta aryatamma forever. Saying that the heart is the most important thing in the world means that the heart is the decisive factor controlling all manifestations of good and all manifestations of evil. The heart is the principal actor and the one ultimately held accountable for all actions. If people's hearts motivate them to act in evil ways, the entire planet can easily be destroyed as a consequence. Thus, it is essential that our hearts should receive enough proper training and care so that we can safely look after ourselves in the world we live in. Then we will live in comfort, our lives free of undue disturbance, and the world will be a pleasant place to live, without the specter of strife constantly hanging over it. Chapter 7 The Legacy In the period following his cremation, many of the monks in Atsariyaman's lineage remained distraught as they continued to feel the loss of their one reliable refuge in life. Like kites with their strings broken, drifting at the mercy of the winds, they wandered off in all directions. Their spirits depressed, they felt like small, helpless orphans who had lost both parents. Consequently, the circle of practicing monks in Atsariya Mun's lineage found itself quite unsettled in the immediate aftermath of his funeral. By the time they eventually began to regroup, they had all realized the harmful effects of being without a good teacher. The passing away of an outstanding Atsariya is never a small matter. Invariably, it affects the community of practicing monks in a very serious way, shaking them like an earthquake to their very foundations. If his disciples have already established themselves firmly in the practice, possessing the mental fortitude to hold their own while helping to sustain their fellow monks, then the long-term effects will not be so adverse. Whether it's a family leader, a social leader, a business leader, a government leader, or a leader in any branch of the community of monks, the death of a good leader is always felt as a huge loss. Since it is ultimately unavoidable, those subordinates who depend on their leadership should earnestly prepare themselves for such an eventuality so that they may prosper now and in the future. When Atsariya Man passed away, I saw the incredibly harmful effects that such a loss can have. He was only a single individual, 
but vast numbers of monks and lay devotees were so grieved by his death that they appeared to be left in a state of ruin, like a building whose foundation had been damaged so that its entire structure suffers accordingly. I was shocked by this development, and worried for the future of the circle of practicing monks who could easily suffer damage without the protection of a strong teacher. If we do not make the effort to intensify our practice and get results while our teacher is still alive, upon his death we will be like the living dead, lacking firm principles of our own to hold on to. I myself was caught woefully unprepared at that time. It was a terrible experience. I felt as if the winds of a cyclone were raging through my heart, blowing me in all directions. One storm blew in to assail me with the thought that I had been left stranded without a refuge. Another blew in to fill me with doubts and left me wondering about whom I could possibly rely on now. Then a gale blew through, driving the thought that, having passed away sublimely without any concerns, he had left me behind feeling empty and lifeless to drift along hopelessly without a mainstay to which I could cling. Yet another wind buffeted me with the thought that everything would come to an end now that he was gone. Who would I stay with now that my father had died? Did this really signal my downfall? No sooner had I begun to stand on my own than my father left me. What a terrible misfortune! Another howling wind invade against the miserable bad luck of this poor orphan. I am finished for sure this time, and at such a crucial juncture in my own development as well. The Gilesas and Tamma are engaged in a full-scale war, and Acharyaman has been my advisor, helping me to work out a battle plan. Who will have this kind of compassion for me in the future? I had never reached such an agonizing impasse before. I felt as though I had fallen into an infernal pit of mortal despair. All hope seemed lost as I lived on without him. Such was my troubled state of mind when Atsariyaman passed away. That experience chastened me. Ever since then I've been loath to see other practicing monks encounter a similar agonizing experience simply because they lack the firm principles needed to stand on their own. Fearing that they will miss their rightful destiny by default, I constantly warn them of the dangers. Should they wait until the sun has already set before rushing to find a safe refuge, I am concerned they may end up feeling as empty and lifeless as I did. Not wishing to see this happen, I caution them to hurry and intensify their efforts while the moon is still bright, their hearts still willing, and their bodies still able. Thus committed, those desiring to attain the wealth of virtue inherent within Magga, Pala, and Nibbana can still manage to do so. They need not live poverty-stricken amid a world of spiritual riches. Relics Transformed all the people who received some of the bone fragments that were distributed after Atsariyaman's cremation placed them in suitable reliquaries and worshipped these relics in his stead. Everyone went their separate ways after the funeral, and nothing further was heard about this matter until some four years later when Kun Wan Komanamun, owner of the Siripon Panit store and the Suttipon Hotel in Nakon Rachasima, returned to Sakon Nakon for a merit-making ceremony. When he presented a cloth offering at Wat Suddhwat Monastery, where Atsariyaman had passed away, the abbot gave him a piece of bone taken from Atsariyaman's funeral pyre. Upon returning home, he decided to place it in the reliquary with the other remains of Atsariyaman which he had received four years earlier. When he opened the container, he was astonished to find that these bone fragments, received at the cremation, had all been transformed into crystal-like relics. He was so amazed at seeing them that his spirits soared. He quickly sent someone to check on another set of Atsariyaman's remains that he kept in a reliquary at the Suttapon Hotel, and discovered that they too had been transformed into crystal-like relics. A small portion of the original bone remained in the form of a coarse powder, but soon that too underwent the same transformation. In the end, a total of 344 relics were counted in the two reliquaries belonging to Kun Wan. This was the first instance where Atsariyaman's remains were found to have transformed into relics. News of this miracle spread far and wide. Soon, people began coming to ask him for a share of the relics. Kun Wan was a very generous person, and he sympathized with their request. So, he shared the relics out among them one or two at a time. He very kindly gave me some on two occasions. On the first occasion, I received five. On the second, two, making seven altogether. As soon as I received them, I publicized the fact that I had something very special. I was enormously pleased to have them, but my mouth wasn't satisfied to keep quiet about it. In the end, I lost out. Some women came and took them all. But 
Oddly enough, I was not at all disappointed that they took advantage of me. And there being nothing left to publicize, my mouth was finally satisfied. When word got out that I had something very special, the first people who came to ask to see them were all women. When I brought out the relics, first this woman picked one up to inspect it, then that woman picked one up to inspect it. Before I knew it, each of them had quietly slipped the one she was holding into her pocket, asking me if she could keep it. Who would dare ask for their return at that point, and make a fool of himself twice? Since then, I have never had any of Al Sariyaman's relics in my possession. Later, I heard that Kun Wan had given so many of his relics away to other devotees that he had hardly any left, so I didn't dare to bother him again. It is my understanding that Kun Wan's store in Nakun Rachasima was the first place where Acharyaman's bone fragments were discovered to be genuine relics. From that time on, such relics have appeared in many different places where faithful people, who received pieces of Acharyaman's bone, continued to worship them with special reverence. Even today, people still discover that Acharyaman's bone fragments have turned into relics, though the families who have them keep very quiet, fearing that others will ask for a share of these rare, priceless gems. In any case, someone who did not have an inherent spiritual connection with Atsari Amman would find it difficult to receive one of his relics to worship. Just look at me. I received several of them, but lacked the merit necessary to look after them. I had to give them to someone else to care for them in my place. Atsari Amman's relics possess many strange, amazing qualities. One person who owned two of them made a solemn wish that his two relics become three, so that he would have one for each of the three jewels, Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha. Soon afterward... A third relic materialized with the other two. Another person with two relics made the same solemn wish, but instead of increasing, the two fused into one, which greatly disappointed him. This person told me what had happened and asked my advice. I explained to him that whether one has three of Atsariyaman's relics, or one of them, or merely a bone fragment that has yet to undergo any transformation, all are essentially relics from his body. So no one should be disappointed if two become one, for it's a miraculous occurrence just the same. What could be more amazing than that? Even the hair samples from Atariyaman's head, which were collected when he shaved his head each month, and which are now kept and revered by people in many different places, have undergone a transformation similar to the bone fragments. In either case, the result is the same. Undergoing an essential transformation, both become relics. People who have genuine relics of Atariyaman cherish them so much that they keep very quiet about it. But, if someone inquires skeptically whether Atsariyaman's bones really did become relics, the same people will answer boldly in the affirmative. Should they then be asked whether or not they possess any, they will just smile and say they have so few they couldn't possibly give one away, thus precluding someone from asking. For this reason, it is difficult to find out these days who actually possesses Atsariyaman's relics. Even if they were asked by a monk whom they revere, they would probably give a rather vague answer. So we must sympathize with those who venerate and treasure Atsariyaman's relics. As a living teacher, Atsariyaman was extremely influential. He had very effective methods for alleviating the mental stress and feelings of anxiety experienced by his followers. Many people have recounted instances when they were determined to commit evil, or their minds were very hot and agitated, or they felt vengeful enough to kill someone. And the mere thought of Atsariyaman then was enough to cause these emotions and ideas to subside immediately. It was as though he had doused their flaming hearts with cool water, allowing them to realize their misunderstandings. Their harmful thoughts had simply vanished. The sense of relief they felt made them want to prostrate before him then and there. Many lay followers have testified to this, and surely there are many more unreported cases of devotees using the power of remembering Atsari Amun to successfully counter their wrongful intentions. Many monks, as well, have used the power of their faith in him to restrain themselves in accordance with their spiritual calling. During his lifetime, Atsariyaman trained countless numbers of people to be good, righteous individuals. At least 40 years of his life as a monk were spent engaged in teaching monks and laity from all over the country. Just think of how many monks and how many lay people must have trained under him in that 40-year period. If we consider only the monks, the disciples who became accomplished in meditation and the way of practice were already numerous. These monks have in turn become Atsariyas, teaching their own disciples how to develop firm principles for the future. All of this resulted from Atsariyaman's pioneering efforts to pass on that knowledge and understanding to others. Without his guidance, they would never have been able to find the right path, to say nothing of teaching others how to practice it. The task of laying a firm spiritual foundation in the heart, so that it is solidly anchored in reason and propriety, is an important and difficult one, 
far more so than any other seemingly difficult task we've ever done. Spiritual work, like all other work, follows the lead of the heart. In truth, the primary basis for everything we do is found in the heart. The heart is both instigator and director of all affairs concerning good and evil, right and wrong. Being both arbiter and taskmaster in all moral issues, the more the heart learns about itself and its relation to matters of good, evil, right and wrong, the better equipped it will be to sustain itself in a smooth, safe and joyful manner. Those of us who were aware of Atsari Aman's profound knowledge of this subject feel obliged to pay homage to him with unshakable faith. While he was alive, we were constantly reminded of the depth of his understanding, and although he has now passed away, we have never forgotten it. We cannot help but recollect him with a profound and boundless sense of gratitude. Atsari Aman was a teacher of the highest caliber when it came to developing people's hearts, a development that goes straight to the essential core of life in this world. A heart well developed in Tamma is unlikely to suffer adverse consequences. More than that, we can state with confidence that a fully developed heart will never suffer any adverse consequences at all. All its actions will bring beneficial results. A world in which proper spiritual development keeps pace with material development is a truly progressive world where people are bound to live in peace and happiness. When the material side of the world progresses at the expense of the spiritual side, people's hearts are forever ablaze, so the world experiences strife, oppression, exploitation, and corruption on a grand scale. Such progress is equivalent to the advance of the fires of hell. If you want to know what the advancing fires of hell are like, you need only look at a world devoid of spiritual development, a world that is constantly polluted by the heart's filthy excretions. When the heart is neglected, people's behavior becomes perverse, immoral, irritating, and quite offensive, so much so that nothing of pleasure or praiseworthiness can be found in a world ruled by impropriety. Understanding this, wise, intelligent people emphasize spiritual development over all other kinds of development, which are all merely creations of the heart anyway. Once the heart has been well developed, its overriding influence then cleanses all aspects of a person's behavior. The world thus enjoys peace and happiness following the lead of intelligent people who have developed themselves spiritually, and therefore strive to govern society with reason, according to the principles of Tamma. We should be very wary of admiring or trusting the intelligence of people who lack spiritual development, even if they're so clever that they can explore the sun, the moon, and the stars. Such achievements are not all that significant, especially if the intelligence in question is of the kind that is unmindful of its own misdoings and exudes poisonous elements that cause trouble in society. Applied indiscriminately, this clever knowledge may well lead to behavior rivaling that of common animals that ruthlessly prey on and devour each other, believing all the while that it is a clever way to satisfy their needs. Regardless of our position in society, genuine intelligence is measured by our ability to use the principles of reason to bring prosperity to ourselves and others, and there is no need to earn a diploma to certify it. Thoughts and actions bringing peace and happiness to ourselves and others are considered the true fruits of genuine intelligence, and as such, they constitute their own certificate of recognition. We need not boast of our credentials to verify our intelligence. In fact, such certification may secretly act as a cover for immoral behavior. In that case, the means may be furtive, but the resultant disturbance to others is no secret. The troublesome problems it creates are obvious everywhere we look. Such is the harm that arises when spiritual development is overlooked. Who can seriously believe that material development alone, driven by people whose hearts are corroded by kilesas and corrupted by selfish motives, will ever bring true peace and prosperity to the world? Only someone who is completely insensitive to moral issues could possibly accept this view. The difference between the actions of those who have developed themselves spiritually and those who have not is the difference between day and night. It was for this reason that the Lord Buddha did not recommend that the samadhi attainments be used for such psychic purposes as levitating, diving through the earth, or walking on water. He did not praise the intelligence of people acting like that. On the contrary, he praised as intelligent those who made an effort to thoroughly train themselves in the way of virtue, regardless of whether they were using samadhi attainments or some other means to achieve this. Such people are a blessing to themselves and to others, for a sense of contentment is the primary determinant of how pleasant our world really is. Even though the state of our health and other physical needs may be uncertain, following the fluctuating nature of anicca, life remains pleasant if our hearts have sufficient contentment to ensure us against life becoming unbearable. Questions have arisen concerning the spontaneous transformation of the bone remains of Atariyaman and Atariyasau into relics. 
As news of this marvel spread shortly after the first relics of Atsariyaman appeared, many people voiced doubts about why the bone remains of ordinary people could not also become relics. After all, the bones of an arahant and the bones of an ordinary person are composed of the same body elements. Why is it that only an arahant's bones can become relics? What's the essential difference between the two? Briefly, my own explanation is that the heart, or the chitta, is the fundamental determining factor here. Although the chitta is something common to all living beings, it varies greatly in power and quality from one person to the next. As for an arahant, his chitta is an arya chitta, meaning that it is absolutely pure. The chitta of the average person, on the other hand, is merely an ordinary chitta, meaning that it is polluted by kilesas. In either case, the nature of the chitta, the master and prime mover, has a decisive impact on the condition of the physical body in which it resides. For instance, the arahant's chitta being pure, it may well have the power to cleanse his body elements, making them pure as well, and thus allowing his bones to transmute into relics. Although the body of an ordinary person is composed of the same type of elements, the body's master, the chitta, is full of kilesas. It has no power to cleanse the body elements and purify them. Because the body elements have not been purified, the cremated bones of the average person remain unchanged, reflecting the impure nature of the chitta. We could say that purified elements are synonymous with the Arya chitta, while ordinary elements are synonymous with the ordinary chitta. The attributes of the Arahant's chitta, and by extension his body elements, differ significantly from those of the average person, so their bone remains are bound to differ as well. However, I am not sure that after death the bones of all Arahants will automatically be transformed to relics. The chitta of someone attaining the level of Arahant is completely purified at the moment of its attainment. The question remains, when the body of an Arahant is cremated, do the remaining bones become relics in each and every case, or not? From one Arahant to another, there is a considerable difference in time between the moment when he reaches that attainment and the moment when he finally passes away. The bones of living Arahants, who maintain their body elements for a long period of time after their attainment, are very likely to become relics after death. This is due to the length of time involved. The chitta of an arahant maintains the body elements by means of the various life-sustaining systems present in the body, like the breath, for example. At the same time, an arahant maintains throughout his daily activities an intrinsic level of samadhi that steadily works to cleanse his body elements until they also become pure. This results in his bone remains becoming relics after he passes away. But I'm not convinced that the bone remains of an arahant, who passes away shortly after his attainment, do become relics, since his body elements were not subject to the same lengthy cleansing process mentioned above. An arahant classified as Danta Pinya is one who attains enlightenment slowly and gradually. He may well reach the Anagami level and then be stuck there for a long time before he finally reaches the level of arahant. He must spend a lot of time investigating back and forth between Arahatta Magga and Arahatta Pala before the Chitta develops sufficient strength and skill to pass beyond. This process of investigating Arahatta Magga for the sake of attaining Arahatta Pala is in fact an effective means of cleansing the body elements. Having finally attained the level of Arahant, his bones may well become relics after he passes away. On the other hand, I am not at all sure that the bones of an Arahant who attains enlightenment quickly that is, kippa and then passes away shortly afterward, will necessarily become relics, since his purified chitta would have very little time to cleanse his body elements. As for the ordinary chitta of the average person, producing a transformation from bone to relic is well beyond its capability. Not only were Acharya Man's bone remains clearly transformed into relics, but some of these relics then underwent some amazing changes of their own. As I have already mentioned, Someone who had two relics made a solemn wish that they become three, and was rewarded with an extra one. Someone with two wished for a third, and ended up with only one instead. Although it seems virtually impossible, such transformations actually happened. There was another strange case where a man who had been given two relics one morning found three when he looked again that evening. In the short period between morning and evening they had increased from two to three. The man in question was a senior government official with enormous faith in Atsariya Man. From the day he passed away until the time of his cremation, this man had been extremely helpful in nearly every aspect of the funeral arrangements. A certain senior monk, having received some relics from Kunwan of Nakon Rajasima and remembering this man's kind assistance, gave him a pair as a keepsake one morning. 
The man felt an overwhelming sense of joy the moment he was handed that precious gift. Having nothing suitable to put them in just then, he put the relics in an empty snuff bottle for the time being. He closed the cap tightly and placed the bottle in his shirt pocket, buttoning it for good measure to ensure against loss. Upon leaving the monastery that morning, he went directly to work, where he spent the whole day in a bright, happy frame of mind, his thoughts returning time and again to the relics he had just received. Arriving home that evening, he excitedly told his family that he had received something splendid, a gift he had never received before. After the whole household gathered around to see what it was, he produced a proper reliquary for holding the relics. Opening the snuff bottle to remove the relics, he saw, to his amazement, that there were three of them. This sight heightened his reverence for Atsariyaman, and he was so overjoyed at receiving the relics that he could hardly contain himself. He boldly proclaimed to his wife and children that this was a genuine miracle, proof that Atsariyaman was truly an arahant. His family were somewhat skeptical, worried that perhaps he had miscounted them in the morning. He refused to accept this, arguing vehemently that he clearly remembered being given two relics by the senior monk that morning. He insisted that he had accepted them with great interest and respect. Even at work he had kept them in mind all day, repeating to himself, two relics, two relics, as though it were a meditation subject. How could he have forgotten how many there were? He told his family that if they still harbored any doubts, tomorrow he would take them all to ask the senior monk. Then they would realize that what he said was the truth. But his family didn't want to wait. They were determined to go immediately. So they all agreed to go straight away. Upon arriving at the monastery, the government official asked the senior monk how many relics he had given him that morning. I gave you two relics. Why do you ask? Is one missing? No, none are missing. In fact, they have actually increased by one, so now I have three. The reason I ask is, when I returned home and opened the bottle to remove the relics and place them in a reliquary, there were three instead of the two I expected to see. This made me tremble with joy. I quickly told my wife and children what had happened, but no one believed me. Afraid that I had miscounted them, they insisted that I come again and ask you to make sure. Now that we know the truth, I feel even happier. Well, what do you say? Do you believe me now? His wife smiled and said she was worried that he may have miscounted them, or that perhaps he was just kidding her. She just wanted to make sure. Since it was obviously true, she believed it. She had no intention of denying the truth. At this, the senior monk smiled and explained to her what had happened. This morning I gave your husband two relics. He was always especially helpful to Atsari Amman and the rest of the monks. He gave us invaluable assistance from the time Atsari Amman died until his cremation was completed. I have never forgotten this. So, when I was given some relics by Kunwan of Nakuan Rachasima, I put a few aside to give to your husband as a keepsake, since they are so hard to find nowadays. Atsari Amman is the first person I have ever encountered whose bones have changed to relics. Though such things are mentioned in the ancient texts, I had never seen the real thing with my own eyes. Now I have seen irrefutable proof. Please keep them in a suitable place and look after them well. Should they happen to vanish one day, your disappointment will be far more profound than the joy you felt when they increased in number. Don't say I didn't warn you. Atsari Amman's relics possess very miraculous properties. When they can increase in number as easily as they just have for you, they can just as easily vanish if they are not properly respected. Please keep them in a prominent, high place and pay homage to them every morning and evening. They may well bring you some unexpected good fortune. I am absolutely convinced that Atsari Amman was a monk of the highest purity, but I don't tell people this very often for fear they may think I'm crazy. You see, people tend to easily believe in bad things, but they have difficulty believing in good ones. Consequently, it is difficult to find a good person, but easy to find a bad one. By observing ourselves, we will notice that we too tend to prefer thinking in unwholesome rather than in wholesome ways. When the senior monk finished speaking, the government official and his wife respectfully took leave of him and returned home in an exceptionally cheerful mood. I have mentioned these strange, miraculous properties of Atsari Amman's relics so that my readers may ponder for themselves what causes such phenomena to occur. Those searching for scientific proof to authenticate their occurrence will find empirical evidence hard to come by. Since such things are impossible for people with gilesis to fathom, they may not find a shred of evidence to support them. The difference between the body elements of an arahant and those of the rest of us is clearly demonstrated by the fact that an arahant's bones can become genuine relics. As for the body elements of people with gilesis, even the cremated remains of a million such people will never produce the same results. Thus it is clear that a living arahant is a human being who is incomparably different from the rest of us. Just the fact that his heart is pure makes him stand out in a uniquely amazing way. 
His attainment is something that the whole world should respect and revere. Other Mysteries Ordinarily, people's sense of their own self-importance makes it difficult for them to believe in someone else's superiority. Nevertheless, aspiring to be good people, they feel obliged to accept what is obviously true, for refusing to accept manifestations of genuine goodness would show a kind of stupidity that defies human dignity. Take Atsari Aman, for example. I am unaware of any monk, novice, or nun who knew him well and understood what he taught, yet remained so stubborn and conceited that they refused to accept the truth of his teaching. Moreover, they all seemed to be quite willing to sacrifice their lives for him. The way of truth and purity that he taught in such detail can be compared to a discipline like mathematics. Both are established in fixed principles that give precise results when followed correctly. For example, 1 plus 1 must equal 2, 2 plus 2 must equal 4. No matter how many multiples are calculated in this fashion, the calculations will always be correct so long as the basic rules are applied. Whether it is an adult making the calculations or a child, if the right method is followed, then the results will inevitably be correct. No matter how many people may come along arbitrarily denying the validity of these basic principles, their truth remains the same. Such people merely display their own senseless stupidity. Likewise, principles of truth do not depend on the whims of any particular age group, gender, or nationality. They are accepted as irrefutable natural laws. The principles of Tamma, that the Lord Putta and the Arahants have fully realized to be true, can be proclaimed in their entirety with absolute assurance about their validity. Atsariyaman was one individual who fully realized the principles of truth within himself. He could fully describe all the knowledge about internal and external phenomena that he had so clearly attained, without concern for the belief, or disbelief, or the praise, or criticism of others. Every aspect of his internal practice beginning with moral discipline and samadhi, and progressing all the way to the absolute freedom of Nibbana, was declared openly and boldly, so that his listeners could make use of that knowledge according to their own capabilities. He spoke fearlessly about the external aspects of his practice, like devas, brahmas, and various types of ghosts, leaving it up to his listeners to investigate as best they could. Besides receiving encouragement in the practice, those who shared his natural inclination to perceive such phenomena were able to significantly broaden the scope of their knowledge, enabling themselves to deal expeditiously with the mysterious phenomena they encountered. Some of his disciples bore witness to these phenomena, though they did not possess nearly the mastery that he did. I'll give you an example. One night, Atari Aman received groups of devas late into the night, having no chance to rest. Eventually feeling very tired, he wanted to lay down for a while. When yet another group of devas arrived late that night, he explained to them that he was very tired from receiving several previous groups and now needed a rest. He requested that they go instead to visit one of his disciples and listen to his Tamma discourse, which they did. When told what Atari Aman had said, this disciple agreed to talk with him about Tamma for a while, after which they left. The next morning this monk asked Atari Aman about the incident. Last night a group of devas came to visit me. They said that, before coming to me, they had paid you a visit to request a Tamma teaching, but you were very tired and needed a rest, so you sent them to me instead. Is this true, or were they misleading me just so they could listen to me talk about Tamma? Feeling somewhat skeptical, I wanted to ask you about it. Atsariyaman replied, Well, having already received several groups of devas, I was dead tired. Then the last group came, so I sent them to you, exactly as they said, Believe me, devas never lie to monks. They are not like human beings, who tend to be quite deceitful and untrustworthy. When devas make a promise, they always keep it, and when they make an appointment, they are always right on time. I have associated with terrestrial and celestial devas for a long time now, and I have never heard them say anything false or deceitful. They are far more honest and virtuous than humans are. They scrupulously honor their word as if their very lives depended on it. They will severely criticize anyone who deviates from his word, and if that individual does not have a genuinely sound reason for failing to honor his commitments, they lose all respect for him. They have criticized me sometimes, though I had no intention of being dishonest. On certain occasions I entered into a deep state of samadhi prior to the appointed hour. I became absorbed there, only to find the day was waiting for me when I finally withdrew to a level where I could access them. When they reproached me for making them wait so long, I explained that I had been resting in Samadhi and inadvertently failed to withdraw at the scheduled time, a reason which they accepted. 
Then there were other occasions when I reproached the devils. I explained to them that I am only one individual, yet tens or even hundreds of thousands of devas from the upper and lower realms insist on coming to visit this one monk. How could anyone successfully manage to receive each and every group exactly on time? There are times when my health is not so good, yet I must patiently sit there receiving visitors. You should sympathize with some of the difficulties I face. Sometimes I'm pleasantly absorbed in samadhi, only to get roundly criticized when I withdraw a little later than scheduled. If that's how it's going to be, I'll just keep to myself and not waste my time and energy receiving visitors. What do you say to that? When rebuked like this, the day was invariably admitted their mistake and immediately asked for forgiveness. Those day was who visit me often are familiar with my way of doing things, so they don't mind if I'm a little late sometimes. It's those who have never come before that tend to mind my being late, since by nature they place such a high value on truthfulness. All day was from all realms, including terrestrial day was, are the same in this respect. Sometimes, being aware that I must withdraw from a restful state of samadhi to receive them, they do worry about the moral consequences of criticizing me for not keeping my word. I occasionally counter their reproaches by telling them I actually value my word more than my own life. The reason that I did not withdraw from samadhi in time to receive you was due to an obligation I have to tamma, which is something far more important than any promise made to a deva. Although devas and brahmas of the celestial realms possess non-physical forms more refined than this human body of mine, my chitta and my sense of truthfulness are exceedingly more subtle than those of all the devas and brahmas combined. But I am not one to talk incessantly about such things like an idiot. I mention it to you now only to remind you how important the tamma I maintain really is. So please consider the consequences carefully before criticizing me. Once I explained my true priorities to them, the Devas realized their mistake and felt very concerned about the moral implications of what they had done. Together they asked for my forgiveness. I made a point of assuring them that I do not feel any resentment toward any living being in the whole universe. I put my trust in the Tamma of compassion and loving-kindness which is devoid of all forms of malice. My every activity is governed by the Tamma of absolute purity. Devas, on the other hand, possess only wholesome intentions and a sense of integrity qualities that are not really all that amazing. The Lord Buddha and the Arahants possess an integrity that is pure, because the Tamma in their hearts is absolutely pure. No living being in the universe can possibly imagine just how supremely amazing such a state of purity is. The kind of integrity that devas observe is something that exists within the sphere of conventional reality, and the knowledge and the practice of it are well within the range of all living beings. The Tamma integrity of a pure heart, however, is the exclusive property of the Buddha and the Arahants. No one who has yet to realize that attainment can possibly comprehend it or put it into practice. Whether or not I myself possess an absolutely pure level of integrity is not a matter to boast about. But please keep in mind that, in contrast to the Tamma integrity of the Lord Buddha and the Arahants, the moral integrity that they was observed is neither exceptional nor unique. Had Atsariyaman addressed these words to human beings instead of Dewas, the humans would probably have felt embarrassed, or something even worse. But the Dewas were keen to hear his tamma, and so listened with intense interest to what he said. They were able to realize the mistake they made in taking liberties with him out of their ignorance of the situation. They were more than glad to carefully guard their conduct after that. They weren't angered or offended in the least. Atsariyaman said that such admirable behavior was truly commensurate with their lofty plane of existence. This brief example should serve as food for thought about the mysterious phenomena existing beyond the range of the physical senses. Such phenomena are mysterious only to those unable to perceive them. They cease to be a mystery to those who can. This same principle applies to Tamma Bisamaya. So long as the Lord Buddha was the only person capable of comprehending the true nature of Tamma, that Tamma remained a mystery to everyone else. But once the Buddha's Arahant disciples comprehended that same Tamma, its true nature ceased to be a mystery to them. So it is with the mysterious phenomena mentioned above. They cease to be a mystery to those who can perceive them. At the time of the Lord Buddha, he and his Arahant disciples were the only ones capable of fully comprehending the mysterious nature of Tamma, and the only ones capable of perceiving every type of mysterious external phenomena. Such things were not common knowledge. Many people at that time were incapable of perceiving these mysteries. At most, they had heard about such things, 
and, after consideration, they came to believe in them, being satisfied of their existence even though they hadn't perceived them directly. Others, who also considered the matter, refused to believe in these mysteries. This became a hindrance to their practice, preventing them from unreservedly following the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples. It is the same today. Only those possessing an innate capacity to perceive these phenomena can uncover their mysteries. For the rest, it's just hearsay. Whether we choose to believe in such things or not, there is unlikely to be any scientific evidence to prove their existence. I, too, might have been tempted to disbelieve, but I never found enough reason to be skeptical, so I have tried to remain impartial and simply write out Tsariyaman's story as he and his senior disciples related it to me. Although my knowledge of these matters is not very astute, I must admit that my heart is full of immense faith and respect for Atsariyaman. If someone whom I trusted were to come to me and suggest that I exchange my own life for that of Atsariyaman so he could return from the dead to teach again, pointing out that with my stupidity I could never possibly teach others the way, I would agree immediately, provided I could confirm that what he said was true. If he could guarantee that Atsariyaman would return in exchange for my life, I would quickly arrange for my own death then and there without a second's delay. In truth, I have been quite troubled by my own stupidity for a long time now. Although no one has ever requested that I exchange my life for Atsariyaman's return, I am constantly disappointed that in writing his biography, I am unable to remember so many things he kindly recounted to me in such detail. Because of my poor memory, so much of what he said has been lost. I feel rather apologetic even about what I have been able to remember and write down. The little that has stuck in my memory is a bit like a pet animal that sticks to its owner, no matter what and never runs away. In any case, what is written here can merely serve to whet the reader's appetite, as words alone cannot properly convey the mystery of these things. In modern-day Thailand, Atsari Amman was the person responsible for reviving an interest in experiencing these internal and external insights, though very few people could hope to perceive such mysterious phenomena nearly as well as he did. It's almost as though Atsari Amman was practicing for the sake of sharp vision and clear understanding, while the rest of us were practicing for the sake of blind ignorance, and were thus never able to see as he did. The fact that so little has been written here about his unusual abilities is a result of my own failure to take enough interest in these matters when he explained them to us. Still, to my knowledge, none of his disciples possessing similar abilities ever contradicted what he said about them. Instead, they themselves bore witness to the existence of these mysterious things which should be enough of an indication to convince the rest of us, who are not sufficiently skilled in their perception, that these things do exist even though they are hidden from view. In the same way, the Lord Buddha was the first person to attain enlightenment and the first person to perceive many mysterious phenomena, attainments that his Arahant disciples were eventually able to duplicate and bear witness to. In our present time, the sort of unusual phenomena that was perceptible to Atsari Amman ceased to be mysterious to a few of his contemporaries who possessed an ability similar to his. That is evident in the case of another mysterious affair that, although quite intriguing, is likely to raise doubts among those of us who are self-confessed skeptics. While Atsari Amman lived at Ban Long Peo Monastery, an elderly, white-robed laywoman from the local community, who had great respect for him, came to the monastery and told him about an experience she had in meditation. As she sat in meditation late one night, her chitta converged, dropping deeply into samadhi. Remaining absolutely still in that state for a time, she began to notice a very fine, thread-like tentacle flowing out of her chitta and away from her body. Her curiosity aroused, she followed the flow of her chitta to find out where it had slipped away to, what it was doing, and why. In doing so, she discovered that this subtle flow of consciousness was preparing to reserve a new birthplace in the womb of her own niece, who lived in the same village. This despite the fact that she herself was still very much alive. This discovery shocked her, so she quickly brought her chitta back to its base and withdrew from Samadhi. She was greatly troubled, for she knew that her niece was already one month pregnant. The next morning, she hurried off to the monastery and related the whole affair to Atsari Amman. Listening quietly, Many of the monks overheard what she said. Having never heard anything like it before, we were all puzzled by such a strange tale. I was especially interested in this affair, and how Atsari Amman would respond to the elderly lady. We sat perfectly still in breathless anticipation, all eyes in Atsari Amman, waiting to hear his reply. He sat with eyes closed for about two minutes, and then spoke to the elderly lady, telling her precisely what she should do. The next time your chitta converges into calm like that, carefully examine the flow of your chitta. 
Should you notice that the flow of your chitta has again gone outward, then you must concentrate on severing that outward flow with intuitive wisdom. If you succeed in completely cutting it off with wisdom, it will not reappear in the future. But it's imperative that you carefully examine it and then fully concentrate on severing it with wisdom. Don't just do it half-heartedly, or else, I warn you, when you die, you'll be reborn in your niece's womb. Remember well what I'm telling you. If you don't succeed in cutting off this outward flow of your chitta, when you die, you will surely be reborn in your niece's womb. I have no doubt about this. Having received this advice, the elderly lady returned home. Two days later, she came to the monastery looking bright and cheerful. It didn't require any special insight to tell from her expression that she had been successful. Atsariyaman began questioning her the moment she sat down. What happened? Did you manage to prevent yourself from being reborn within your niece's womb, despite being very much alive? Yes, I severed that connection the very first night. As soon as my chitta converged into a state of complete calm, focusing my attention there, I saw exactly what I had seen before. So I concentrated on severing it with intuitive wisdom, just as you said, until it finally snapped apart. Again, last night, I examined it thoroughly and couldn't find anything. It had simply disappeared. Today I could not wait any longer. I just had to come and tell you about it. Well, that is a good example of how very subtle the citta can be. Only someone who practices meditation can become aware of such things. There is no other way. You nearly fell prey to the kilesas, which were preparing to shove you into your niece's womb without you being aware of it. It's a good thing you uncovered it in your meditation and managed to correct it in time. Shortly after the flow of her aunt's chitta to her womb had been severed, the woman's niece had a miscarriage, thus cutting that connection for good. Soon the monks in the monastery began pondering two questions related to that incident, one to do with the rebirth of a person who has yet to die, the other to do with miscarriages. The old woman never told anyone in the village about what happened, so no one else knew about it. But having heard the whole affair as it was related to Atsariyaman, the monks were well informed about the incident. This prompted several questions, so the monks asked Atsariyaman for an explanation. To the question, how could a person who has not yet died begin to take birth in a womb? He answered as follows. She was merely preparing to take birth. The process had not been completed yet. It's quite common for preparations to be made before the work takes place. In this case, she was making the preparations, but she had yet to finalize them. So it would be incorrect to say that a person can be reborn while she is still alive. But had she not been so perceptive, she would certainly have established a new home in her niece's womb. To the second question, isn't severing the flow of the chitta, connecting the elderly lady to her niece, tantamount to destroying a human life? He answered as follows, what was there to destroy? She merely severed the flow of her chitta. She didn't cut off the head of a living being. The true chitta remained with that woman the whole time. It simply sent a tentacle out to latch on to her niece. As soon as she realized it and cut the outward flow of her chitta to break that connection, that was the end of the matter. The important point here was, Atsariyaman did not contradict the old woman when she described how the flow of her chitta had stolen out to reserve a place in her niece's womb. He did not dispute the truth of her experience, telling her that she was mistaken or that she should reconsider the nature of her assumptions. Instead, he responded by addressing her experience directly. This story is very intriguing, because there was, in fact, a good reason why her chitta flowed out to her niece. The woman said she had always been very fond of her niece, keeping in constant touch and always doting on her. But she never suspected that anything mysterious lurked in their relationship, waiting to sneak out and cause her to be reborn as her niece's child. If Atsariyaman had not helped to solve this problem, she would have ended up in that young woman's womb for sure. Atsariyaman said that it is far beyond the average person's capabilities to fathom the chitta's extraordinary complexity, making it very difficult for them to properly look after the chitta and avoid jeopardizing their own well-being. Had that woman possessed no basis in samadhi meditation, she would have had no means of understanding the way that chitta functions in relation to living and dying. Consequently, samadhi meditation is an effective means of dealing correctly with the chitta. This is especially true at critical junctures in life when mindfulness and wisdom are extremely important aids to understanding and caring for the chitta. When these faculties are well developed, they are able to effectively intervene and neutralize severe pain so that it does not overwhelm the heart at the time of death. Death is an absolutely crucial time, 
when defeat means, at the very least, a missed opportunity for the next life. For instance, someone who misses out at death may be reborn as an animal and be forced to waste time, stuck for the duration of that animal's life and suffering the agony of that lowly existence as well. If, however, the chitta is skillful, having enough mindfulness to properly support it, then a human birth is the least one can expect. Over and above that, one may be reborn in a heavenly realm and enjoy a variety of celestial pleasures for a long time before being reborn eventually as a human being again. When reborn as a human being, the virtuous tendencies that were developed in previous lives are not forgotten. In this way, the power of an individual's inherent virtue increases gradually with each successive birth until the chitta gains the strength and ability to look after itself. Dying then becomes merely a process by which an individual exchanges one bodily form for another, progressing from lower to higher, from grosser to ever more refined forms of existence, and eventually from the cycle of samsara to the freedom of nibbana. This is similar to the way that the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples raised the quality of successive existences over many lifetimes, while steadily altering their spiritual makeup until there were no more changes to be made. Thus it is that a chitta trained in virtue through each successive rebirth is eventually transformed into the treasure of Nibbana, all of which stems directly from the chitta being trained gradually, step by step, in the way of virtue. For this reason, wise, intelligent men and women of all ages never tire of doing good deeds that redound to their spiritual credit, always enhancing their well-being now and in the future. I feel I must apologize to the reader for meandering so much in telling Atsariyaman's story. I am trying very hard to present his biography in an orderly fashion, but my inherent forgetfulness has caused me to mix up the subject matter, putting first what should have come last, while putting last what should have come first. Although the story of Atsariyaman's life is already drawn to a close, I am still tacking on afterthoughts that I failed to remember earlier on. Because of this tendency, there is still no end in sight. As you read along, you'll see how unreliable I am at arranging events in their proper sequence. Another intriguing incident took place one morning at Ban Nong Peo Monastery when Atsariya Man, rising from meditation, came out of his room and, before anyone spoke, immediately told the monks to look under his hut and tell him whether or not they could see the track of a large snake imprinted in the dirt there. He explained to them, the night before, a great Naga had come to visit him and to listen to the Tamma. Before it left, he had asked it to leave some marks on the ground as a visible sign to show the monks in the morning. The monks informed him that they could see the track of a very large snake trailing out from underneath his hut and into the forest. There being no other tracks leading in, they could not tell how it had gotten there. The only visible track was the one going out from under his hut. The ground around his hut was swept clean so other tracks would have been easily noticed, but there were no others, only the one. Atsariyaman told them they need not look for others because they wouldn't find them. He reiterated that the Naga left directly from his hut soon after he requested it to leave a mark on the ground below. Had the monks seen the track first and then asked Atsariyaman about it, the incident would not be so thought-provoking. The intriguing fact is that Atsariyaman immediately broached the subject first, without being prompted, and sure enough they then found the track of a large snake under his hut which means that, perceiving the Naga with his inner eye, he told it to leave some visible mark for the monks to see with their physical eyes, since their inner eyes were blind, and they had no way to see the Naga when it came to visit. Later, when they had an opportunity, the monks asked Atsariyaman whether the Nagas who visited him appeared in a serpent-like form or in some other form. He replied that one could never be sure with Nagas how they would appear. If they came for the purpose of listening to Tamma, as they did last night, then they'll come in the form of a human being of a comparable social status to their own. A great Naga will come in the guise of a sovereign king surrounded by a royal entourage. Its comportment will be very regal in every respect. So when I discuss Tamma with it, I use royal terms of speech, just as I would with any royal personage. Its entourage resembles a delegation of government officials accompanying a crowned head of state. They all behave in a most polite, respectful manner, much more so than we humans do. They sit perfectly still when listening to Tamma, showing no signs of restlessness. When discussing Tamma with me, the leader always speaks on behalf of the whole group. Anyone with a question will refer it to the leader first. Then he asks me, and I give a reply. Once I have answered all their questions, they all depart together. Here is another incident that we can take on faith about Atsariyaman's extraordinary abilities, even though its true nature lies beyond our comprehension. A certain monk noticed that Atsariyaman liked to smoke a particular brand of cigarettes, 
So he told a lay supporter to use some money he had been offered to buy some for Atsariyaman. The lay supporter complied, and the monk then offered them to Atsariyaman. At first, Atsariyaman said nothing, probably because he was speaking on Tamma at the time and did not have any opportunity to investigate the matter. But the following morning, when that monk went to see him, he ordered him to take the cigarettes away. He said that he would not smoke them since they were owned in common by many different people. The monk in question assured Atsariyaman that the cigarettes belonged to him alone, since he had told a lay supporter to buy them with his own money the day before. He specifically had them purchased as an offering for Atsariyaman, so they could not possibly be owned in common by many people. Atsariyaman reiterated that he wanted them taken away. Being owned in common by many different people, the offering was not pure, so he did not want to smoke them. Not daring to press the issue any further for fear of being rebuked, the monk was obliged to take back the cigarettes. He sent for the lay supporter who had purchased them for him and asked what had happened. It turned out that this layman had taken money belonging to many different monks, all of whom instructed him to buy some necessity or other. He had used the money left over from those purchases to buy the cigarettes. The monk asked him for the names of the monks whose money was involved, and he then hurried off to find them. Once he explained about the mix-up with the cigarettes, each was more than happy to see them offered to Atsariyaman. So the monk took the cigarettes and once more offered them to Atsariyaman, confessing that he was really at fault for not questioning the layman thoroughly about the matter first. He acknowledged that Atsariyaman was exactly right. The layman confirmed that he had taken money belonging to many different monks and put it all together to make various purchases. Since all the monks had been asked and were happy to share the offer of cigarettes to Atsariyaman, he was offering them again. Atsariyaman took them without saying a word, and the matter was never mentioned again. Later, that monk told some of his fellow monks how he first tried unsuccessfully to contradict Atsariyaman, only to discover in the end that Atsariyaman was exactly right. Some monks were puzzled as to how he could possibly have known whose money was involved in the cigarette purchase since he had never been informed about it. One monk at this informal meeting spoke up, protesting vigorously. Were he simply like the rest of us, obviously he wouldn't have known a thing. But it's precisely because he is so very different from us that we respect him and admire his superior wisdom. All of us gathered here under his tutelage realize that his capabilities are as different from ours as day is from night. Although I don't know much, I do know for certain that he is wiser and more knowledgeable than I am in every way. I see his truly above reproach, which is why I have entrusted my life to him and his training methods with self-effacing humility. My heart is still full of kileses. But those kileses are very afraid of him, so they don't dare show their faces in his presence. I believe this is due to my willingness to surrender to him out of fear and respect, an attitude far more powerful than these vile kileses, which naturally tend to oppose the teacher. Confronted by Acharyaman, they give up completely, not daring to display the same reckless abandon they do when I live with other teachers. If we feel we cannot submit wholeheartedly to his judgment, then we do not belong here under his guidance." Should we persist in staying under those conditions, we will not benefit at all. Only harm will come. What more need be said after this incident with the cigarettes? Just an unwholesome train of thought in the middle of the night was enough to elicit a stern response from him the next morning. Meeting Atsariyaman, the offending monk would be met by his sharp, penetrating gaze, a gaze that seemed to pierce the culprit and tear him to pieces. In a situation like that, it was inadvisable to approach him or attempt to help him with his requisites, since he would strictly refuse to allow that monk to do anything for him. It was his indirect way of tormenting the monk's innate stubbornness. But it is strange how a monk initially felt quite chastened, yet somehow the effect didn't last long. He felt chastened at the moment he was stung by a severe reprimand, but later, when Atsariyaman spoke to him in a normal tone of voice, he would let down his guard and make the same mistake again. Despite having no intention of thinking in ways that were harmful to himself, he was simply unable to keep up with his own restive thoughts, which tended to jump from one thing to another quicker than a horde of wild monkeys. Later on, when the same monk went to see Atsariyaman again, he could sense immediately that he was not welcome. Just the look in Atsariyaman's eyes was enough to make him extremely wary. Even with that, he had yet to fully learn his lesson. After a while, if the dangers of his way of thinking were not brought home again to him, he would inadvertently begin to befriend those harmful thoughts once more, entertaining them as if they were actually something worthwhile. That is why I say that, despite feeling quite chastened, somehow the effect didn't last long. When he not only felt chastened, but also remained very conscious of the fear of revisiting those thoughts, then the positive effects were long-lasting. 
His mind remained cool, calm, and peaceful throughout. The next time he went to see Atsar Yaman, he needn't be so fearful about being taken to task. My own mind tended to react in a very similar fashion. Being unable to rely on myself alone, I could not allow myself to stray far from my teacher. Living with him, I was always fearful and on guard, which prevented my thoughts from deviating from the path of practice. Becoming quickly aware when my mind did stray, I was able to pull it back in time to avoid harmful consequences. I am absolutely convinced that al Yaman could read my thoughts. Whether or not he could read other people's thoughts doesn't concern me so much. What does concern me is how he used that ability to mitigate my own stubborn tendencies and teach me a good lesson. There was a time, when I first went to stay with him, that I thought, rather bizarrely, they say that al Yaman can read other people's thoughts, that he knows everything we're thinking. Can this really be true? If it is true, then he needn't take an interest in everything I'm thinking. I just want to know if he's aware of what I'm thinking right now. That would be enough. If he does know what I'm thinking at this moment, I will prostrate myself before him. That's all I ask of him. Coming face to face with him that evening, I could hardly sit still. As his eyes glared directly at me without blinking, I felt in my heart that he was about to shout and point straight at me. When he began speaking to the assembled monks, I was so worried about being singled out and scolded for stubbornly testing him that I had a hard time paying attention. Before long, his voice began cracking like a whip as it rained down blows all around me, brushing past and narrowly missing me time and again until finally the whip lashed into the very core of my being. I became flushed as my body shook uncontrollably. The more my fear mounted, the more agitated I became until all traces of contentment vanished from my heart. While I sat there, his voice kept whipping and lashing at my heart, his words hitting home time and time again until by the end of his talk I could no longer bear the pressure. My heart gave in to him, thinking, I thought as I did simply because I wanted to know if you could truly read other people's thoughts. I had no intention of disparaging your other virtuous qualities. I now acknowledge that you are a true master in every respect, so I wish to entrust my life to you until the day I die. Please have compassion for me and assist me with your teaching. Please don't become fed up with me because of this one incident. Once my heart completely surrendered to him, the fiery tone in his voice began to subside. Finally, he concluded by elucidating a basic principle. Right and wrong both exist within yourself. Why don't you take an interest in looking there? What's the point of meddling in the rights and wrongs of others? Is this the type of thinking that will make you a good, skillful person? Even though you may find out how good or skillful someone else is, if you yourself are neither good nor skillful, then you will never be successful. If you want to know how good other people are, first you must thoroughly examine yourself. Then, knowledge about others will come on its own. There is no need to test them to find out. Good, skillful people do not have to resort to such testing. A good person who is truly skillful in tamma can know about others without having to test them. Atsari Amman ended his talk to the monks on this note. I almost fainted at the time, sitting there soaked with sweat. Surrendering to him completely that night, I learned a lesson I've never forgotten. Never again did I dare to test him out. Had I been as severely chastened about matters concerning my own practice as I was that night about matters concerning Atsari Amman, then I would probably have transcended Dukkha long ago. But, alas, I have never been able to chasten myself to such good effect, which really rankles me sometimes. This was another issue that the monks discussed secretly among themselves at their informal meeting, which I also attended. Since this incident involved me personally, I have included it here with the story about the cigarettes to highlight the principle that the truth about the nature of truth exists all around us everywhere, at all times, a galico. All that's required is that we practice sincerely until we attain the truth. Then we will surely understand the nature of that truth the fullest extent of our understanding being conditioned only by the natural limitations of our inherent abilities. This includes the intrinsic truths, or satchatamma, as well as all the various forms of extrinsic knowledge. Keep in mind also that people differ in the type and degree of the inherent good qualities they have developed through successive existences, as well as the spiritual goals they have variously set for themselves. But the primary results of magga, pala, and nibbana do not differ. These results are the same for everyone who attains them. The Adventures of Atsariya Chob 
Atsariya Man was a teacher whose unique mode of practice will never be forgotten by those of us who are closely associated with him. Many such senior disciples of his are still alive today. Each Atsariya differs somewhat in his inherent virtuous qualities, his specific mode of practice, and the special kinds of knowledge and understanding he has attained as a result. Earlier on, I mentioned some of these Atsariyas by name, but there are many others whose names were not identified. Nonetheless, it was always my intention to identify one of his senior disciples in particular, once the story of Atsariya Man's life was completed, so that the reader could learn something of the way he practiced, the experiences he encountered, and the insights he gained. Atsariya Man's disciples followed in his footsteps much in the same manner that the Lord put Tazarahant disciples followed in his, experiencing many difficulties along the way before ultimately attaining the same knowledge and understanding that their teacher had before them. The extent to which these monks met with spine-tingling, frightening situations in their practice environment depended largely on the nature of the places where they lived and traveled. This brings me to one senior disciple of Atsariya Man for whom I have a great amount of respect. Since this Atsariya's Tutanga experiences are quite different from most of his contemporaries, I would like to present here some episodes from his practice, as evidence of the possibility that some of the unusual external phenomena commonly reported at the time of the Buddha may still exist today. Certain incidents in the life of the Buddha, like the elephant who gave him protection and the monkey who offered him honeycomb, may have their modern-day parallels in some of this Acharya's experiences. To demonstrate the authenticity of the episodes I'm about to relate, I shall identify him by name. He is Acharya Chob, who, having been ordained as a monk for many years, is now about seventy years old. He has always preferred living in remote forest and mountain areas, and still does so to this day. Since he likes to trek through such wilderness areas at night, he is constantly encountering nocturnal creatures like wild tigers. Leaving Lomsak in Pechabun province one afternoon, he started trekking north toward Lampang in the province of Chiang Mai. As he was about to enter a large tract of forest, he met with some local villagers who advised him, with obvious concern, to spend the night near their village and then continue on the next morning. They warned him that the forest he was about to enter was vast, so there was no way someone entering it in the afternoon could get through to the other side before dark. Those who ended up stranded in this forest after dark invariably became food for the huge tigers that roamed there at night. Since it was already afternoon, he had no chance to hike through it in time. Once darkness fell, the tigers began roaming around, looking for something to eat, and they considered any person that they happened on as just another source of food. Since no one ever escaped from them alive, the villagers were fearful that Atsariya Chob would meet the same fate. It was already well after noon, so they did not want him to enter the forest. They told him that a notice had been posted, warning travelers about this forest of yakkas to keep them from being eaten by those monsters. Being curious, Atsariya Chob asked what yakkas they were talking about. He had read old accounts about such creatures, but had never actually seen one. They told him it was just their way of referring to those huge, striped tigers who devoured anyone failing to make it through the forest by nightfall. They invited him to return with them to their village and spend the night there. He could then have a meal the next morning and continue on his journey. Telling them that he intended to continue walking anyway, Atsariya Chob refused to return to the village. Concerned for his safety, they insisted that, no matter how fast he walked, by having started this late in the day, he could not possibly reach the other side before nightfall and would end up stranded in the middle of that vast forest. But, determined to press ahead, he refused to be deterred. They asked him if he was afraid of tigers. He acknowledged that he was, but said it was irrelevant. He intended to go in any case. They insisted that the tigers there never ran away from people. If he encountered one, he was sure to lose his life. If he wanted to avoid being attacked by man-eating tigers, he should wait until morning to proceed further. He replied that should his gumma dictate that he was destined to be eaten by tigers, then that's the way it would be. If, however, he was destined to continue living, then the tigers wouldn't trouble him. Taking leave of the villagers, Atariya Chob resumed his journey, feeling no qualms about dying. No sooner had he begun to enter the forest than he noticed that both sides of the trail he was on were covered with claw prints where tigers had been scratching in the earth. He saw piles of tiger scat scattered all along the trail, some of it old, 
some of it quite fresh. As he walked along doing meditation practice, he observed these telltale signs, but he wasn't afraid. By the time he had reached the very middle of the forest, darkness had closed in all around him. Suddenly, he heard the roar of a huge tiger coming up behind him, followed by the roar of another huge tiger moving toward him, both calling out to each other as they quickly closed in on him. The roaring sounds from both directions grew closer and louder, until suddenly both tigers emerged from the darkness at the same moment, one merely six feet in front of him and the other a mere six feet behind. The sound of their roars had become deafening. Seeing the gravity of the situation, Atsariya Chob stood transfixed in the middle of the trail. He saw that the tiger in front of him was crouched and ready to pounce. Glancing behind him, he saw that the tiger there, too, was crouched and ready to pounce. Fear arose in him then, for he was sure that this signaled the end of his life. Petrified with fear, he stood stock still, rooted to the spot. But his mindfulness remained strong, so he concentrated his mind intently, and that prevented him from panicking. Even though he might be killed by those tigers, he would not allow his mind to falter. With that resolve, he turned the focus of his attention away from the tigers and back within himself, thus excluding everything external from his awareness. At that moment, his chitta converged, dropping quickly into a deep state of samadhi. As this occurred, the knowledge arose in him that the tigers could not possibly harm him. After that, everything in the world simply vanished, including himself and the tigers. Experiencing no physical sensations whatsoever, he was totally unaware of what then happened to his body. All awareness of the external world, including his physical presence, had utterly disappeared, which meant that awareness of the tigers had also disappeared. His chitta had converged completely, dropping to the very base of samadhi, and many hours passed before it withdrew from that state. When his chitta finally withdrew, he found that he was still standing in the same position as before. His umbrella and alms bowl were still slung over his shoulder, and in one hand he still carried a candle lantern, which had long since gone out. So he lit another candle and looked around for the tigers, but they were nowhere to be found. He had no idea where they had disappeared to. Withdrawing from Samadhi that night, he felt no fear whatsoever. His heart was full of such remarkable courage that even if hundreds of tigers appeared at that moment, he would have remained completely unperturbed, for he had seen with absolute clarity the extraordinary power of the chitta. He felt amazed to have escaped the gaping jaws of those two tigers, a sense of amazement defying description. Standing there alone in the forest, Acharya Chob was suddenly overcome by a feeling of compassionate affection for the two tigers. In his mind, they became friends who, having provided him with a lesson in Tamma, then miraculously disappeared. He no longer feared them. In fact, he actually missed them. Atsariya Chob described both tigers as being enormous. Each was about the size of a racehorse, though its body length well exceeded that of a horse. Their heads would easily have measured sixteen inches from ear to ear. He had never in his life seen tigers that were so grotesquely large. Consequently, when he first saw them, he stood petrified, stiff as a corpse. Fortunately, his mindfulness remained strong throughout. Later, after his chitta had withdrawn from Smati, he felt joyful and serene. He knew then that he could go wherever he wished without fearing anything in the world. Believing wholeheartedly that the chitta when fully integrated with Tamma, reigns supreme in the universe, he was convinced that nothing could possibly harm him. With this serene Tamma filling his heart, he resumed his trek through the forest, practicing walking meditation as he hiked along. His two tiger friends were still fresh in his mind, and he often thought about them. He felt that, were he to see them again, he could easily walk up and playfully stroke their backs as if they were pets, though it's questionable whether they would ever allow it. Atsariya Chob walked the rest of that night in peace and solitude, buoyed by a joyful heart. When day finally broke, he still had not reached the end of the forest. It wasn't until nine o'clock that morning that he emerged from the forest to arrive at a village settlement. Putting down his belongings, he put on his outer robes and walked through the village for alms. 
When the inhabitants saw him entering the village with his alms bowl, they called out to one another to come and offer him food. Having placed food in his bowl, some of them followed him back to where he had left his belongings and asked where he had come from. These being forest people who knew the ways of the forest, when they saw him emerging from that vast wilderness at an unusual hour, they wanted to question him about it. He told them that, having begun at the southern end, he trekked all night through the forest without sleeping and now intended to continue wandering north. Astounded by this statement, they wanted to know how it was possible, for it was common knowledge that passing through there at night meant almost certain death in the jaws of a tiger. How had he managed to avoid the tigers? Had he come across no tigers during the night? Atzari Achob admitted he had met some tigers, but said he hadn't been bothered by them. The villagers were reluctant to believe him because the ferocious man-eating tigers roaming that forest were renowned for waiting to ambush anyone caught there overnight. Only after he had explained the actual circumstances of his encounter with the tigers did they finally believe him, realizing that his miraculous powers were a special case and not applicable to ordinary people. Whether it is the spiritual path of the heart or the physical path through the forest, ignorance of the path we are on, the distances that must be traveled, and the potential dangers along the way are all obstacles to our progress, so we must depend on a knowledgeable guide to ensure our safety. We, who are journeying along the path towards safe, happy, prosperous circumstances now and in the future, should always keep this in mind. Just because we've always thought and acted in a certain way, we must not carelessly assume that it is necessarily the right way. In truth, our habitual ways of thinking and acting usually tend to be mistaken, continually leading most of us down the wrong path. During his life as a Dutanga monk, Atsari Chob had many close encounters with wild animals. Once, while wandering through Burma, he stopped to do his practice in a cave frequented by tigers. Although these huge beasts roamed freely through the area while he lived there, they never harmed him, so he never dreamed that one would actually come looking for him. But then, one afternoon, at about five o'clock, as he was getting up from his meditation, his eyes glanced up to the mouth of the cave to see a huge, striped tiger approaching the entrance. It was an enormous animal and very frightening looking, but Atari Chob remained unperturbed, probably because he was so accustomed to seeing these creatures wherever he went. Peering into the cave, the tiger spied him just as he was looking up at it. Instead of showing alarm at the sight of him, or roaring out in a terrifying manner, it just stood there passively, as though it were a house pet. It showed no signs of fear and made no threatening gestures. Looking casually about, the tiger leapt onto a large, flat rock at the entrance to the cave, about eighteen feet from where Atsari Chob stood. Sitting nonchalantly, licking its paws, it seemed uninterested in him, though it knew perfectly well that he was in the cave. It sat there calmly with the air of a pet dog sitting in front of the house. Growing tired, it flopped down, stretched out its legs, and lay there comfortably, just like a pet dog, continuing to lick itself as though feeling right at home. Since Atsari Chob's meditation track was right in front of the cave, he didn't dare go out and walk there. The proximity of the huge tiger made him feel a bit nervous. His uneasiness was compounded by the fact that he had never before seen a wild tiger behave like a household pet in this way. So he continued his sitting meditation on a small bamboo platform inside the cave, though with no sense of fear that the tiger might try to harm him there. Once in a long while, it casually glanced at him in the nonchalant manner of an old friend, while lying contentedly with no evident intention of moving. Atari Chob expected it to eventually wander off, but it showed no interest in going anywhere. At first, Atari Chob was sitting outside his mosquito net, but once darkness fell, he moved inside the net and lit a candle. The tiger remained impassive as the candlelight illuminated the cave. It continued lying contentedly on the rock until late into the night, when Atari Chob finally lay down to take a rest. Awaking at about 3 a.m., he lit a candle only to find the tiger reclining impassively as before. After washing his face, he sat in meditation until the first light of dawn. Then he rose from his seat and put away his mosquito net. Glancing up, he saw the tiger still stretched out comfortably, looking like some oversized pet dog in front of its master's house. Eventually, the time for his daily alms round arrived. The only way out of the cave went straight past the tiger. He wondered what its reaction would be when he walked by. 
As he put on his robes, he noticed the tiger looking at him with soft, gentle eyes, like a dog looking wistfully at its master. Since he had no other alternative, he would have to pass within several feet of it on his way out. When he was ready, he approached the mouth of the cave and began speaking to the tiger. It's now time for my morning alms round. Like all other creatures in this world, I am hungry and need to fill my stomach. If it's okay with you, I'll go out and get some food. Please be kind enough to let me pass by. If you want to stay on here, that's fine with me. Or if you prefer to go off searching for something to eat, that's all right too. The tiger lay there listening to him with its head cocked like a dog listening to the voice of its master. As Atsariya Chob walked past, it watched him with a soft, gentle gaze as if to say, Go ahead, there's no need to be afraid. I've only come here to protect you from danger. Atsariya Chob walked down to the local village for his alms round, but he didn't tell anyone about the tiger for fear they might try to kill it. Returning to the cave, he looked at the place where the tiger had been, but there was no longer any sign of it. He had no idea where it had gone. During the remainder of his stay in that cave, it never came to visit him again. Atsariya Chob suspected that the tiger was no ordinary forest creature, but rather a creation of the Dewas, which is why it appeared so tame and non-threatening the entire time it was with him. He felt a lot of affection for it, and so missed its presence for many days thereafter. He thought it might return from time to time to see him, but it never did. Although he heard the sounds of tigers roaring every night, he couldn't tell whether his friend was among them. In any case, the whole forest was teeming with tigers. A faint-hearted person could never have lived there, but he was not affected by such dangers. In fact, the tame-looking tiger, who kept watch over him all night, made him feel more affection than fear. Atsariya Chob said that experience increased his belief in Tamma in quite a special way. Atsariya Chob spent five years living in Burma, where he learned to speak Burmese as fluently as if it were his own language. The reason he eventually returned to Thailand concerned the Second World War. The English and the Japanese were fighting each other all up and down the countryside, in the towns, the villages, and even in the mountains. During that period, the English accused the Thai people of collaborating with the Japanese. Consequently, they searched for Thais in Burma, hunting them down with a vengeance. They summarily executed any Thai they found inside Burma, regardless of whether it was a man, a woman, or a monk. No exceptions were made. The villagers that Atsariya Chob depended on for his daily alms loved and respected him. So when they saw the English soldiers being very meddlesome, they became concerned for his safety. They hurriedly took him deep into the mountains and hid him in a place where they decided the English would not be able to find him. But eventually a contingent of English soldiers did come across him there, just as he was giving a blessing to a group of villagers. The villagers were crestfallen. Questioned by the soldiers, Atsariya Chob told them that he had been living in Burma for a long time and was never involved in politics. He said that being a monk, he knew nothing about such matters. The villagers spoke up in his defense to say that, unlike lay people, monks had nothing to do with the war, so it would be wrong to try to involve him in any way. They warned the soldiers that, should they take any action against him, it would amount to hurting the feelings of the Burmese people who had done nothing wrong. It would unnecessarily damage relations with the local population, which would be a grave mistake. They assured the soldiers that he had been living there since long before the war began and knew nothing about international affairs. Even though their country was now in a state of war, the Burmese people did not view this monk as a threat of any kind. Thus, if the soldiers were to harm him, it would be tantamount to harming the whole of the Burmese nation. The Burmese people could never condone such an action. The contingent of English soldiers stood talking among themselves about what to do with Atsariya Chob. After discussing his case for about half an hour, they told the villagers to quickly take him away to another location, for if another army patrol came and spotted him, there could be trouble. Should their pleas be rejected the next time, his life might well be in danger. While the soldiers were viewing him as an enemy, Atsariya Chob sat quietly, extending forth thoughts of loving-kindness and recollecting the virtues of the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha. When the soldiers had gone, the villagers took him deeper into the mountains, telling him not to come down to the village for alms round. Instead, each morning they secretly brought food for him to eat. From that day on, patrols of English troops regularly came to bother the villagers. Soon patrols were coming daily to ask the whereabouts of the Thai monk, and it became increasingly obvious that he would be killed if they found him. As the situation worsened, 
the villagers became more and more concerned for his safety. Finally, they decided to send him back to Thailand by way of a remote forest trail that passed through thick, mountainous terrain. This trail was known to be safe from incursions by English patrols. They gave him detailed instructions on how to proceed, warning him to stick to the trail no matter what happened. Even if he found the trail overgrown in places, he was not to attempt a different route. It was an old footpath used for generations by the hill tribes that eventually led all the way to the Thai border. Once he had these instructions, he began walking. He walked all day and all night without sleeping or eating, drinking only water. With great difficulty, he made his way through this dense wilderness region, teeming with all manner of wild animals. Everywhere he looked, he saw tiger and elephant tracks. He feared he would never survive his flight from Burma. He was constantly worried that he might make one wrong turn on the trail and end up hopelessly lost in that vast wilderness. On the morning of the fourth day of his trek to the Thai border, something incredibly amazing happened to Acharya Chob. Please reserve judgment on this incident until you have read the whole story. As he crested the top of a mountain ridge, he was so extremely hungry and exhausted that he thought he couldn't possibly go on. By that time, he had been walking for three days and three nights without any sleep or food. The only breaks he had taken were short periods of rest to alleviate the physical stress of such an arduous journey. While dragging his enfeebled body over the ridge, a thought arose in his mind. I have walked the entire distance to this point, risking my life with every breath I take, yet somehow I'm still alive. Since starting out, I've yet to see a single human habitation where I could request alms food to sustain my life. Am I now going to die needlessly for lack of a single meal? I have suffered enormous hardships on this trip. At no other time in my life have I suffered so much. Is it all going to be in vain? Have I escaped war, a sphere of death everyone fears, only to die of starvation and the hardships of this trek? If, as the Lord Buddha declared, there really are devas in the upper realms, possessing divine eyes and ears that can truly perceive at great distances, can't they see this monk who is about ready to die at any moment? I do believe what the Lord Buddha said, but are the devas who have received kind assistance from so many monks from the Buddha's time until the present day really so heartless as this? If devas are not in fact hard-hearted, then let them demonstrate their kindness to this dying monk so that their pure, celestial qualities can be admired. No sooner had this thought occurred to Acharya Chob than something incredibly strange and amazing happened. It was almost impossible to believe. As he staggered along that remote mountain trail, he saw an elegantly dressed gentleman who bore no resemblance to the hill tribe people of that region quietly sitting at the side of the path holding a tray of food offerings up to his head. It seemed impossible. Acharya Chob was so flabbergasted by what he saw that he got goose flesh and his hair stood on end. He forgot all about being hungry and exhausted. He was wholly astounded to see a kind-looking gentleman sitting beside the path about twenty-five feet ahead waiting to offer him food. As he approached, the gentleman spoke to him. Please, sir. Rest here a while, and eat something to relieve your hunger and fatigue. Once you've regained your strength, you can continue on. You're sure to reach the other side of this vast wilderness sometime today. Acharya Chob stopped, put down what few requisites he was carrying, and prepared his alms bowl to receive the food that the gentleman was offering. He then stepped forward and accepted the food. To his amazement, as soon as the food items were placed in his bowl... A sweet fragrance seemed to permeate the whole surrounding forest. The amount of food he was offered by the gentleman was exactly the right amount to satisfy his needs, and it had an exquisite taste that was absolutely indescribable. This might seem like an extravagant exaggeration, but the truth of what his senses perceived at that moment was so amazing as to be virtually impossible to describe. When the gentleman finished putting food in his bowl, Atsariya Chob asked him where his house was located. He said that he had been walking for three nights and four days now, but had yet to see a single human habitation. The gentleman pointed vaguely upward, saying his house was over there. Atsariya Chob asked what had prompted him to prepare food and then wait along that trail to offer it to a monk. How had he known in the first place that there would be a monk coming to receive it? The gentleman smiled slightly, but didn't speak. Atsariya Chob gave him a blessing, 
after which the gentleman told him that he would have to leave, since his house was quite some distance away. He appeared to be quite different from the average person in that he was remarkably dignified while speaking very little. He looked to be a middle-aged man of medium height, with a radiant complexion and behavior that was impeccably self-composed. Having taken his leave, he stood up and began to walk away. As he was obviously an unusual man, Atsariya Chob observed him carefully. He walked about twenty-five feet, stepped behind a tree, and disappeared from sight. Atsariya Chob stared at the tree, waiting for him to reappear on the other side, but he never did. This was even more puzzling, so he stood up and walked over to the tree to have a closer look, but no one was there. Had someone been in that area, he would definitely have seen him, but looking around in all directions he saw no one. The strange circumstances of the man's disappearance surprised him all the more. Still puzzled, Atsariya Chob walked back and began to eat his food. Tasting the various foods he had been given, he found them to be unlike the human cuisine that he was used to eating. All the food was wonderfully fragrant and flavorful, and perfectly suited to his bodily needs in every possible way. He had never eaten anything like it. The food's exquisite taste permeated throughout every pore in his body which had so long been oppressed by hunger and fatigue. In the end, he wasn't sure if it was his extreme hunger that made it taste so good, or the celestial nature of the food itself. He ate every last morsel of what was offered, and it turned out to be exactly the right amount to fill his stomach. Had there been even a little extra, he would have been unable to finish it. Having eaten, he set off again, feeling incredibly robust and radiant, not at all like the person who was at death's door a short while before. Walking along, he became so absorbed in thinking about the mysterious gentleman that he forgot about the rigors of the journey, the distance he had to walk, and whether or not he was on the right trail. As evening fell, he emerged from the other side of that vast wilderness just as the mysterious gentleman had predicted. He crossed the border into Thailand with the same feeling of joy that he had been experiencing all day. The mental and physical distress that had tormented him earlier in his journey had disappeared after his morning repast. When he finally crossed into Thailand, the land of his birth, he knew for certain that he was going to live. He said that the strange gentleman he met was surely a Davic being and not one of the local inhabitants. Think about it. From the point where he met that gentleman to the point where he entered Thailand, he encountered not a single human habitation. The whole affair was very puzzling. Ordinarily, one would expect to meet with at least a small settlement of some sort along the whole of that route through Burma. As it turned out, his evasion of the army patrols had been so successful that he had encountered neither people nor food. It had been so successful that he had nearly starved to death. Atsariya Chob said that his almost miraculous escape from death in that vast wilderness caused him to suspect the involvement of divine intervention. Although the wilderness he passed through teemed with dangerous wild animals like tigers, elephants, bears, and snakes, he never encountered them. The only animals he came across were harmless ones. Normally, someone trekking through such a wilderness would encounter dangerous wild animals daily, especially tigers and elephants and there was a very strong possibility that that person might be killed by one of those savage beasts. Surely his own safe passage can be attributed to the miraculous properties of Tamma, or miraculous intervention by the Dewas, or both. The villagers who helped him escape were very concerned that he would not survive the threat posed by dangerous wild animals, but there had been no other choice. Had he remained in Burma, the threat posed by the war and the English soldiers was even more imminent. So, opting for the lesser of two evils, they had helped him escape from the land of bloodthirsty people, hoping that he would survive the savage beasts and enjoy a long life, which is why he was forced to make the perilous trek that nearly cost him his life. Please contemplate these mysterious happenings for yourself. I have recorded the stories just as I heard them, but being reluctant to pass judgment on them alone, I would prefer that you come to your own conclusions. Still, I cannot help but feel amazed that something so seemingly impossible actually occurred. Due to the rigorous nature of Atsariya Chob's Tutanga Kammatana lifestyle, he has had many other similar experiences, for he always prefers living and practicing in remote wilderness areas. Since he lives deep in the forest, few people dare to go visit him, so his involvement with society is very limited. Conclusion Practicing monks in the lineage of Atsariya Man tend to prefer living in mountains and forests. 
Leading the way in this lifestyle himself, Atariya Man encouraged all his disciples to do the same. By nature, he was fond of praising the virtues of life in the wilds. He said the reason he preferred such places was that knowledge and understanding of Tamma was much more likely to arise while he lived in remote forest areas than while staying in congested ones. Crowded, congested places are hardly conducive to calm and contentment in the practice of Tamma. Even the Tamma that his disciples are teaching today was earned practicing at the threshold of death in that same wilderness environment. In the physical sense, Atsariyaman died many years ago. Nevertheless, disciples of his who naturally possess the meditative ability to perceive such phenomena still regularly experience visual images of him arising spontaneously in their meditation, just as if he were still alive. Should one of them experience a problem in his practice, a visual image of Atsariyaman will appear to him while he is meditating, demonstrating effective ways to solve the problem. He appears to be sitting there in person, giving advice, much in the same way that past arahants came and instructed him on the various occasions I mentioned earlier. When a monk, whose practice has reached a certain level, finds a specific problem that he cannot solve himself, a visual image of Atsariyaman appears and advises him on that very question, and then disappears on its own. After that, the monk takes the teaching that Atsariyaman has given him, analyzes it carefully, and uses it to the best of his ability. And thus, he gains new insights in his meditation practice. Those monks who are naturally inclined to perceive external phenomena possess the necessary psychic ability to receive such advice on their practice. This is known as listening to Tamma by way of nimittas appearing in meditation. That is, the teacher presents his teaching in the form of a nimitta, while the disciple understands that teaching as he perceives the nimitta. This may seem rather mysterious to those who have never heard about it or experienced it for themselves. Some people may reject such psychic communication out of hand as being sheer nonsense. But in truth, it does occur. Practicing monks having a natural psychic inclination perceive various external phenomena in the same manner. However, this talent is not shared by all practicing monks. Rather, individuals possessing this capability are special cases, meaning they have previously developed the specific virtuous qualities suited to such psychic achievements. For instance, the Buddha and the Arahants appeared in Atsariya Man's meditation as nimittas, so he was able to hear their teachings in that way. Similarly, disciples of Atsariya Man, who possessed similar psychic tendencies, were able to perceive nimittas of him, or of the Buddhas and the Arahants, and so hear their teachings. In principle, it can be compared to the nimitta that the Lord Buddha used to teach his mother when she resided in the Tawatingsa heavenly realm. But the Lord Buddha constitutes a very exceptional case, one which people consent to believe in far more readily than that of someone less exalted, even though both share the same causal basis, which makes it difficult to further elaborate on this matter. Being reluctant to write any more on this subject, I leave it up to those practicing meditation to discover this knowledge for themselves, Vatsatthang, which is better than relying on someone else's explanation, and far more certain as well. I am wholly convinced of this, no matter what is being discussed. Without having the ability to perceive such things directly with our own senses, we will be reluctant to simply rely on another person's description of them. Although that person may provide us with accurate information, there will always be certain aspects that we are bound to doubt or take exception to, notwithstanding the fact that the person is compassionately explaining the matter to us with a pure heart. The problem is, we ordinary people are not pure ourselves, so we tend to balk at what we hear, hesitant to accept someone else's judgment. So it is better that we experience these things for ourselves. Only then can we truly accept their validity. Then we needn't annoy others with our remonstrations. As the Buddha said, all of us must accept the consequences of our own actions. We shoulder the burden of pain and suffering, and enjoy the fruits of happiness that we have created for ourselves. This is absolutely right, and beautifully simple, too. The story of Atsariya Man is a splendid story. Beginning from the time he was still in lay life, he demonstrated the characteristics of a true sage. Always conducting himself in a safe, steady manner, he was never known to have caused any disgrace or undue trouble to his parents or relatives. Having ordained as a monk, he strove relentlessly to develop firm principles within himself, and so became a spiritual refuge to monks, novices, and lay people for the rest of his long life. 
He was a man whose life was a bright, shining example from beginning to end, a life of virtue that should definitely be considered an excellent model for people in this day and age. His meditation methods were extremely rigorous, his spiritual development of the highest caliber. The Kilesas never had a chance to overrun his heart, for he systematically destroyed them until not a single one remained, so much so that he was acknowledged by his close disciples and those revering him to be a present-day Arahant. The spiritual benefits that he bestowed upon the world were always in line with the principles of mindfulness and wisdom. From the initial stages of practice to the very highest level, his teaching never deviated from the true way of Tamma. Internally, he was very astute at judging the character and temperaments of his students. Externally, he was very clever in the way he gave assistance to people in every strata of society, from simple hill tribe people to urban intellectuals. Even when nearing death, he did not abandon his natural compassion for others. When a student with a problem in his practice went to seek assistance, he kindly made an effort to discuss the issue until all doubts had been allayed. All his disciples received some piece of farewell advice from him to carry in their hearts forever. Having been fortunate enough to meet such a supreme individual, and having wholeheartedly accepted him as their one true refuge, they were confident that they had not lived their lives in vain. Many of his senior disciples were able to establish themselves firmly in the principles of Tamma. By virtue of their own spiritual development, they also became Altsariyas, passing on the teaching to their students, thus assuring that the supreme, noble wealth of the Lord Buddha does not disappear. Many of his more junior disciples are still alive today, serving as a strong base for the sasana into the foreseeable future. Though they may not openly demonstrate it, many of them possess excellent Tamma credentials. Every one of these monks was inspired by the magic quality of Atsariyaman's compassionate teaching. As a teacher, Atsariyaman was unrivaled in his ability to help develop the spiritual potential of members of the lay community, enabling them to grasp the significance of Tamma and the basic moral principles of cause and effect, which are universal principles governing the world. Spiritual development means developing the one factor that is absolutely central to the well-being of the world, the world comes to ruin only if people's spiritual values come to ruin first. When spiritual values deteriorate, then everything people do becomes just another means of destroying the world and subverting tamma. When people's hearts are well trained in spiritual values, their speech and actions become an effective means of promoting the world's prosperity. So inevitably, tamma flourishes as well. How could people who have sincerely developed the way of Tamma in their hearts possibly turn around and act ruinously, showing no compunction? Such behavior would be unnatural to them, unless, of course, they simply memorize the principles of Tamma, reciting them by heart without ever making an effort to develop those spiritual values within their hearts. Atsariya Man invariably made a deep impression on the people who met him. Those who sincerely respected him were willing to offer their lives to him, unconditionally. Whether it be matters of good or matters of evil, once such concerns are embraced and taken to heart, they then exert a powerful influence on that person, one no other force in the world can match. Were this not the case, people would not have the self-assurance to act upon their intentions, be they good or evil. It is precisely because they take such matters to heart that they can act boldly upon them. Having assumed this attitude, the outcome becomes inevitable. This was especially evident among practicing monks who revered Atsariya Man. By taking the tamma that he taught to heart, those monks became uncompromising in their respect for him. The power of their belief in him was so strong that they would even dare to sacrifice their precious lives for him. But although they could have given their lives without difficulty, their strong faith in him was never sacrificed. It was this extraordinary magnetic quality he possessed that so attracted people and engendered such veneration in them both during his lifetime and after he passed away. As for myself, well, I have always been a rather hopeless individual, so my sentiments are very different from most people's. Although over twenty years have elapsed since his death, to me it feels as if Altsariyaman passed away only yesterday, and though his body died at that time, his chitta seems never to have passed away. I feel he is always here with me, helping me continually. As a concluding chapter to his biography, I would like to present a representative sample of the teachings Atsariya Man gave, beginning with comments he made at the onset of his final illness and ending with his last instructions to the monks, teachings which have continued to make a profound impression on me ever since. 
The tamma he presented to the monks at the start of his illness took the form of a warning to them that the illness had begun a process of uprooting the very source of his physical existence, including all his bodily functions, which were destined to steadily deteriorate, break down, and finally fail altogether. He began, I have been investigating matters concerning the life and death of this body for nearly sixty years now, and I have found nothing in the physical kanta that is worthy of the least attachment or that would cause me to regret its passing away. I ceased to have doubts about such things the moment I realized Tamma's supreme truth. Whether they exist inside of the body or outside of it, all material substances are composed of the same physical elements. They gradually break down and decompose with each passing day, and thus are always reverting back to their fundamental natural state. Although we imagine the body belonging to us, in truth it is just a conglomeration of physical elements that are commonly found everywhere on this earth. What most concerns me now is my students who have come here from all over the country. I worry that you will not have gained a firm basis of tamma in your hearts before I pass away. That is why I have always warned you against being complacent about the gilesas, which are the source of an endless procession of births and deaths. Never assume that the gilesas are insignificant or somehow harmless and thus fail to tackle them seriously while the time is still right. Once death overtakes you, it will be impossible to take any action against them. Don't say I didn't warn you. Every human being and animal on this planet suffers dukkha as a matter of course. Don't misunderstand the cause of this suffering. It is caused by those very kilesis that you seem to think are so insignificant and harmless. I have examined the origins of birth, death, and suffering with all the mindfulness and wisdom at my disposal. Only one cause induces the hearts of living beings to seek a place in the realm of birth and death, experiencing various degrees of pain and suffering. And that cause is the kilesas that people everywhere overlook. In truth, they are the principal instigators. All of you who have kilesas ruling over your hearts, what is your attitude? Do you also consider them unimportant? If so, then no matter how long you live under my guidance, you will always be like the ladle in a pot of delicious stew. If you want to be able to taste the flavor of that stew, then you must listen with keen interest to the tamma that I teach you and fully take it to heart. Don't act like ladles and obstruct my teaching by failing to appreciate its value. Otherwise, you will live and die having nothing of value to show for it, which is worse than being animals, whose flesh and skins are at least of some value when they die. Heedless people are always worthless, alive or dead. Since this illness began, I have reminded you constantly that I am slowly dying day by day. When a person transcends dukkha, he is perfectly satisfied in every respect, and so he dies free of all concerns. Forever unblemished, he has nothing further to attain, for nothing is missing from his sense of perfect satisfaction. But someone who dies while under the influence of the kilesas, which are never satisfied, will find the same sense of dissatisfaction clinging to his heart wherever he is reborn. The stronger the influence of the kilesas, the more intense the dukkha he will suffer. Don't imagine this or that realm of existence will be a pleasant, joyful place to be reborn in when you die. Such thoughts are merely an indication that craving and dissatisfaction are disturbing your hearts before you've even died, which means you are still unwilling to view the kilesas as enemies that constantly stir up trouble in your hearts. With that attitude, where will you ever find happiness and contentment? If you cannot rid yourself of the desire to be reborn in the future, then I am at a loss as to how I can help you. Monks who have yet to develop the calm and concentration of samadhi within themselves should not expect to find peace and contentment in the world. Instead, they will encounter only the frustration that is hidden inside their agitated hearts. You must hurry to remedy this situation now by developing an effective means to counter such agitation, by being diligent, courageous, and persevering in your struggle with the kilesas, which are always antagonistic to tamma, you will soon discover the peaceful nature of genuine tranquility arising in your hearts. With persistence, results will come quickly, especially when compared with the endless amount of time you have spent wandering through samsara from one type of existence to another. The teachings of the Lord Buddha are all designed for the purpose of helping those who believe what he taught to gradually transcend dukkha, step by step, until they finally reach the stage where they will never again return to this world of repeated birth and death. 
Those who desire not to return to birth must analyze every aspect of existence in the entire universe, from the grossest to the most subtle, in terms of the three basic characteristics of all existence, anitta, dukkha, and anatta, and use wisdom to thoroughly investigate each aspect until all doubts have been eliminated. Once that happens, even strong attachments that are difficult to break will evaporate and disappear in the blink of an eye. All that's needed to cut through those oppressive doubts is wisdom that is sharp and incisive. In all the three worlds of existence, there is no more effective, up-to-date means for confronting the kilesas than the combination of mindfulness and wisdom. The Lord Putta and all the Arhants employed mindfulness and wisdom to counteract every kind of kilesa. No other means was used. The Lord Buddha himself endorsed the unrivaled supremacy of mindfulness and wisdom as weapons for combating the kilesas. This is not meant to belittle the value of other spiritual qualities, but they form an auxiliary role, like provisions of food used to support and maintain the fighting strength of soldiers in battle. It is the soldiers and their weapons, however, that are indispensable to the war effort. Soldiers, in this case, means your absolute determination to never retreat in the face of the kilesas and thus slide back into the mire of birth and death, where these defilements can ridicule you once more. The premier weapons of choice are mindfulness and wisdom. Being effective at every level of combat, they should always remain close at hand. The points in the course of your practice where the chitta gets stuck are the points you must examine fearlessly without concern that the intensity of your efforts to dismantle the cycle of rebirth will somehow prove fatal. When you face the moment of death, I want you to die victorious. Don't allow yourself to die defeated or else you will continue to suffer for a long time to come. You must make every effort to fight on until Sangsara becomes a completely deserted place. Try it. Is it really possible that Sangsara will become deserted? due to lack of deluded people taking birth there, simply because you put forth effort in your practice? Why are you so worried about returning to occupy a place in Sangsara? You haven't even died, yet every thought arising in your mind is directed toward reserving a future existence for yourself. Why is that? Whenever you reduce your efforts in practice, you are automatically working hard to reserve a place in the continuing cycle of birth and death. Consequently, birth and death are always bound up with your heart, and your heart is always bound up with dukkha. I have made every effort to teach you the way of Tamma, candidly revealing everything you should know about the four noble truths and the four foundations of mindfulness. I have withheld only certain aspects of Tamma dealing with specific kinds of psychic perception that are not directly connected with enlightenment, such as those special insights that I have alluded to from time to time. I am always glad to listen to anyone who experiences such perceptions and assist them in any way I can. Once I have died, it will be very difficult to find someone who can advise you on these matters. You must keep in mind that the practice of Tamma differs considerably from the theory of Tamma. Those who have not actually attained Samadhi and Panya or Magga, Pala and Nibbana cannot possibly teach others the correct way to reach these attainments. Atariyaman concluded his Pachima Oada by emphasizing the importance of Sankara Tamma, just as the Lord Buddha had done in his final instructions to the community of monks prior to his Parinibbana. Atariyaman began by paraphrasing the Buddha's instructions. Monks, heed my words. All Sankara Tammas are subject to change. They arise, evolve, decay, and then pass away. So you should always remain diligent in your practice. He then explained the essential meaning of this passage. The word Sankara in the Lord Buddha's Pachima Ovada refers to the highest Tamma. He gathered together all conditioned things in the word Sankara, but he wished at that time to emphasize the internal Sankaras above all others. He wanted the monks to see that these Sankaras are important because they are Samudaya, the cause of Dukkha. They are the factors that disturb the Chitta causing it to languish in a state of delusion where it never experiences a tranquil, independent existence. If we investigate such sankharas, being all of our thoughts and concepts from the most vulgar to the most refined, until we finally comprehend their true nature, they will then come to an end. When sankharas come to an end, nothing remains to disturb the chitta. Although thoughts and ideas do still arise to some extent, they merely follow the natural inclination of the khandhas, Kantas that are now pure and unadulterated. They no longer conceal any form of gilesa, tanha, or avitta. Comparing it to sleep, it is equivalent to a deep, 
dreamless sleep. In this case, the chitta is referred to as a rupasama chitta, that is, a tranquil chitta completely devoid of all remnants of the kilesas. The chitta of the Lord Buddha and those of all the arahants were of just such a nature, so they harbored no aspirations to attain anything further. The moment the kilesas are extinguished within the chitta, a state of purity arises in their place. This is called sa upadise sanibbana. That is the precise moment when the attainment of arahant occurs, an absolutely amazing pure essence of mind for which no comparison can be found in all the three worlds of existence. Upon reaching this point, Atsariyaman stopped speaking and retired to rest. From that day onward, he never gave another discourse to the monks, which is why I have called it his Pachima Owada. It is a very fitting note on which to conclude his biography. As the author, I have done my utmost to write a thorough and accurate account of Atsariyaman's life. I feel it to be a once-in-a-lifetime endeavor. I have written down the whole story as meticulously and as eloquently as I possibly could. Should there be any inaccuracies in what I have written, I trust you will forgive my shortcomings. I have spent a considerable amount of time attempting to record the story of his life from beginning to end, but even if I were to continue writing for another three years, I could never encompass it all. Although I would like to write as much as possible for the sake of my readers, who never had a chance to meet him, my ability to recollect and transcribe the events comprising Acharya Mun's life has now been exhausted. Still, many people may now read his biography, learning how he practiced and trained himself from the day of his ordination to the day he passed away. At least the story of his life is available to the interested reader, even though it is by no means a complete picture of Acharya Mun and his extraordinary achievements. In compiling this biography, I have tried very hard to select only those aspects of his life and teaching that I felt would be of greatest benefit to the average reader. At the same time, I have omitted any aspect that I felt would serve no definite purpose. Of the relevant material which was collected to write this book, approximately 70% has been included in the text that you've just read. That much, I felt, was neither too deep nor too confusing for the reader's understanding. The remaining 30% was excluded, because I felt those aspects of Acharya Mun's life and teaching would be difficult to present in a way that's easy to read and understand. I was concerned they wouldn't benefit the reader enough to justify their inclusion. Thus they were omitted, though often with some reluctance. Even then, I am not wholly comfortable with some of the things I've included in this book, though they do faithfully represent the truth of what Acharya Mun said. I managed to resist the urge to exclude them, however. Yet... I could not bring myself to write about certain other matters, and for this reason they were left out. Atsariya Man's story, with all its many remarkable facets, tells of a truly beautiful life that is full of subtlety and grace. It would certainly be difficult finding someone to equal him nowadays. If his life were fully narrated in every detail, then it would probably not differ significantly from the lives of those Arahants who attained such mastery in the time of the Buddha. Listening to him explain various aspects of Tamma, including the countless variety of external phenomena he contacted, I was truly amazed by his incredible mastery. When he proclaimed that impressive Tamma for us to hear, it seemed as though he was speaking on behalf of the Lord Buddha and his gifted Arahant disciples. We could almost picture the Buddha and his disciples sitting right in front of us and bathing our hearts with the pure waters of Tamma. Were I to attempt to describe each and every facet of Atsariya Man's knowledge and understanding, I would feel ashamed of my own inadequacies in this regard, ashamed of being a forest monk in appearance only, a phony who has somehow encroached upon the sasana. Through my own ignorance, I might inadvertently damage his excellent reputation, which should be preserved at all costs. Although I stated at the beginning of the book that I intended to write in the style of the venerable Atsariyas of antiquity, who transcribed the lives of the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples, I can't help feeling embarrassed that I am not so gifted as they were. Nevertheless, I have done the best I could. Should this somewhat imperfect biography fall short of your expectations, please be so kind as to forgive my shortcomings. It is appropriate now to bring this biography to a close. If the account I have written contains any inaccuracies or misrepresentations, I respectfully ask forgiveness of Atsariya Man, who, like a loving father, gave birth to my faith in Tamma. 
May the power of his all-encompassing love and compassion always bring peace and happiness to people everywhere. May you all have sufficient faith and resources of merit to follow in his footsteps, practicing the tamma that he taught to your ultimate satisfaction. May Thailand enjoy continual, uninterrupted prosperity and remain free of enemies and natural disasters. And may the Thai people remain untroubled by misfortune and hardship, forever experiencing happiness and contentment in harmony with the Buddha Sasana. Should any presentation of Acharya Mun's life be deemed inappropriate in any way, either in terms of the subject matter or the style in which it was written, I do sincerely apologize. I hope you will make allowances for my forest background, for it's difficult to transform the natural character of a forest monk into something eloquent and sophisticated. Though I have attempted to present every aspect of Alzheimer's Mun's life in a suitable, accurate fashion, I must confess that my own disorderly tendencies are hopelessly incurable. In writing a book of this nature, there will inevitably be some inconsistencies that may confuse the reader, which is why I have been at pains to stress my shortcomings. Before the life history of Alzheimer's Mun could come to a successful conclusion in my own mind, I had to carefully contemplate the whole matter for a long time. This prompted me to go around recording the recollections of many Atsariyas who have lived with him at various times in the past. To this I added my own memories of what he told me about his life. It took me many years to gather all the strands of his story and weave them into a creditable whole. Be that as it may, my often confusing style of writing, plus the fact that so many events appear out of sequence, will probably confound the reader. I accept full responsibility for everything in his biography. As I feel somewhat guilty about my own incompetence in this endeavor, I shall be glad to entertain your critical comments. At the same time, I shall be pleased to receive any complimentary remarks with the satisfaction of knowing that this book has been of some small benefit to those who read it. May all the merit gained from this work be fully credited to the readers and to those who helped to make the book possible. Should I deserve a portion of virtue by being the author, I ask to share it with every one of you who venerate the memory of Atsari Amman. May we all share this merit equally. Finally, may the supreme merit of the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha, plus the great virtue of Atsari Amman, and whatever virtue I may possess, may everything sacred in the world watch over and protect all my readers, as well as the editors of Sri Sapada Publishing. The folks at Sri Sapada worked tirelessly in their efforts to bring this biography to fruition, struggling to print a manuscript that was sent to them in numerous installments. Never once did they complain about the difficulties and inconveniences associated with this project or with any of the other issues on which I requested their assistance. May they all be free of sickness and misfortune, enjoying only prosperity and contentment now and in the future. And may their aspirations in the sphere of Tamma be fulfilled to their ultimate satisfaction. Atsarya Mahabua, October 1971 Appendix 1. Answering the Skeptics After his biography of Atsarya Man first appeared, Atsarya Mahabua received many inquiries and much skepticism concerning certain aspects of Atsarya Man's life and practice. Most notably, he encountered criticism that, in principle, some episodes appear to contradict specific long-held views about the mind's pure essence and the existential nature of the fully enlightened Arahant. Acharya Mahabua was quick to point out that the truth of Acharya Man's profound and mysterious inner knowledge lies beyond the average person's ability to grasp with the intellect or define in a theory. In this context, he included those students of the Pali scriptures who, believing that the written texts comprise the sum total of all aspects of Tamma, assert that scriptural doctrine and convention are the only legitimate criteria for authenticating all of the countless experiences known to Buddhist practitioners over the ages. In order to address this issue, Acharya Mahabua included an addendum to subsequent editions of the biography. The following is a summary of his remarks. Atsariyaman often told his disciples how he daily experienced such an incredible variety of dhamma within his heart that it would be impossible to enumerate all of the things that were revealed to him. He was constantly aware of things that he could never have imagined to exist. The extent of his own experiences left him in no doubt 
that the aspects of Tamma that the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples witnessed from the moment they attained full enlightenment until the day they passed away were simply incalculable. Obviously, they must have been numerous beyond reckoning. Atarya Man stated that the Tamma inscribed in the Pali Canon is analogous to the amount of water in a small jar, whereas the Tamma that is not elucidated in the scriptures is comparable to the immense volume of water contained in all the great oceans. He felt it was a shame that no one thought to formally transcribe the Buddha's teachings until many hundreds of years after his death and the deaths of his fully accomplished disciples. For the most part, the nature and emphasis of the Tamma that was eventually written down was dictated by the particular attitudes and opinions of those individuals who compiled the texts. For this reason, it remains uncertain to what extent the compilations that have been passed down to us are always an entirely accurate reflection of what the Buddha actually taught. Acharyaman frequently declared to his disciples, Personally, I feel that the Tamma which issued directly from the Buddha's own lips, and thus emanated from his pure heart, must have been absolutely amazing, because it possessed an extraordinary power to inspire large numbers of his audience to realize the paths and fruits of his teaching with apparent ease. Such genuine, living Tamma, whether spoken by the Buddha or by one of his Arahant disciples, had the power to transform those who listened, allowing them to clearly understand its most profound meaning in a way that went straight to the heart. As for the Dipertika, we study and memorize its contents all the time. But has anyone attained Nibbana while learning the texts, or while listening to recitations of the suttas? By saying this, I do not mean to imply that the scriptures are without benefit. But, when compared with the Tamma that issued directly from the Buddha's lips, it is obvious to me which had the greater value and the greater impact. Consider my words carefully, those of you who believe that I am advocating some false, ignoble truth. I myself wholeheartedly believe that Tamma coming from the Buddha's own lips is Tamma that forcibly uproots every type of kilesa from the hearts of his listeners, then and there on the spot, and to their total satisfaction. This is the same Tamma that the Lord Buddha used so effectively to root out the kilesas of living beings everywhere. It was an exceptionally powerful teaching that reverberated throughout the three worlds of existence. So, I have no intention of encouraging the Buddhist faithful to become opinionated bookworms, vainly chewing at pages of scripture simply because they insist on holding tenaciously to the Tamma they have learned by rote, and thus cannot be bothered to investigate the supreme noble truths that are an integral part of their very own being. I fear that they will mistakenly appropriate the great wealth of the Lord Buddha as their own personal property, believing that, because they have learned his Tamma teaching, they are therefore sufficiently wise even though the kilesas that are piled as high as a mountain and filling their hearts have not diminished in the least. You should develop mindfulness to safeguard yourselves. Don't be useless scholars learning to no good purpose and so dying in vain because you possess no tamma that is truly your own to take with you. It is not my intention to in any way disparage the tamma teachings of the Lord Buddha. By its very nature, tamma is always tamma, whether it be the tamma existing within the heart or external aspects of Tamma like the Pali scriptures. Still, the Tamma that the Buddha delivered directly from his heart enabled large numbers of those present to attain enlightenment every time he spoke. Now, contrast that living Tamma with the Tamma teachings transcribed in the Pali scriptures. We can be certain that the Tamma in the Lord Buddha's heart was absolutely pure. But, since the Buddha's teachings were written down only long after he and his Arahant disciples passed into total Nibbana, who knows? It may well be that some of the transcribers' own concepts and theories became assimilated into the texts as well, reducing the value and sacredness of those particular aspects accordingly. Such was the essence of Atsariyaman's discourse. As to the criticism that the Pali Canon contains no evidence to support Atsariyaman's assertion that deceased Arhants came to discuss Tamma with him and demonstrate their manner of attaining total Nibbana, if we accept that the Tipirtika does not hold a complete monopoly in Tamma, then surely those who practice the Buddha's teaching correctly are entitled to know for themselves all those aspects of Tamma that fall within the range of their own natural abilities, regardless of whether they are mentioned in the scriptures or not. Consider the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples, for instance. They knew and thoroughly understood Tamma long before the Bali Canon appeared. If these noble individuals are truly the genuine refuge that the world believes them to be, it is clear that they achieved that exalted status at a time when there were no scriptures to define the parameters of Tamma. On the other hand, should their achievements thereby be deemed false, 
then the whole body of the Pali Canon must perforce be false as well. So please decide for yourselves whether you prefer to take the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha as your heartfelt refuge, or whether you want to take refuge in what you chance to read and what you imagine to be true. But those who choose to be indiscriminate in what they eat should beware, lest a bone get stuck in their throat. Appendix 2 Chetta the mind's essential knowing nature. The following comments about the nature of the chitta have been excerpted from several discourses given by Atarya Mahabua. Of foremost importance is the chitta, the mind's essential knowing nature. It consists of pure and simple awareness. The chitta simply knows. Awareness of good and evil, and the critical judgments that result, are merely activities of the chitta. At times, these activities may manifest as mindfulness, at other times, wisdom. But the true chitta does not exhibit any activities or manifest any conditions at all. It only knows. Those activities that arise in the chitta, such as awareness of good and evil, or happiness and suffering, or praise and blame, are all conditions of the consciousness that flows out from the chitta. Since it represents activities and conditions of the chitta that are by their very nature, constantly arising and ceasing, this sort of consciousness is always unstable and unreliable. The conscious acknowledgement of phenomena as they arise and cease is called vijnana. For instance, vijnana acknowledges and registers the sense impressions that are produced when sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations contact the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, respectively. Each such contact between an external sense sphere and its corresponding internal base gives rise to a specific consciousness that registers the moment at which each interaction takes place, and then promptly ceases at the same moment that the contact passes. Vijnana, therefore, is consciousness as a condition of the citta. Sankara, or thoughts and imagination, is also a condition of the citta. Once the chitta has given expression to these conditions, they tend to proliferate without limit. On the other hand, when no conditions arise at all, only the chitta's inherent quality of knowing is apparent. Still, the essential knowing of the average person's mind is very different from the essential knowing of an arahant. The average person's knowing nature is contaminated from within. Arahants, being kirnasava, are free from all contamination. Their knowing is a pure and simple awareness without any adulteration. Pure awareness, devoid of all contaminants, is supreme awareness, a truly amazing quality of knowing that bestows perfect happiness, as befits the Arahant's state of absolute purity. This supreme happiness always remains constant. It never changes or varies like conditioned phenomena of the world, which are always burdened with anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Such mundane characteristics cannot possibly enter into the chitta of someone who has cleansed it until it is absolutely pure. The chitta forms the very foundation of samsara. It is the essence of being that wanders from birth to birth. It is the instigator of the cycle of existence and the prime mover in the round of repeated birth and death. Samsara is said to be a cycle because death and rebirth occur regularly, according to the immutable law of gamma. The chitta is governed by gamma, so it is obliged to revolve perpetually in the cycle following gamma's dictates. As long as the chitta remains under the jurisdiction of gamma, this will always be the case. The chitta of the arahant is the sole exception, for his chitta has completely transcended gamma's domain. Since he has also transcended all conventional connections, not a single aspect of relative conventional reality can possibly become involved with the arahant's chitta. At the level of Arahant, the chitta has absolutely no involvement with anything. Once the chitta is totally pure, it simply knows according to its own inherent nature. It is here that the chitta reaches its culmination. It attains perfection at the level of absolute purity. Here the continuous migration from one birth to the next finally comes to an end. Here the perpetual journey from the higher realms of existence to the lower ones and back again through the repetitive cycle of birth aging, sickness, and death totally ceases. Why does it cease here? 
because those hidden, defiling elements that normally permeate the chitta and cause it to spin around have been completely eliminated. All that remains is the pure chitta, which will never again experience birth and death. Rebirth is inevitable, however, for the chitta that has yet to reach that level of purity. One may be tempted to deny that rebirth follows death, or one may doggedly hold to the nihilistic viewpoint that rejects all possibility of life after death, but such convictions cannot alter the truth. One's essential knowing nature is not governed by speculation, nor is it influenced by people's views and opinions. Its preeminence within one's own being, coupled with the supreme authority of Gamma, completely override all speculative considerations. As a consequence, all living beings are compelled to move from one life to the next, experiencing both gross incarnations, like the creatures of land, sea, and air, and the more refined incarnations of ghosts, devas, and brahmas. Although the latter are so ethereal as to be invisible to the human eye, the chitta has no difficulty taking birth in their realms. The appropriate gamma is all that is required. Gamma is the determining factor. It is the power that propels the chitta on its ceaseless journey in samsara. The chitta is something so extremely subtle that it is difficult to comprehend what actually constitutes the chitta. It is only when the chitta attains a state of meditative calm that its true nature becomes apparent. Even experienced meditators who are intent on understanding the chitta are unable to know its true nature until they have attained the meditative calm of samadhi. Even though the chitta resides within the body, we are nevertheless unable to detect it. That's how very subtle it is. Because it is dispersed throughout the physical body, we cannot tell which part or which aspect is actually the true chitta. It is so subtle that only the practice of meditation can detect its presence and differentiate it from all the other aspects associated with the body. Through the practice of meditation, we can separate them out, seeing that the body is one thing and the chitta is another. This is one level of separation, the level of the chitta that is experienced in samadhi but its duration is limited to the time spent practicing samadhi. At the next level, the chitta can totally separate itself from the physical body, but it cannot yet disengage from the mental components of personality, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyarna. When the chitta reaches this level, one can use wisdom to separate out the body and eventually become detached forever from the belief that one's body is oneself, but one is still unable to separate the mental factors of feeling, memory, thoughts, and consciousness from the chitta. By using wisdom to investigate further, these mental factors can also be detached from the chitta. We then see clearly for ourselves, sandirtiko, that all five khandas are realities separate from the chitta. This is the third level of separation. At the final level, our attention turns to the original cause of all delusion, that extremely subtle pervasion of ignorance we call avidya. We know avidya's name, but we fail to realize that it is concealed there within the chitta. In fact, it permeates the chitta like an insidious poison. We cannot see it yet, but it's there. At this stage, we must rely on the superior strength of our mindfulness, wisdom, and perseverance to extract the poison. Eventually, by employing the full power of mindfulness and wisdom, even avidya can be separated from the chitta. When everything permeating the chitta has finally been removed, we have reached the ultimate stage. Separation at this level is a permanent and total disengagement that requires no further effort to maintain. This is true freedom for the chitta. When the body suffers illness, we know clearly that only the physical elements are affected, so we are not concerned or upset by the symptoms. Ordinarily, bodily discomfort causes mental stress, but once the chitta is truly free, one remains supremely happy even amid intense physical suffering. The body and the pain are known to be phenomena separate from the chitta, so that the chitta does not participate in the distress. Having relinquished them unequivocally, body and feelings can never again intermix with the chitta. This is the chitta's absolute freedom. Being intrinsically bright and clear, the chitta is always ready to make contact with everything of every nature. Although all conditioned phenomena without exception are governed by the three universal laws of anicca, dukkha, and anatta, the chitta's true nature is not subject to these laws. The chitta is conditioned by anicca, dukkha, and anatta 
only because things that are subject to these laws come spinning in to become involved with the chitta, and so cause it to spin along with them. However, though it spins in unison with conditional phenomena, the chitta never disintegrates or falls apart. It spins following the influence of those forces which have the power to make it spin, but the true power of the chitta's own nature is that it knows and does not die. This deathlessness is a quality that lies beyond disintegration. Being beyond disintegration, it also lies beyond the range of anicca, dukkha, anatta, and the universal laws of nature. But we remain unaware of this truth because the conventional realities that involve themselves with the chitta have completely surrounded it, making the chitta's nature thoroughly conform to theirs. Birth and death have always been conditions of the chitta that is infected by kilesas. But, since kilesas themselves are the cause of our ignorance, we are unaware of this truth. Birth and death are problems arising from the kilesas. Our real problem, our one fundamental problem, which is also the chitta's fundamental problem, is that we lack the power needed to be our own true self. Instead, we have always taken counterfeit things to be the essence of who we really are, so that the chitta's behavior is never in harmony with its true nature. Rather, it expresses itself through the kilesas, cunning deceits, which cause it to feel anxious and frightened of virtually everything. It dreads living and dreads dying. Whatever happens, slight pain, severe pain, it becomes afraid. It's perturbed by even the smallest disturbances. As a result, the chitta is forever full of worries and fears. And although fear and worry are not intrinsic to the chitta, they still manage to produce apprehension there. When the chitta has been cleansed so that it is absolutely pure and free of all involvement, only then will we see a chitta devoid of all fear. Then neither fear nor courage appear, only the chitta's true nature, existing naturally alone on its own, forever independent of time and space. Only that appears, nothing else. This is the genuine chitta. The term genuine chitta refers solely to the absolute purity, with the saupadisesa nibbana, of the arahant. Nothing else can wholeheartedly and without reservations be called the genuine chitta. I myself would be embarrassed to use the term in any other way. The term original chitta means the original nature of the chitta that spins endlessly through the cycle of rebirth. The Buddha indicated this when he said, Monks, the original chitta is intrinsically bright and clear, but it becomes defiled by the commingling of the kilesas that come passing through. In this sense, original chitta refers to the origin of conventional reality, not the origin of absolute purity. When referring to the original chitta, the Buddha stated, Pabhasara midang chittang bhikkhave. Pabhasara means radiant. It does not mean pure. His reasoning is absolutely correct. It is impossible to argue against it. Had the Buddha equated the original chitta with the pure chitta, one could immediately object, if the chitta was originally pure, why then should it be born at all? The arahant who has purified his chitta is one who never comes to birth again. If his chitta were originally pure, why then would he need to purify it? This would be the obvious objection. What reason would there be to purify it? The radiant chitta, on the other hand, can be purified because its radiance is nothing other than the essential true nature of avijja. Meditators will realize this truth clearly for themselves at the moment when the chitta transcends this radiance to reach absolute freedom. Then, the radiance will no longer appear in the chitta. At this very point, one realizes the supreme truth about the chitta. Once the chitta has become so well cleansed that it is always bright and clear, then when we are in a quiet place surrounded by complete silence, as in the still of the night, even though the chitta has not converged in samadhi, the focal point of its awareness is so exceedingly delicate and refined as to be indescribable. This subtle awareness manifests as a radiance that extends forth in all directions around us. We are unconscious of sights, sounds, odors, tastes, and tactile sensations, despite the fact that the chitta has not entered samadhi. Instead, it is actually experiencing its own firm foundation, the very basis of the chitta that has been well cleansed to the point where a mesmerizing, 
majestic quality of knowing is its most prominent feature. Seeming to exist independent of the physical body, this kind of extremely refined awareness stands out exclusively within the chitta. Due to the subtle and pronounced nature of the chitta at this stage, its knowing nature completely predominates. No images or visions appear there at all. It is an awareness that stands out exclusively on its own. This is one aspect of the chitta. Another aspect is seen when this well-cleansed chitta enters meditative calm, not thinking or imagining anything. Ceasing all activity, all movement, it simply rests for a while. All thought and imagination within the chitta come to a complete halt. This is called the chitta entering a state of total calm. Then, the chitta's essential knowing nature is all that remains. Except for this very refined awareness, an awareness that seems to blanket the entire cosmos, absolutely nothing else appears. For unlike a beam of light, whose range is limited, reaching either near or far depending on the strength of the light, the flow of the chitta has no limits, no near or far. For instance, the brightness of an electric light depends on its wattage. If the wattage is high, it shines a long distance, if low, a short distance. But the flow of the chitta is very different. Distance is not a factor. To be precise, the chitta is beyond the conditions of time and space, which allows it to blanket everything. Far is like near, for concepts of space do not apply. All that appears is a very refined awareness suffusing everything throughout the entire universe. The whole world seems to be filled by this subtle quality of knowing, as though nothing else exists, though things still exist in the world as they always have. The all-encompassing flow of the chitta that has been cleansed of the things that cloud and obscure it, this is the chitta's true power. The chitta that is absolutely pure is even more difficult to describe. Since it is something that defies definition, I don't know how I could characterize it. It cannot be expressed in the same way that conventional things in general can be, simply because it is not a conventional phenomenon. It is the sole province of those who have transcended all aspects of conventional reality, and thus realize within themselves that non-conventional nature. For this reason, words cannot describe it. Why do we speak of a conventional chitta and an absolutely pure chitta? Are they actually two different chittas? Not at all. It remains the same chitta. When it is controlled by conventional realities, such as gilesas and asavas, that is one condition of the chitta. But when the faculty of wisdom has scrubbed it clean until this condition has totally disintegrated, the true chitta, the true dhamma, the one that can stand the test will not disintegrate and disappear along with it. Only the conditions of anicca, dukkha, and anatta, which infiltrate the citta, actually disappear. No matter how subtle the kilesas may be, they are still conditioned by anicca, dukkha, and anatta, and therefore must be conventional phenomena. Once these things have completely disintegrated, the true citta, the one that has transcended conventional reality, becomes fully apparent. This is called the chitta's absolute freedom, or the chitta's absolute purity. All connections continuing from the chitta's previous condition have been severed forever. Now utterly pure, the chitta's essential knowing nature remains alone on its own. We cannot say where in the body this essential knowing nature is centered. Previously, with the conventional chitta, it formed a prominent point that we could clearly see and know. For example, in Samadhi, we knew that it was centered in the middle of the chest because the knowing quality of our awareness stood out prominently there. The calm, the brightness, and the radiance appeared to emanate conspicuously from that point. We could see this for ourselves. All meditators whose level of calm has reached the very base of Samadhi realize that the center of what knows stands out prominently in the region of the heart. They will not argue that it is centered in the brain as those who have no experience in the practice of samadhi are always claiming. But when the same chitta has been cleansed until it is pure, that center then disappears. One can no longer say that the chitta is located above or below, or that it is situated at any specific point in the body. It is now pure awareness, a knowing quality that is so subtle and refined that it transcends all conventional designations whatsoever. Still, in saying that it is 
exceedingly refined, we are obliged to use a conventional figure of speech that cannot possibly express the truth. For, of course, the notion of extreme refinement is itself a convention. Since this refined awareness does not have a point or a center, it is impossible to specifically locate its position. There is only that essential knowing, with absolutely nothing infiltrating it. Although it still exists amid the same kundas with which it used to intermix, it no longer shares any common characteristics with them. It is a world apart. Only then do we know clearly that the body, the kundas, and the chitta are all distinct and separate realities.